when we get that put over here, I want you to remind me if there's a way I can, um, rather than show all four screens when someone says fine. Um, yeah. I, I know there's this. Yeah. Video and in this case, and that's it. Okay. So what, go back to quad view. Quad view. Okay. And then what is it? Back to video present when I'm toggling when people want to, did they use an overhead projector or whatnot? Okay. Excellent. So video call video controls call. the cameras, video yeah. present. Excellent. Uh, one, two, three. Excellent. Okay. We don't label them on here because it's harder to label. Mm -hmm. Go in, have a yep. program with label on. Yep. Uh, change them around. Yep. Excellent. Thank I, you so I much. Have a, I have a low, low IP uh, question. We okay. move those wires, so I won't just make everybody kick my head around. <laughs> Success. Yeah, I remember when it comes up in some hotel room. Can you move it? <laughs> Can I use that? Oh, okay. Present. <laughs> So we're fine. Seeking me as if you are still alive. Yeah, portraits. Look <laughs> out. Yeah. It's just weird. It's just in my corner. So I'm fine. <laughs> You have a card. I just keep one for each day. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that your your stream's not on. Uh, my name yeah. or his? Uh, your your side. Oh, I don't know what my side is. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always shocked to learn that there are people who follow it. But my kids tell me. You're a very loyal follower. Yeah. <laughs> Some, oh, okay, you're you still going. Always comments from the same yeah. like, okay. people. My favorite one is Judge McDreamy. <laughs> there you go. Oh, we're still going. <laughs> <laughs> that would be tough because it's real time. Like I'm talking and it's like, oh. yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're back. We're back. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, um, and. If everything, catches, on, if everything catches on fire, the number we should call is? Uh, 770. Up there. What happened now? Let's mute. Exactly. All these are like, hey, why widescreen TV is not working? Come over. 
Bien. Okay. Johnson, are you ready? Great. Well, let's get on the record, please, ladies and gentlemen. We are reconvening here in the ceremonial courtroom of Cobb County Superior Court to wrap up over the next couple of days the inquiry concerning Judge Coomer. It's JQC Complaint 2020-128, Supreme Court Docket S21Z0595. We have enjoyed an entire week together where we received the director's case and a little bit of Judge Coomer's case. And then we had to stop because we hit the close of business on Friday. Since then, we had a hearing on the motion for directed verdict that Judge Coomer's team filed. That hearing was conducted uh, on my home turf in Fulton County. Uh, we've entered an order that collectively the hearing panel has that denied the motion for directed verdict. And so we are back. And I wanna be clear, I think it was made clear at the time Judge Coomer's team didn't waive anything procedurally by having a few of their witnesses fill some of the remaining time we had. The motion for directed verdict was timely filed and consistent with when the director rested. Um, but uh, we appreciated from the hearing panel side that we were able to cover a little bit more ground in case the motion for directed verdict was denied, which it was. So um, our understanding is that we will use um, all of today and as much of tomorrow as we need for the rest of the presentation from Judge Coomer's team. Um, we do have a hard stop tomorrow. Um, this courthouse is not open on Friday, so we can't be here on Friday, even if we wanted to. Um, but, <laughs> um, so um, what I'd like to do uh, to start with is just to see if there are any procedural issues and I'll check with Mr. Boring and then I'll turn to Mr. Lefko. And what I'd also like to know is just to get an overview of what you hope to cover over the two days and your um, percentage estimate of whether we'll be able to cover it in the two days. Um, because of course, you've had some time to reflect on what you do want to and don't need to cover during, during the remaining 16-ish um, hours that we have. So again, welcome back everyone. Um, Mr. Boring, is there anything we need to pick up from the director's side? No, Your Honor, just, I'm not 100 percent, so just I may be coughing a little bit. Okay, if you'll this, so. cough in Mr. Alford's direction, uh, not Ms. Cross's. He's, he's also under the weather too, so he, he right. quite the pair of waffle houses. Excellent. Well, maybe Ms. Cross could slide one seat over, so we've got someone <laughs> who's <late. laughs> able to make it through the two days. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it's going around. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll make it through. Yes. Jalefko, how are you, sir? Good, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, nothing from us, um, and there is a 100% chance we will be done. Great, all right. All right. Um, then we can go in whatever direction you want now. Um, we're in the midst of the presentation of your case, so if you call your next witness, we're, we're ready. We call Colonel Lorraine to the stand. Okay.
My goodness, I was, I was confused by movement over on the side there. It's good to see you, Mr. Kathy. So you're going to come up a little bit more and you're going to get sworn in in just a second. Um, we don't have, we had Ms. Rogers, I think was her name, that very energetic um, young lady um, who'd be perfect this time of year too, Christmas sweater. But um, I'm going to let you swear your witness in and then she could spell her name for the record. <clears throat> you swear the testimony you're about to give before this panel would be proof the whole proof that nothing was the truth say I'd be done. Would you have a seat? And by way of introduction to the panel, would you state your full name for us? Please introduce yourself to the panel. Yes. Um, Lorraine Mink. My first name is L O R R A I N E. Last name is M I N K. Okay. Would you please tell us uh, where you live? I live in Montgomery, Alabama. And what is your occupation profession? I always say I'm a recovering attorney. Um, I just retired from the Air Force after 30 years, and I'm a homeschool mom. And uh, tell us about your retirement. When did that happen? What did you retire from? Tell us your role. So I was a um, JAG officer in the Air Force. Uh, I entered uh, the Air Force in 1989. I was commissioned uh, at ROTC. Went to law school immediately thereafter and uh, began serving as a JAG in, 19, in October of 92. And I served um, for about 30 years. I retired uh, last December. It's, been almost, it's a year actually um, today, so it's really nice. Uh, and I served 10 years of active duty and the JAG Corps, and then I left. Um, I was an instructor at the Air Force JAG School there in Montgomery and left there, left active duty there and went into the Reserve Corps immediately. And the panel to know a little about the character and background of the witness who's coming to testify about my class. Okay. What can you judge why you're here and why you're present? Okay. So I want you to talk to us a little bit about your background. Okay. You say you went to law school uh, and uh, where was it? I went to law school at the University of New Mexico. And what other than Albuquerque and you there, what threw you to New Mexico? <clears throat> so I had um, graduated from Tulane and I, um, the Air Force said, I had a math, computer science degree, and I said, well, what can I do with this? And they said, well, you can be a, mi a missile officer. And I, I went into one of the counselors in, in my Air Force unit and said, I really don't want to have to be a missile officer. Does that mean that I go down in a hole and, and turn keys? And they said, yeah. And I said, is there anything else that I can do? And they said, well, you know, they're looking for lawyers. I said, I, I, sign me up, whatever it takes, you know? So I, uh, they, you had to get accepted to a law school pretty fast. I got accepted to two lanes right away. And um, and then I said, hey, will you guys give me some money? Because you had to pay for it. That was the deal with the Air Force. And um, they said, no. And so uh, I really wanted to be an environmental lawyer when I was young. I was a big tree hugger. I always thought I'd go save the environment. Um, my dad's we, a big we trout. We get fisherman. over those things. As we, we do. Get. We grow older and they throw us in the courtroom. We never get back out. But um, so I uh, tried to um, look around and see where there might be places that had a program for environmental law. And New Mexico had one. And I, it was kind of the least expected place to apply. It took them forever to accept me. I get into every other school I asked for. And I, I remember waiting at the pay phone and they called at, uh, in my dorm, you know, and they said, hey, we're letting you in. And I'd been on a first name basis at that point with the secretary, Ethel. She's an amazing lady. And uh, so anyway, I went to UNM. I loved it. And I wrote for the Natural Resources Journal there and took all these classes in water law and stuff. And one time I took a trial practice class and I really liked it. And they had a program in New Mexico where you could actually practice law while you were still in law school um, with the DA's office. So I, I worked in the DA's office my third year and practiced there. And uh, I also did a lot of work with the Air Force Base because they still own you. And so you can work in the legal office there. And that was kind of when Desert Storm, Desert Shield were breaking out. We had a lot of legal assistance issues. So I did a lot of that. That was my start. Um, I had a small stint at a big firm because the Air Force lets you have that first summer alone. And I gave that a shot. And I found that I probably enjoyed being a, a government litigator a little bit more, so I did that. But I, um, I just loved it. I loved practicing uh, law. I love the, the practice of law. I don't always like the people involved in the practice of law. Sometimes we see um, the hardest elements of society. It's, it's not a great time. But also our, um, our compatriots are not always 
wonderful. So we've had, you know, it's been an interesting ride, but I do love new lawyers and I love teaching them. I had the opportunity to teach the Air Force JAG school for many years. I remember um, Christian coming through as my last class uh, at the JAG school. Um, I don't remember him specifically other than this. We used to, as instructors, kind of talk about um, the future leaders, the people that we saw that were going to, you know, do a good job because we'd all been in the service for a while. So looking at people's character, looking at um, what potential people had was something we did regularly there. And I remember that for about let me, him. Let me ask you this very briefly. Um, what uh, are some of the roles you've played in your career in the JAG Corps? Some of the things you did. You know, Lord, we can talk forever. So directly yeah, I don't when want I get you to talk forever um, because uh, we, 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 you, you heard, you know, we, we're trying to get through we're trying here. to get through this. It's and it's Christmas and, and we're all away we from our house. It, but, uh, so um, I did a lot of different things. I've run offices um, as a sort of like a chief counsel. And then I've run um, at, a, at the higher level, sort of running several offices if you would, um, legal, and I say offices, I mean legal offices. So if, so I've had a staff of lawyers and paralegals um, and young people, you know, between um, five to 10 attorneys. And then I went to bigger offices where I had 15 attorneys and maybe uh, 10 paralegals. And then I moved up to do what, um, what we call numbered Air Force, where I'd have four uh, legal offices underneath me. Um, and I did that um, both active duty and in the Reserve Corps, but primarily in the Reserve Corps. Um, and you'd manage them and help them with their careers, but also you'd um, help them with their um, cases. They would, you know, certainly in, in some situations, they'd have to request money for witnesses and they'd have questions and how to do things. So I did a lot of that. So I've been a judge. I've been a supervising attorney. Uh, have, you, have you conducted any investigations on uh, officers and enlisted men who didn't perform their duties well or, or uh, yes. didn't comport with the rules? Hundreds. Unfortunately, they, um, that's one of the tasks that we get tasked with quite often. In my early career as a captain, I did it um, for aircraft accident investigations, looking at pilot and maintenance error. And then um, later, of course, with administrative discharge boards and court marshals, and sometimes in the investigative role, looking at those. And then as I became a colonel, um, that's the, the wonderful option of, or the wonderful opportunity you get as a colonel is to investigate other um, senior officers, which is really not you fun have, at all. I'm teasing about, I'm being very sarcastic. It's a horrible uh, thing to have to do. So you had an opportunity to investigate senior officers? Uh, have investigate uh, NCOs? Yes. Um, uh, did you have um, uh, occasion to uh, make recommendations about uh, punishment, about punishment or non-punishment of people under your command? Or under I did your... that both in part of the investigation, but then also as a um, as a JAG. So sometimes I'd receive investigations from other um, areas and then make recommendations to the commander or sit beside commanders and help them make decisions about how we should discipline particular. Would you uh, would you characterize your work as uh, very diversified in uh, all legal matters involving the JAG Corps? Yes, sir. It, within the JAG Corps and then outside it, we of course had all kinds of different things that we looked at. Now, let's turn to uh, Christian Coomer. You mentioned his name briefly, yeah. but uh, tell me when you first came in contact, where you first got to know him. So the first time I got to know him, I was at, um, in Montgomery um, and he came through the JAG school. And I say got to know him. I really only knew his reputation. Um, and that was that, you know, he was one of the students in one of our classes. And uh, I saw him do, you know, mock trials and, um, courts and we we were just discussing you know who would get awards for good advocacy who looked like a leader who was um, clearly a leader within their class and helping other people and it, his name bubbled up because he was um he was just really good with his classmates he was a, a great help to eat, to the people who were floundering and it was just I just remembered it I did not encounter him again until several years later my husband and I moved back to Montgomery and I was serving in the Pentagon um, but my husband was on the base and he had the opportunity. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed your husband was what? He was, my husband's active duty as well. And he just retired after 27 years. What branch was your husband? He was in the Air Force as well. And uh, he served on the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals before he a left the service. Well. Yeah, he is a full colonel as well. Um, all right, go ahead. So um, we can't, we, we always find our way back to Montgomery. I, I really would like to find my back, way back to Atlanta, but it, I always end up in Montgomery. <clears throat> so I got back there and, um, I was working uh, remotely in the Pentagon for reserve affairs and personnel issues. 
And my husband said, hey, there's this guy that just came to my office. Um, I, I think that he could use some help in mentoring. I don't know that anybody's mentored him before, but he's, uh, he's incredible. He, he comes in and he does his work, but more than that, he's helping my young captains. And would you just help me? I wanna help him make, you know, make major and put the right things in front of him because he's worth our time. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I think we had lunch, I'm trying to remember, but I want, went over all of his performance reports and tried to figure out how we could help him and um, what opportunities mm -hmm. might be there for him to excel in. Because I remembered him you know, from school and I was just so impressed. His litigation skills were incredible. But more than that, he was just very personable and really helpful in the office. And we don't always get that. Um, did, when you did, see that did, in a reserve officer, you're really excited about that, so. Did you, um, how would you rank him in the hierarchy of officers that you, that came through, that you mentored, that you taught, that you worked with? I, I'm, I would rank Christian in the top 1% of officers I've known, um, not only in the JAG Corps, but in the Air Force. Now, you gotta understand, I have a lot of, I know a lot of officers in the Air Force and I've um, been very blessed to serve with them, but I just think he's um, extraordinary. Over over the years that you knew this uh, officer that you've just told us was extraordinary. Over how long a period of time in your service were you acquainted with uh, Mr. Kuhn? So I first became acquainted with him in 2002, um, but I really got to know him better in about, in around 2011, I think. And so, so it's been, you know, 50 has, have, during the last 10 years during his service, have you, until your retirement, did you keep in contact with him through the obligations of the JAG Corps? Yes, I have. And um, how did that come to pass? How did you, how were you able to keep in contact with him? Well, um, we just, uh, I don't know how exactly, but we, I just, I, I always tried to mentor people and he was behind me. So I'd always check in on him, make sure everything was going well. And then recently I had direct supervision of him because I was um, the command JAG to Air Force Reserve Command um, in Macon, Georgia or you know, South Jamaica, it's actually in um, Warner Robins, but he came to work for us at the staff there as well. Um, but, I but I touched base with him regularly throughout the year. I have a couple of uh, folks that I've mentored that way, um, but he would also call and ask for advice, um, you know, and um, check in with me and say, am I doing the right things? What do you think? Is there anything more I should be doing for the Air Force um, or for the Reserve Corps? And he was just always, I mean, wherever we sent him, people would just call me and say, will you send me that guy again? Like we never get guys that good. Um, so I regularly sent him to um, offices that needed help or mentoring, but there were JAGs that maybe did, uh, needed did you, healing. Did you find that he did things above and beyond what was just the minimum requirements of him as an officer? Always. I, I never known him not to. He was now, kind of one of those people you knew you could send in to help people who didn't understand what service was. Now, Colonel Mink, you, you are here to talk about and, and testify, I believe, on your feelings of Christian Coomer's character. Is that right? Yes. Well, let me ask you this. You saw him in a limited role as a military officer. And so, but you're here to talk about his character. Tell me what observations, if you made, if any, that would make your <clears throat> testimony about his character broader than his service only. Tell us why you think you can testify about his character generally, not as an officer, if you can. Um, over the years, I've seen him have to face many, many difficult situations that anybody would flounder under. Um, investigating different people, hitting hard bosses, very difficult bosses, um, just being able to navigate difficult waters. And I never saw him I never saw him flounder. I never saw him flinch. I always saw his character to be extraordinary. Um, he took on the hardest jobs, the ones that people didn't want to do, um, and he did them well. And and turned you know situations around with his positive approach to life. And I think that that you can't just fake that in a military setting and then not have that be part of your character on the outside. Um, in addition to that. I've, um, you know, I've had to talk to a lot of people about once, once you become an 06, you have to sometimes tell people that they're not going to make rank. What's an 06? Uh, it's a colonel, I'm sorry. Um, you have to sometimes 
you know, tell people, I'm sorry, you're not going to make the next rank. You have to break hard news to them. And I've seen him in those situations as well, um, that, I, that where I've had to break hard news to him or had to talk to him about difficult situations, including, including this one. Um, and because I was a supervisor, he had to come to me when these charges came up and talk to me about it. He never held anything back. He was just, you know, very straightforward about things. And I've just been so impressed with that. Um, so I don't, again, I don't think that, well, I, well, I only saw him primarily in military settings. I don't, I don't think you could have faked that. I don't think that doesn't bleed over into your civilian life and your own character. Um, and I met so many, I've, I've dealt with so many young lawyers and older lawyers and chaplains and um, commanders over the years. I just have a good set. I just have a real good sense of what to expect in terms of good character and, and not so good character. And Christians just always exceeded as my expectations in uh, every way. Did you find Christian Coomer trustworthy? Absolutely. Did you find him honest? I did. Would you believe him under oath? Unequivocally. That's all. Questions for Colonel Mink. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, and you said that uh, Judge Coomer came and talked to you about these charges. Um, specifically, did he tell you about what happened with the loans that he um, took out from his client? So we have a, um, an ethics reporting in the Air Force. So if you have any cases or has anyone sued you or you're being examined by the bar, you have to report that to your supervisor. Mm -hmm. And that's the situation that I was found myself in. Um, he did tell me about the loans a little bit. I, it was a long time ago and pre-COVID, you know, so right around that COVID time. So a lot of it's a little bit hazy for me, but I, what I remember was it was painful to have to go through and, and discuss. And um, he was very open about it for the most part. Um, I know there was an older client that had loaned him money and, and he was very upfront about um, what was happening. Yeah. And did he, did he go into the fact that he had... Um, written himself into a will that he had drafted and made himself a beneficiary? I am not sure if he told me that or if I read it, but I'm pretty sure that he told me and then I went ahead and read it because I had to, you know, brief my superiors on where we were and what was happening. Um, so as far as you sitting here today, you don't remember exactly all the details of what he told you had, had happened. I don't, I know it was, I know it gave me pause and I said, you know, it's going to be, this is not going to be an easy time for you. This is right. yeah. judgment is hard. We do the best we can as attorneys. It's not an easy plan, but I understand at least from what I've been reading and, and my understanding that, that that man has been paid back and that those things have been fixed and is no longer in the will is what I could, at least from the Atlanta uh, journal, I think is where I read it, but, uh, but I'm, you know, I try to keep up with it because it's, it was my job for a long time to keep up with it and make sure that things were going well. That's all I have. Thank you. And the reason, just, I mean, just so we're clear, the reason though is because he was still practicing in the Air Force and I wanted to make right. sure that we were doing that well. I just wanna clarify. What were the consequences, Colonel Mink, if any, for Judge Coomer, what was his rank? He's Lieutenant Colonel. For Lieutenant Colonel Coomer, your perspective, um, uh, because there was this ongoing investigation. So um, once they reviewed all the materials that were available at the time and his, um, and basically what he told them, but also what, the, what was being published, they felt like since the bar was not restricting him to practice, that it would be fine to go on and practice. And, um, and he's done so, and he's done it really well. I mean, we've been very thankful to have him. And, and we're, Colonel Coomer has encountered a couple of investigations. There's yes. the JQC, um, there was the, Oh, we've had, like yeah, we've had to have a discussion in every one of them. Yes, sir. It wasn't just, hey, the JQC. Is, no, is... <laughs> that would be nice, but unfortunately, that's not the way it came up. So, okay. yes, sir. Did you determine that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Coomer was eligible to practice law in the state of Georgia? Absolutely. And uh, since it was brought up a little bit, when you investigated officers, did you sometimes find that they had made a mistake, but it wouldn't result in them losing their rank or losing their position in the military. 
regularly. Did you have a uh, sort of a, 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 a schedule of things that you could do less than termination or less than denying them the, the I, uh, rank? So you always looked at the whole person and their, um, you know, what they had done throughout their career, but also the way they handled things and um, particularly whether or not they were up front and, you know, and um, made amends for what they were doing. Um, whether or not you're in a court martial or an administrative discharge, or you're just considering what should happen to an officer, there's a really wide range of things. And um, we looked at, I mean, we looked at some of those for Christian and, and they decided that there wasn't anything necessary to do um, or, but in my experience with officers, people, people have poor judgment calls all the time. It's what they do after that matters. Thank you. I've got a couple more questions, Colonel. Yes, um, just to help put in context your relationship with Lieutenant Colonel Coomer, I'm not familiar with how the reserve works. Would you see him, and now we're talking about the couple of years leading up to his revelation to you that there's some ongoing investigations and some things he may have done. Right. So in those years leading up to that, would you um, see him one week a year, eight weeks a year? I just don't know how often. Yeah. Because so of course this, he had a full-time job. Right. And the Reserve Corps is one of those weird things where you're fitting it in all around your full-time job. Um, for a long time, for a good pinch, he was in the Air National Guard. And so on those years, and I'm thinking like, oh, I don't, not in front of me, maybe 15 to 19, I think. Um, we saw each other only uh, once a year at the, um, we have an annual conference of attorneys that's guard and reserve and um, a different kind of reserve called category A that we meet and get together. And I saw him regularly at that conference. And I would probably talk to him once or twice a year on the phone just to see how things were going. Um, I encouraged him to go to the guard because it's a little, it, it just has a lot more um, opportunity for really to enjoy practicing law than the reserve corps does sometimes. So I was really glad he got a chance to do that. So I was always checking in with him to see how that was going. Um, but so I'd see him once a year during those years. Um, I saw him when he was um, stationed at Maxwell, I saw him pretty regularly, um, probably two, three times, maybe four times a year, which is regular for a reservist. And then when he's been stationed recently um, at AFRIC, which is the command, like I said, that's right here in Georgia, Air Force Reserve Command, uh, I want to say four or five times a year. I, but I talked to him on the phone regularly. I mean, nobody saw anybody during a lot of COVID, so we were having to talk on the phone and do Zoom and that sort of thing, but I saw him pretty regularly. Sure. But because he was, I was supervising him, so I had to always check in anyway and make sure they were, you know, school was going, all that stuff. Okay. Um, if the years that we are most focused on are 17, 18, 19, um, that would have been during the phase where you were seeing um, Lieutenant Colonel Coomer once a year at a conference. And probably on the phone two more times a year. Because I did, we checked in pretty regularly. All right. Colonel, if I can ask you, um, you mentioned that the Air Force made a determination that the State Bar had not taken any action on Lieutenant Colonel Coomer's law license. If the State Bar did take an action, suspended his ability to practice law, what consequence would that have in the JAG Corps? Would not be able to practice law in the JAG Corps. Um, on rare occasions, officers have had the opportunity to serve in a different billet, a different career field, if you will. Um, but it's fairly rare. I only remember once in the 30 years I've seen that. There have been people who've requested to serve in different billets, different um, career fields, because they were doing something else. And, and that was always granted. And I've seen that quite often. Thank you. Colonel, your voice became very soft as you responded to that question. Let me ask the question again. If an Air Force officer, JAG officer, had been disbarred in his local state, would the Air Force allow him to continue as a JAG officer, or would that automatically terminate him as a JAG officer? It would automatically terminate him as a JAG officer. And it would be quick. Hmm? It would be fast. Okay. And we've had that happen a few times, unfortunately. Mr. Kathy, any follow-up? We, we, we asked some questions that moved a little beyond what you've been exploring. Any follow-up? Uh, uh, Your Honor, I thought there were uh, questions that were led into by our testimony here. Uh, 
I, you mentioned one thing and I just forgot to come back to it. You mentioned that in the Army, we, there were efficiency reports. What do you call them in the Air Force? Yeah, we call them um, officer performance reports. Performance report. Did you review all of uh, Mr. Coomer's sergeant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Coomer's uh, reports? I did. I did. I went back through all of them through his career. And tell uh, the panel, you'll have to go to everyone. You might can do it generally. What were his reports like? Um, they're, they're stellar. They're, they're better than mine. <laughs> they're really good. Um, and I, not, you know, I don't mean to say it like that, but they're better than my husband's as well. Um, he, you know, he just regularly stands out in every office he's in that, and every boss that he's had has just. Did you review the ones for 17, 18, 19, all of them? I did. Yeah. And, and when he was with the guard, they just couldn't say enough. They felt like they were very lucky to have him and they were. Thank you. Colonel Mink, thank you for your time. Appreciate thank you all it. very much. Hours. Merry Christmas to you and happy holidays. Next witness, Judge Christian Coon. Great. Get back to your iPad. Yes, sir. Um, Let's see. I need to do the electron. Electron. Yeah, I think he's plugging into the electron. Are you plugging into the lectern or are you defense PC? Defense PC. All right. Shooter, stay in your lane. I know you have a Are we ready? We are. Oh, okay. um, I, I don't know if I wanted to make sure it worked. Do you want to put something up? No, you, it does. You're confident yeah, because I'm it confident. says trial pad. Yeah. You're good. It's where you're witnessing. Okay. Um, Judge Coomer, you raise your right hand. Do you swear and affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right. All right. Judge Coomer, um, when were you appointed to the Court of Appeals? I was sworn in October 31st, 2018. And did you submit your name for consideration just like everyone else did? Uh, yes, in, on August 30th, or about, on or about August 30th, 2018, I did. And how many appellate decisions have you authored in the state of Georgia? Uh, uh, I have, I authored about, uh, 250 approximately. I can't remember the, I can't remember the exact number. And then I signed on to another 350 or so opinions written by other judges. Have you ever committed willful misconduct while in office? No. Um, as a judge, have you always tried to perform your duties when called upon to do so? Yes. And have you always tried to perform those duties with impartiality integrity and independence in every case that came before you on the bench? Absolutely, yes. Did you always try to be fair to the parties? Of course. And have you ever been charged with, indicted for, or arraigned for any crime other than minor traffic violations? No. I wanna let the panel know a little bit about who you are, Judge, and where did you grow up? I, I grew up all over the United States. Um, including in Hawaii, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, North Dakota. Why did you move around so much? My father was a minister, is a minister, and the church denomination he's affiliated with um, had, a, had a policy of moving ministers around. Where did you graduate high school? Verbena High School in Alabama, just north of Montgomery. And where did you go to college? Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee. And what about law school? The great University of Georgia. All right, good luck this year. Um, where did you meet your wife? I met her at college and at Lee University. We were, um, we both sang in the same choir. And that's how we met, started dating. How many children do you have with your wife? We have three children. And where do you live now with your wife? 
We live in Cartersville, Georgia. What did you first do when you got out of law school professionally? I practiced law at a small law firm in Cornelia, Georgia for a, uh, Judge Jim Butterworth was my boss. And uh, that's where I met Mr. Dennis Cathy. Uh, he was practicing law across the street. Um, I did that for about a year and a half before I joined the Air Force. And why did you join the Air Force? I, I wanted to um, serve. My, my dad had been a Marine. Uh, my aunts and uncles were in the, the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. My brothers were Army combat vets, and I wanted to have that military service experience as well. Uh, I also wanted to learn about a new area of law I'd never experienced, and so it, it checked the boxes for me. Why the Air Force instead of the other branches of service? Uh, that's, that's an unfair question. Uh, <laughs> I, I was drawn to the, actually I was drawn to the Air Force because I had an interest in uh, air flight and I, I thought that it might lead to potentially uh, later civilian opportunities. And do you still continue to serve in the Air Force? Yes. And civilian how many opportunities, meaning you learn to fly and you'd be a Delta pilot or <laughs> civilian opportunities, you'd be a lawyer in the aviation area? Well, at the time when I was, you know, 23, 24 years old, I, I didn't really know what civilian opportunities might present themselves. I thought perhaps work in the aviation industry would be an opportunity. Um, um, before I left the JAG, I had a, an offer to work uh, as a, a DOJ attorney um, doing contractor fraud prosecutions, but I, I, I didn't do any of those things. I wound up coming and hanging out of shingle in Cartersville and practicing law in my own. And so how many years does that put you in the Air Force as we sit here today? I joined the Air Force in 2001, so altogether about 21 years right now, almost 22 years. How many of the years was that your full-time situation? Four years. I spent the first four years were on active duty. Then I was in the reserve. I was an active reservist for a couple of years. And then I went into what's called the IRR, which is meaning you're, you're, you're not actively drilling. That was for one year because my law practice was taking off and I didn't, I couldn't do that effectively. I couldn't be an effective reservist and, and manage my law practice. Once I got my hands around that, I went back into the reserve. I did it for a couple of years and I went in the guard for a few years and then back into the reserve. With the first five days of this trial, we had a potential conflict with your military service. Is that the reserve service? Yes. And so what is that every year? How, how often are you called in to serve? So you have a minimum uh, requirement of about 30 days a year, um, two weeks of an of annual tour, which has to be scheduled in advance. That was the issue we were dealing with back in October. Um, and, then, and then as Colonel Mink sort of alluded to, there are scattered days throughout the year when you might go and provide some service. Is that disruptive to your family life and your small town law practice before you became a judge? Sure, it, it took time. You had to flex around it. You had to plan around it. Why, why did you continue to do that if it took time away from those things? I just love service. I, I love the military service. I built a lifetime out of service and it was a part of, it is a part of who I am and what I want to do. Is there like a graduated type of discipline in the Air Force? This is all foreign to me. So, I mean, is there... Are there warnings like you would get, you know, in other areas of your life before things happen where there are greater discipline levels? Is that how it works? Typically, I mean, you could have a person who, who, who you know, did something very severe and went, went straight to let's say a court martial, but typically you're gonna have oral warnings or verbal warnings and you have written warnings and you have written discipline and you might have, you know, accelerated or graduated discipline. Have you been disciplined during your service in the Air Force? No. Have you been warned that your conduct is wrong during your service in the Air Force? No. Um, have you been brought up on ethics charges during your service in the Air Force? No. Have you been sanctioned in any way during your service in the Air Force? No. And what is your current rank? Lieutenant Colonel. Did you get some more legal training after you got out of the Air Force? After the Air Force, just uh, CLE and on the job training. And what was your practice after you got out of the Air Force doing the Air Force full-time? I opened a law practice in Cartersville. 
solo practice, 2005. And did you maintain that until you became a judge? Yes. I want to talk about your life before you became a court of appeals judge. Um, when you were Mr. Coomer, um, when did you first rise to some elected office? I was elected to the General Assembly in 2010. I'd, I'd been a candidate for office once before in 2008, but I was elected in 2010. What district is that? It was the 14th House District. And why did you run for that office? I was encouraged by people to run. Uh, and um, when my state representative decided to run for a different office, I got a call from, actually got a call from Matthew Gamble, who testified here previously and said, you should run for this office. So I did. Was that something you had been interested in before, being in politics? Well, I was interested in politics, yes. What, why is that? I just always grew up uh, with an interest in, in uh, political things, but also because um, it fit in with this concept of my life of service that I had been angling toward. Um, and so it was an opportunity to serve in another capacity. And how long did you remain in the Georgia House of Representatives? Uh, four terms, so almost eight years. And then did that service end when you became a judge? Yes. How many times did the people of your district elect you to that office? Four terms. I was elected four times to that office. Did your peers in the legislature ever elect you to any positions of leadership? Yes. Uh, before, well, yes. So the Speaker of the House appointed me to be the the chairman of the transportation committee. Um, the governor had appointed me to be a floor leader for him. And then um, I was elected unanimously by my uh, fellow legislators to serve as the majority whip in the house. And was it just one time you were elected for that or does it come up here and there for reelection? Well, I, it, it comes up for reelection. I only stood for that election one time. Um, I understand there's a manual for the House of Representatives called Rules, Ethics, and Decorum. Do you, under, do you recall that document? Yes. During your service in the General Assembly, were you ever accused of violating those rules? No. Were you ever sanctioned, disciplined, or warned during your service in the General Assembly? Nope. Would the allegations, some of which you resolved through, I'm gonna use the wrong term, consent agreement with the Ethics Commission, the Electoral Command stuff, would any of those allegations have triggered um, uh, investigation through the House based on these rules that Mr. Lefko just referred to? They could. I don't know if they refer to you being polite and nice to people there, or if it is broad enough that an alleged campaign finance violation could trigger something that would be viewed as a violation of the House rules. Yes, uh, a violation of the House rules would have included um, the kinds of things uh, like like uh, campaign finance uh, issues, um, you know, uh, other personal endeavors that might result in a, a complaint for an ethics violation generally. So whatever you've been working through over the last few years either never got referred to the committee or group in the house that would look into that or by the time it came to light you weren't in the house and so there was no referral to whatever entity would have considered that these allegations brought in these other fora constitute something that the house should look at i i was not a representative at that time that that is what is the ethics commission i was not a representative at the time these allegations were made what is the ethics commission in the house called it's called the house ethics committee Okay, that, that, committee, that committee, do you understand that they would have had jurisdiction over if there were campaign finance violations that arose during your time as a legislator? Yes. When we say arose though, and this was my question, that were brought to light. Yeah, I, mean, I understand. We've got a timeline um, and it doesn't necessarily map with the point you're making, but by the time these things came to light, that's what I'm hearing Judge Coomer say, he wasn't in the house anymore. So why would the House, house Ethics Committee have looked into that? My, my point was just a jurisdictional issue, Judge. Okay. Um, the General Assembly in Georgia serves in what months? Well, they, they begin, they, they serve for 40 days, uh, 40 business days, not necessarily calendar days, not consecutively, but they start in January and then we might end any time from 
the end of March through, I've, I've seen them go through May. Um, and then you, you can have special sessions uh, also scheduled, served in, I think, one special session. So you, you can have service throughout the year. 40 business days or 40 days? 40, days. 40 legislative days, which is neither a business day nor a <laughs> calendar day. It is a legislative day. It is not bound by the rules of 24 hours nor calendars. Right. And does sometimes the legislative sessions have to go over because you're still considering legislation? Yes. Um, and did you do this all while you were maintaining a small solo law practice? Yes. Was there anybody in your office who could just take over your cases while you were serving in the legislator, no. legislature? No. Um, so was that disruptive to your small town law practice? Yes. Why'd you do it? I in, just truly enjoyed the service. I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed being able to be a participant in, um, in, in the process of, of, of serving the state of Georgia and serving my neighbors in that way. And what were your children's ages while you were serving in the legislature? When I was first elected, my sons were, um, I think they were 10 and six, and my daughter was born in 2016, June, 2016. Did you, do leg did you do volunteer work before your service in the legislature? Yes. And even while you were in the legislature, did you continue to do volunteer work? Yes. What kinds of volunteer work did you do while you were in the legislature? Well, I, um, I, I did um, disaster recovery programs where you'd go in and you know, physically help people recover from tornadoes and fires and whatnot. I did that in Georgia and, and other places as well. Um, I uh, volunteered with a local food bank, with a homeless shelter, I served on the board of a, a local homeless shelter. Uh, I volunteered for, um, uh, uh, you know, things that you'd expect a, a dad to volunteer for, you know, with his kids and the teams and so forth. Um, I uh, uh, volunteered for other uh, candidates and other agencies and, and uh, local local nonprofits that would uh, help the community. Um, did you get any awards while you were serving in the legislature? Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one was the um, uh, the Chief Justice Commission on Professionalism awarded me the Robert Benham Award for uh, professional service and volunteerism. Um, and I also receive, a, in 2017, I was the legislator of the year. And did somebody else have to nominate you for those titles or those awards? Yes. I think for the Benham Award, I was, I think I was nominated by one of my superior court judges. I think that's right. And the, the I don't know who nominated me for the legislator of the year. Right. Um, while you were in the legislature and in the Air Force, did you also practice law? Yes. And during your practice of law as a lawyer, have you ever been sued prior to Mr. Philhart for malpractice or fraud or breach of fiduciary duty? No. Have you ever di been disciplined by the state bar before Mr. Philhart came around? No. Um, prior to meeting Mr. Philhart in your entire history of practicing law, has anyone other than Mr. Philhart accused you of misconduct? No. Even if it didn't proceed to a complaint or to a formal proceeding, has anyone accused you of misconduct? I, in the I, had, a, of law? I had a client once uh, claim that I had not communicated with her and the bar notified me of that. And I sent the bar my probably three dozen emails with the lady and they dismissed the complaint. What kind of support staff and employees did you have in your private practice? At one, one assistant at a time. Did you have any associate lawyers? No. Paralegals? No. Bookkeepers? Nope. Accounting persons? No. All right. Let's talk about your family a little bit. Um, how long have you been married to Heidi? We were married in 2000. Uh, 2000. So t um, uh, it'll be 22 years next week. And you mentioned you have three children, right? Yes. And their ages are what? 21, 17, and six. Despite all the other things you've been doing in your life, have you managed to be present in their lives? 
Yes. Um, I want to talk about church and civic activities before you became a court of appeals judge. So talk about those if you would. Well, uh, I've been a member of the same church since I, um, for, well, for 17 years or so. And um, I work at my church as a volunteer. I, I volunteer for the music program. To, I volunteer to run sound and lighting. And um, I am basically a, 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 one of those guys when somebody needs something, they say, hey, go ask, you know, go ask Chris to help out with this. And, and so I do a lot of stuff there. I, um, uh, I've been a Sunday school teacher. I've, I've um, uh, mentored people through the church. I um, have worked on other volunteer uh, service programs through the church over the years. What about outside the church? What volunteer activities and civic activities have you done? Well, uh, I have, um, of course, done the military service, but also uh, locally, I think I mentioned I was on the board of the, the, uh, the homeless shelter board. I was, um, I, I serve on a board called the Retired Ministers Benefits Board, which is a, a board that oversees a minister's retirement program. I um, have served with the Optimist Club and the Exchange Club and the, and the Chamber of Commerce. I, um, I mean, there's a, there's a really long list. It's hard to remember. What about, did you, have you done any mock trial work? Yes. So I, I did mock trial programs. Um, I have uh, volunteered to speak at uh, local uh, bar events. I have uh, spoken at law day programs. I have um, read to uh, elementary school kids um, on you know, reading days. And I have um, also taken the opportunity to mentor uh, young people um, in and out of the legal community. Um, it, it was never my design, but it happened that I have been able to mentor a few uh, young men who didn't have fathers in their lives um, and, and help them uh, as a sort of surrogate father with them. I have, um, uh, I've also mentored young lawyers. Um, I've had interns in my office over the years, uh, including uh, young lawyers and young law students. It, it sounds like you have a lot of things going on. How have you made time to do those service activities? Well, I don't play golf. Uh, <laughs> You, you pick and choose the things that are important to you and you spend time on those things. And, and, and for me, it's always been a driving, um, really, uh, I don't wanna say exhilarating because that's the wrong word, but, but it's, been a, it's been something that really gets me going to, to help other people, to serve other people, to serve my community, serve my country, serve others. I want to talk about your background in accounting, if any. Do you have a background in accounting? <laughs> no. Um, do you have campaign compliance staff at this time? Now I do, yes. When you were a representative in the House of Representatives and Majority Whip, did you have campaign compliance staff? No. Um, if you had had compliance staff during that time, would you have followed their recommendations? Yes. Was it challenging to do all these different things that you've, you've done all at once, it sounds like, during your law career and as a judge? Yes. Have you continued to do your service activities and volunteerism while you've been a judge? Yes. And when did you first become a judge? I first became a judge in 2014. And when did that service cease? So that just lasted about three months. That was with the city of Adairsville Municipal Court. And why did that service cease? Because I was also serving in the General Assembly. I requested an opinion from the Attorney General to see if I could, if I could serve as a municipal judge and as a member of the General Assembly. Um, I thought I could probably because municipal courts are not what we call Article Six courts under the Georgia Constitution. But I wanted to be safe, so I asked for an opinion, and he said you couldn't do it, so I resigned. When from the you, from the I resigned from the judicial job. Yes, sir. Um, when did you next try to become a judge after that service ceased? I, I was nominated for an open seat on the Court of Appeals 
in March, 2018. And I, I started the process of applying for a position and then changed my mind. I withdrew from the process. And you were appointed to the Court of Appeals, is that right? I was appointed to the Court of Appeals in October. The, the process in, in uh, the spring of 2018, I think I submitted an, uh, you know, a package, an application package around March 20, somewhere the, maybe the last week of March. And then I withdrew that application about April the 10th or so. Um, did you sub, after you were appointed to the Georgia Court of Appeals, did you subsequently run and become elected to that office of yes. Court of Appeals judge? Yes. Um, when were you elected Court of Appeals judge? In the summer of 2020, I think June 2020. And if you would tell the panel why you wanted to be a judge. Well, uh, like I said, I, I've always had a career and a lifetime of service. I always looked for opportunities to serve. Um, and when the uh, opportunity to serve on the Court of Appeals came about, it, it seemed like a, it was an opportunity of a lifetime to get to serve again on a, on a higher level, on a broader uh, platform, and, and frankly, give me more opportunities for other kinds of service. Um, plus, you know, uh, being a judge is, is um, something I think a lot of lawyers aspire to, not everybody, but I, I know a lot of lawyers who think about it and, and uh, some who try to do that and few actually get to, to have that experience. And so for me professionally, it was a, it was a great opportunity. Um, and um, so I was, uh, I, I was happy for that. And, and um, of course, I was encouraged to do it by people whose opinions mattered to me and who I respected. And, and so I, I took that encouragement and moved forward with the job. Who was encouraging you to do that? Well, colleagues, um, peers, people I had, people I had worked for uh, in, in the legislative setting and, and, you know, people who knew my work and was, were familiar with my character and my reputation. I, I, is that good enough? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I want to talk briefly, kind of summarize some of the things that we are here about in this proceeding. Yep. I'm sorry, I have a quick yep. question. Judge, you may have answered this the first time you testified when we were together that week. Um, described how you were interested in passionate about serving in a different way to be to be a judge why did you withdraw your application after someone had nominated you um, in april of 2018 well i decided that i i wanted to stay in the role i was in at the time um, and you know having the opportunity to serve as a judge is it, it's unique and it's special but i was I was having a pretty successful time serving where I was. And so it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. I, I, I had opportunities to advance and to uh, grow in my service in the General Assembly. So it wasn't as if I had to, um, you know, like, like I didn't have other options. It, and, it, and I think, you know, the fact that I, I didn't nominate myself for that position, it wasn't something somebody said, hey, let me go nominate you. It, it, it appeared without my expectation. Um, I really wasn't ready to make that transition. So as I thought through the process, I thought, well, let me just go ahead and I'll fill out the application. I'll submit the application. That's, that's a kind of a long process. I'll go ahead and do that. It'll help me think through what to do and whether I want to do. And then as I got a few days into it, um, I decided it just wasn't one I wanted to do right then. I felt like there were other opportunities still left for me in the General Assembly. So I, I didn't, I withdrew from that. Um, it turned out there were, I actually had a lot of opportunities to do things with the General Assembly um, over the summer after I uh, withdrew my application. Um, but as the summer waned on um, and I started thinking about going back and doing another year of legislative service and, and trying to balance all of the, wearing all the different hats, um, you know, I decided, that that was, it was the time for me to try to make the transition. When, and, and, I, and I thought about that in terms of, well, if there's another opening, maybe I'll apply again. And then suddenly there was another opening and I 
applied and was selected. So it was over the course of the summer that you reevaluated. Help us understand what you're able to do legislatively over the course of the summer when the legislature's not in session. Well, as a legislator in, in Georgia, you're always uh, on the job. There's, there's always somebody calling you with a problem or an issue, and particularly when you're in leadership. Um, and, and that was an election year. So I spent a lot of the summer going all over the state, I, literally, uh, from, from the coast to the mountains and everywhere in between, working with campaigns and candidates, trying to help people get elected, trying to help people, uh, uh, well, help, help people get elected and, and get promoted in their, in their particular roles. I spent time um, working on uh, a legislative agenda for the following year that we would start working on in the summer. That summer, I, I went to China with a legislative uh, uh, delegation from Georgia um, work, working on uh, trade issues and, and Georgia's trade with China. Um, and so there were, there were, there was always work to be done. There was always something else to do. And, and at the time, uh, and I was happy to do it, but I got worn out with it. And, uh, and so opportunity to serve in a different capacity where I could focus on one less job uh, made sense to me. And we heard a story from Brandon Bryson about how you sat down with him in your office as a lawyer and gave of your time to him as he was aspiring to become a lawyer. Have you continued to do that during your service as a judge? Yes. And I, I reflected on that after Brandon, after Judge Bryson testified, I, I had forgotten about that. And as I reflect on it, what I realized is as I've become older, uh, there are there are many young men and women who I have sat down with, and frankly, to me, it just seemed like you know a nice cup of coffee or a casual conversation or a few conversations. Um, but I've seen as those folks have advanced their careers, and uh, the older I get, the more important they get, and uh, and so it's been a nice uh, sort of side reward to see those folks have their own growth and opportunities. And after you shifted to becoming a judge from the General Assembly, did you still have opportunity to use your connections in the General Assembly to advance the interests of the judiciary? Yes, of course. It was not uncommon. It's not been uncommon for me to have conversations with legislators and talk about things that were important. You know, there's a there's a there's a public legislative process in which, uh, for example. Um, a representative of an agency will go and have a public hearing with the appropriations committee and lay out their priorities and what they want to have happen. Uh, and, and that's what should happen. But there are also informal processes where uh, people will call or meet individually with legislators and explain in more detail why a particular issue is important and why it should be uh, pursued for the state of Georgia. So I had a lot of opportunities to do that as a judge, to, to call people who I knew on a personal level and say, this is what we really need over here, and this will help advance the state's interest in having a fair and robust judiciary. Uh, so, so I, I continue to do that. I continued to do that as a judge. Um, we got appropriately sidetracked, and I, I, I'd started talking about some of the issues we're here in this proceeding about, um, besides you as a person. Um, in, in retrospect on campaign finance, um, are there some things with regard to your campaign finance activities as a legislator, you would have handled differently? Yes, of course. And what controls do you have going forward to assure that bookkeeping and campaign finance errors don't happen in the future for you? Excuse me, I have um, retained compliance counsel. So if there's ever a question about whether a particular expense is, is appropriate for the campaign, I pick up the phone and call or email and get, get sound advice on that. Also, I have, um, uh, through that compliance council, I have um, uh, accounting assistants, uh, people who will file the legislative or the, the, uh, uh, the campaign reports for me. Um, and uh, so that helps. Uh, they, they do bookkeeping as well. Um, let's talk about the $50,000 extension of credit issue first. Okay. Um, did you claim a $50,000 extension of credit from you to your campaign as a legislator as a loan on your campaign finance disclosure reports? Yes. And why did you report it that way? 
because that was the only uh, way to report it on the form that was provided by the Campaign Finance Commission. As we sit here today, do you believe it was reported wrong on your campaign finance disclosure reports? No, I, I had, I had um, learned about that way of extending credit to the campaign through other, through legislators over the years. I knew other people had done it and, um, and I had the money in hand to do it. So it made sense to me to extend that credit, line of credit to my campaign. We, we've heard Mr. Lane here from the Campaign Finance Commission saying that maybe there are a few better ways to report it or different ways to report it or addendums you can do or things of that sort or explanations you can do. Um, did you report it wrong on purpose? No, no, absolutely not. Um, did you believe that you were required to report an extension of credit? Yes, the statute requires reporting an extension of credit. When you reported it the way you did, did you think that it would be a problem with the Campaign Finance Commission? No, I thought it was appropriate. I thought that's what their forms required. In retrospect, having heard how Mr. Lane prefers it to be reported, would you have reported it differently or done something differently? Yes, I, I could have added some comments uh, or some explanation comment that, you know, line of credit as opposed to, or extension of credit as opposed to loan. Going forward, do you ever intend to claim an extension of credit on campaign contribution disclosure reports um, in the state of Georgia? No. From, your, from yourself to the campaign? I, I, I hope that I'd never uh, need to do that again, but if I did, I would just add, either, if, they, if they don't update the forms, I would just add some explanation language on there. Um, let's talk about the Amex issues that were raised with respect to campaign finance. Um, did you know at the time you reported Amex charges on your campaign disclosure reports that there was some regulation requiring more detailed disclosures? No. Um, why did you report it the way you did with Amex listed as the end recipient of those would be expenditures? I believe that was what was required under the statute. And I knew that other members of the legislature had reported that way and continue to report that way. Uh, so I believed that was the right way to report those expenditures. How did you know that others had reported it the way you reported it? I heard other people talk about it and I saw it on other people's reports. Part of my, part of what I did as a legislator was um, from time to time, I would look at other reports. Um, did it? Hold on for a second. How is that your official duty? or you were curious and wanted to see, hey, you've been here for 20 years, how can no one's investigated you, how have you been doing? It was not an investigation, it was as a member of leadership in particular, and even before being a member of leadership, it was um, part of the caucus's responsibility, I don't know if responsibility is the right word, part of what the caucus would do is see uh, who had money in their campaign accounts uh, so we could know who to ask for help with other uh, candidates and and um, pretty early on in the process, because I became a, I, I sort of transitioned into leadership very early in the in my time in the legislature, um, and so I had reason to look at other reports and see that other people were reporting their expenses that way. The the American Express card that's at issue was that in your name? Yes. And was it a purely campaign card or was it a mixed use card? No, it was a, it was a mixed use card. Um, we've heard the director's accounting witness, Pat Salem, testify between March 2015 and November 2018, you paid about 10% of that card with personal funds and 90% with campaign funds. Is that about right? I think that's about right. Um, Going forward, do you intend to give more detail if you use an American Express card or a credit card on campaign contribution disclosure reports? Knowing what I know now, I, I wouldn't do it that way again. And I no longer have or use a mixed use card for the campaign and personally. Is that, why is that that you don't use that anymore? Well, this part of what I've learned through this process is it's not a good way to to handle it, um, and and so that that's the real the main reason I don't do it anymore. I also have a lot fewer expenses. I think I 
testified about that earlier. I have, have far fewer expenses, fewer campaign activities now than I did in the General Assembly. So let's turn to this issue of trips and some of the expenses that get charged on that American Express card. Um, do you admit that as to two trips you took as a legislator in the House of Representatives, you did not correctly account for all the personal, personal expense portions of those trips? Yes. And approximately, if you know, how much did you fall short on accounting by the time the Campaign Finance Commission started its investigation? It was about $1,900. Did you, as Mr. Boring suggested in an opening statement, pay for the whole kit and caboodle for these trips with your family to Hawaii and Israel using campaign funds? No. How was that wrong? Well, it was wrong because I didn't use campaign funds to pay for the entire trip, uh, either trip. Uh, with, with regard to Israel, um, I paid for personal expenses with non-campaign funds. Um, I uh, I paid the American Express card back uh, for the, or paid the campaign back for the um, expenses of tickets for my children that were purchased on the American Express card. Uh, and I used uh, personal funds during the trip, uh, paid for half the lodging with personal funds. I paid for part of the meals with personal funds. Um, so I think I, I, I believe that I appropriately accounted for the Israel trip as I went um, on Hawaii. Um, there was some, uh, there was an error. Uh, I missed the calculations, but I paid for about 80% of that trip at or near the time with personal funds or with, with payments back to the campaign for any uh, American Express card usage. But I, I didn't get the accounting right. And that's where the $1,900 comes in. And with respect to Hawaii, was that at a time in your life where you were transitioning professional responsibilities? Yes. What was that transition? So at that time, I was um, in the process of closing down my law firm, in the process of transitioning out of the National Guard into the Reserve. I was in the process of uh, you know, letting, uh, letting Kay Smith go and helping her to find other employment. I was in the process of shutting down my campaign um, apparatus, uh, including the financial side of it. Um, I, I was, uh, I was also doing all the things that you would normally do in life. Um, I was still practicing law, so I had clients to deal with, uh, cases to wrap up and hearings to attend and clients to send to other lawyers or help them find other lawyers. And, um, and, and you know, frankly, I, I was sort of afraid at both ends. I, I, I haven't talked about this publicly before, but I wound up in the hospital because I've was having, I thought I was having a heart attack in the middle of that process. It was so much going on. So I, um, I, I, I made some errors in the details in particular with regard to that uh, re refunding that trip. And, and just on this point um, about the busyness, one of the things that uh, Judge McBurney asked me about um, in the summertime, I think in that summer, if my memory is correct, I think I attended, I think I attended five or six conferences um, with as a legislator in addition to all of the other you know, campaign traveling I did. I mean, there was something all the time. It was not, it had become as busy as a full-time job. Regardless of the reasons why it happened, do you take responsibility for the errors in the details? Yes. And did you take responsibility with the Campaign Finance Commission? Yes. Did you self-report the issue of the personal expenses that may have been paid for by your credit card. Yes. And by the campaign. Yes. And so I guess the concern here is, were you floating personal expenses using campaign funds on purpose? No. And did you have other money to pay for these items on your trips to Israel and Hawaii? Yes. When you say, it's actually Mr. Lefkoe who said it, but this term self-report, um, does that mean, Judge Coomer, you called up the Ethics Commission to say, you all need to know this was going to be a campaign trip. I couldn't make it work out. It was related to my job as a legislator, but I had all these text exchange with Hawaii. I couldn't turn it into something that was legitimately legislative work related. So it's personal and, and I've, I've 
commingled some funds, my mistake, I'm going to fix it on my next report? Or what, what does self-report mean? So the, the self-report uh, was, it was from my attorney. Uh, so I didn't call him myself. My, my attorney, uh, who was engaged at that time. Who is that? Uh, um, Doug Chalmers. And uh, Mr. Chalmers communicated with the, with the, legis uh, with the uh, Campaign Finance Commission um, and he's the one that let them know that um, we had some issues with regard to the Amex usage and with regard to uh, reimbursements for the Hawaii trip. This was uh, in October 2020 when we first learned that there was an issue with campaign finance that needed to be addressed. Um, Mr. Chalmers uh, Kate went to work for me, and one of the first things he did was uh, have somebody go through all the records and, and see if, if there were problems, and that's how we came to that. Meaning you had already received notification from the Ethics Commission, we're looking at you. You retained Mr. Chalmers, or do I have that backwards? Just out of the blue, you decided to retain Mr. Chalmers. He contacted Ethics to say hey, there were some mistakes here. No, no. No, sir. No, I didn't know there was an ethics investigation, a campaign finance commission investigation or a problem until I was served with the first complaint that they served. I think it was October 2020. And when I received that complaint, it didn't have any reference to American Express cards. It didn't have any reference to Hawaii trip or Israel or anything like that. Um, so when we received that complaint, I hired Mr. Chalmers he then did a full review and said, you've got potential problems here. Let's self-identify those problems that they haven't identified and, and you know, take corrective action. Got it. So CFC communicates with you. There may be an issue here. No, sir. I'm sorry. That's not right. They did not communicate with me. There might be an issue. They filed a, they filed a formal complaint against me. Okay. That's what I meant. Okay. So they file a formal complaint. That's a communication. You're now on high alert. I need to get a lawyer. You get Mr. Chalmers. Mr. Chalmers does a thorough review and says there may be more going on than what was contained in the complaint. And you don't know whether CFC was already dialed in on the Hawaii trip and the Amex. It just wasn't in round one of the formal complaint. And what Mr. Lefko was calling a self-report was Mr. Chalmers on your behalf letting CFC know, hey, there may be a couple other mistakes in here. And I, I'm not using all the right words, but I, I think chronology wise now, I'm, I'm better in tune with what you said happened. Right, the only, I, I suppose if I was gonna disagree with any of that characterization, it would just be that um, there was no indication that the Campaign Finance Commission had reviewed the Amex charges or made any, um, made any inquiry into the Hawaii trip at that time. Those were things I, through my counsel, identified to them as potential problems. And, uh, and then, uh, or that they were problems that we had to correct. I, I understand, no, I, I, we're not disagreeing on that. I okay. guess my only observation is we don't know what they knew and what they decided to put in the first complaint or not. So one could assume that it was Mr. Chalmers who brought that to their attention. <clears throat> one could also assume they were already dialed into that as well. That just wasn't what they had put in the complaint. Unless you know otherwise, if you have communications where um, CFC said, oh, thank you, we, we weren't aware of that, um, but that's self-reported. And so that falls into a very different category than whatever was in the substance of the complaint that was served on you. My understanding is when we told them there was a problem with Amex and, and the Hawaii trip, that was, that was their first information that there was an issue. Mr. Lane didn't testify. Otherwise, I, I didn't hear any other. I, I don't have any knowledge that they knew about that before we told them. Thank you. Did you miss account for the trips on purpose? No. Um, Hawaii, we've heard, had an intended partial legislative purpose, but that evaporated, right? That's right. <coughs> and, Israel That's had, right. and Israel had a partial legislative purpose, right? Yes. And what was the reason you taken responsibility for the shortfall? What was the reason for the shortfall? Well, it was, it was my bad accounting practice uh, and, and sort of 
Well, okay, that's it. It was, it was my bad accounting. Let's talk about the law firm transfers issue. Um, we've heard from Mr. Lane from the Campaign Finance Commission regarding some transfers from your legislative campaign to your law firm and then transfers back to your campaign between 2015 and 2017. And during that time period, do you know what the approximate total of transfers, the April 2015 to March 2017 from your campaign to your law firm? There were, un, un, um, what do they call that? Um, unordinary or unnecessary? Or, yes, sir. Or just? Well, just all of them. So there, there, according to the consent order, there were $7,200 worth of unordinary and unnecessary transfers. Were there additional transfers too? Yes. And that the Campaign Finance Commission didn't find as unordinary and unnecessary? Correct. So what's the total of the transfers during this period? $9,400. And were there transfers made shortly after the transfers to the law firm from the campaign back to the campaign? Yes, um, typically within one to three days. And the total number of those was $8,950. Um, were all of those transfers to the law firm intentional? No, uh, there, were, there were six in that time period, there were six intentional transfers and two unintentional or inadvertent transfers. Right. For those transfers to the law firm that were sent to, from the campaign, the legislative campaign, um, what was the reason that you made those transfers? Well, I, in, the, in the first few years I was in the General Assembly, um, the campaign did not have enough money to pay for all the campaign's expenses. So the law firm, my law firm was floating the expenses of the campaign, it was just paying all of the, you know, staff, the, you know, I don't mean paying all, but paying large portions of the staff, the, the letterhead, the um, internet and email costs, and the utility costs, and all the things that you spend on running a, a local legislative office or a campaign office, because that was my, my law office also was the local legislative office officially, and it was the campaign office officially. So all those expenses were being borne by the law firm. Once the campaign began to have enough money to float its own expense, expenses, uh, I knew that the campaign owed the law firm a bunch of money. I didn't account for the exact dollar amount. And I, when I made the transfers, in my mind, I thought, well, the law firm owes this money. I mean, the, the campaign owes this money to the law firm. So I'll just go ahead and pay it is a legitimate payment to the law firm. Um, in each of those instances, I decided I didn't need to do that, didn't want to do it that way. So I just reversed the payment back. Were the reversals during the reporting period? Yes, they're always the, the payment to the law firm and then the reversal back to the campaign always happened within the same uh, reporting period. So I didn't believe there was anything that had to be reported. Would you do things differently in retrospect? Yes, of course. I, I, I would have um, more uh, specifically and, and uh, carefully accounted for the law firm expenses. I'm sorry, the campaign expenses that the law firm was paid. Um, I, and, and it was always my intention to do that, but, it, but I was just put it off, just did something uh, later, uh, did, did something. Uh, my intent was always do it later, and I just never got to it. I'm, I'm confused by something probably misunderstood. Um, I get the larger picture. Early on, as a legislator, you needed to fund some campaign work or expenses through the law firm account because you didn't have enough in the campaign account. <coughs> and in your mind, you were keeping a rough figure, so you began over time to reimburse the law firm because it had paid campaign expenses like a vendor. Um, then what I got confused on is it sounded like you said, so you would send some campaign funds back to the law firm and then you change your mind and send it back. But it sounded like you did that more than once. And I'm curious why, if after the first time you sent campaign funds to the law firm account as part of this long overdue balancing of the ledgers, you ever thought it was a good idea after the first time when you changed your mind? Why, why were you multiply 
on multiple occasions thinking, here's a good idea. No, it's not. Well, it was, it, it was the reason, that I guess the justification for why I did it was because I believed and I knew that the why campaign- you meaning send it back to the campaign no, account? No, sir. Because I get the justification of reimbursing the law firm. I, that makes sense. Okay. Um, it wasn't accounted for um, carefully. That's, that's, that's not my concern right now. What I'm trying to parse out is why on multiple occasions, you said it's time to send some money back to the law firm was transferred out of the campaign account. And then you changed your mind and said, nope, put it back in the campaign account. Why would that happen more than once? If you changed your mind and said, you know what, this either it's not well documented, this is a bad idea. Why would it suddenly become an okay idea two months later and you do it again and then change your mind again and, and send it back? That's the part I either misunderstood you or I don't follow the reasoning. No, that, that's a fair question and I haven't fully answered it. And what I was trying to explain is that the justification piece was that the, camp, that the campaign owed the law firm money. That's why it was in my mind, okay to do that. The, um, the further explanation is if you look, I typically did that when the law firm funds were low and I needed to get some money over there quickly. Um, in each of those instances, uh, the reason there was a, a repayment within a day or two is because after I transfer the money, then I'd go to the bank, put some money in the bank and transfer the money back. So it was, I had money elsewhere. I just didn't uh, have it in the bank at that moment. It was, a, it was a, a convenient use of that opportunity because I felt justified in using the money that way. And, and, it, and although, even though I felt justified in it, I really didn't want to use campaign funds to pay for law firm expenses, I didn't, I, I, or to pay for, to repay the law firm for the expenses that it owed, because I wanted to use campaign funds for other tr more traditional campaign activities, like sending money to other candidates or uh, helping pay uh, for trips and expenses that, that were more directly related to the law, to the campaign. Okay, I follow that a little bit more, but now a new confusion. Um, I think part of your explanation was, but I always had the money in some other account. And so a couple of days later, I put money in the bank from some other account. Why go into the campaign fund at all? Why not go into whatever other account it is you're thinking about to push into your law firm account? Well, first of all, uh, that, did, that, that explains a couple of the inadvertent transfers that I, I didn't intend to transfer from the from the campaign to the law firm. I intended to transfer from a personal account to the law firm account. So those were the inadvertent transfers. Um, but, I, and I, to be clear, I wasn't, I was not trying to say that I always had money in another account. I often had money in cash uh, that I was then delivering to the bank to put into, to, to, to uh, make the cash available to the, camp, to the accounts that I had in the bank. So, I had money available. It wasn't always in United Community Bank's checking accounts that could be transferred between the, the, those accounts. In retrospect, was this kind of napkin accounting stuff the right way to do this kind of thing? No, no. It, it obviously has led to a lot of confusion and problems, and I would not do that again. Were you trying to steal money from the campaign? I never stole money from the campaign. Did you, do you intend to do transfers such as this in the future? No. Does the law firm still have any funds from the legislative campaign? No. Do you have any funds in your personal possession belonging to the legislative campaign or your court of appeals campaign? No. I wanna shift and talk about um, Mr. Philhart um, and do you agree that there were some missteps that you made with Mr. Philhart? Yes. Before um, we dive yeah. deep into Mr. Philhart, it's 10.30, it's about halfway through before lunch break. So I think we'll give everyone, to, to include Ms. Johnston, um, a eight minute-ish break for as long as my colleagues need. Um, so we'll pick up right where you were, starting with the Philhart chapter to this discussion. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you
All right, Ms. Johnston, ready as usual? Great, let's do it. We still have Judge Coomer on the stand in the midst of his direct examination in his case in chief. And um, you, Mr. Lefko, had just gotten into Mr. Phil Hart. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, Judge Coomer, um, do you agree that there were some missteps you made with Mr. Phil Hart? Yes. And in your dealings with him? Yes. I wanna talk about specific things. Do you admit that you blurred the lines between a friendship and an attorney-client relationship. Yes. And with respect to the wills, um, Mr. Philhart's wills and estate planning documents, um, do you now, as we sit here today, understand that there is a bar rule, rule 1.8C, where an attorney cannot be the beneficiary of a substantial gift from a client in an instrument he or she drafts? Yes. And do you admit that you violated that bar rule by drafting a will that Mr. Philhart asked you to draft? Yes, but I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. Um, do you admit you should have known it at the time? Yes. And how did it come to pass that you didn't know it at the time? I, I'd never been in that circumstance before. I'd never had a client ask me to do that before. And um, never had a, really the relationship like I had with Jim Philhart with another client. And um, so I, I didn't have reason to know that rule and I, I didn't know that rule. As to Mr. Philhart's wills, did you draft the wills the way he asked you to draft them? Yes. Were you trying to just take his things from him? No. Or to distribute in a manner that he didn't want you to distribute? No. Would you have ever done that? No. Why not? Jim Philhart was my friend and we had a, we had a, a years long relationship that was close and personal. I had envisioned uh, us being friends for indefinitely for the rest of his life. And I had no interest in doing anything wrong or bad to him or, or using his assets in some way he didn't want them used. I always intended to do exactly what he wanted because we were friends. And not only that, uh, you know, I've never stolen anything from anybody. I've never done anything like that. And I would never do that. I'm not, I, I'm a moral person who does not engage in taking from other people. Did you ask Mr. Philhart to make you as beneficiary? No. And Mr. Boring asked this again, but did you just make yourself his beneficiary in his wills? No. Whose idea was that? Jim wanted it done that way. And did he say why he wanted it done that way? Yeah, he wanted... <laughs> Yes, he wanted me to be the beneficiary for his convenience so that he could distribute his assets the way he wanted to without having to go back and hire an attorney and have a new codicil written every time he wanted to make a change. Was that a job you wanted to have? No, I never asked for that. Were you willing to do it, though? Yes. Why were you willing to do that? Because we were friends, because he trusted me and I trusted him and... and um, it was a different relationship than I'd ever had with anybody else, but it, it, it didn't seem at the time to be a problem, a bad thing. At the time that you drafted that first will where you were a beneficiary per her, his request, had he already designated you beneficiary of some of his accounts? Yes. And if Mr. Philhart had passed away um, while one of those wills was in effect, um, or while the May 2018 will was in effect, for instance, would you have distributed his estate as he asked you to do? Yes. Have you ever used anyone's wills or estate planning to distribute in a way contrary to their wishes? No. Would you ever do that? No. Do you understand now that being the drafter for the way Mr. Philhart wanted you to draft his will was in violation of that bar rule? Yes. Would you ever do it that way again? No. I want to turn to the loans with Mr. Philhart. Um, did you always intend to repay Mr. Philhart what he loaned? Yes. And did you pay every monthly payment? Did CAC Holdings pay every monthly payment that was due under the terms of the note that had monthly installment payments due? Yes. Did it also pay every payment on the notes on the December 2017 note? Yes. And pay that one off early? Yes. Do you admit there could have been better protections for Mr. Philhart to assure payments would continue? Yes. Um, would you ever do it that way again? No.
Did you ever tell Mr. Philhart you would just pay back all the loans within a year? No. Did Mr. Philhart, when the loans were signed, give you any indication he didn't read the notes or wasn't paying attention to the documents he signed? No, he read them. Well, how do you know that? Well, he, well, two, two reasons. Number one, we discussed it. Uh, and, and with regard to the um, conflict statement, I read those out loud to make sure that he, that he received that information and understood it. Um, he also read it to himself. And he also read, before we did that, he read the documents and we discussed the terms specifically. Did Mr. Philhart in prior circumstances does any ever give you any indication that he signed documents he didn't read? No. How did you go about drafting the loan documents for Mr. Philhart? I uh, requested another attorney provide me a, a draft installment loan document. Did you do a lot of loan drafting in your private law practice? No. Did you ever do it before that? Not to my memory. How did, and it was a form you got, right? Right, it was, a, it was a, a, an installment payment note form, or, or, or it was a Word document that the lawyer sent over to me and I could see where to fill in the blanks. Did you take out any of the lender protective languages such as acceleration of interest and things of that sort no. that were in the forms provided to you? No, I did not, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. That's okay. Um, were there some errors typographical errors and the like in some of those notes. Yes. And th there's been reference to a listing at, of Mr. Philhart's address in two of the notes. You recall that? Yes. Were the notes intended to be secured? No. Um, was the inclusion of an address for security an error? <clears throat> an error? An error. Yes. Did you make that error on purpose? No. Were you trying to pull a fast one on Mr. Philhart? No. Did you always make the monthly payments under the March 2018 note on time? Yes. Was there a monthly pay for these monthly payments that were paid? Did Mr. Philhart cash all the monthly payments on time? Yes. All right. At this time, I would um, like to refer you to Exhibit 47, which is in a stack. It should be in a stack. It's where now? It's on the table. Oh. Can Ms. Bospo to Silva approach. She may oh. use all that authority to approach. Thank you. It's in numerical order. So if you could pull out 47. Okay. Um, Are you going to put something up on the screen? Uh, not until it's admitted, Judge. So these are things not yet in. I got to break Exhibit 47 has not been admitted. List. And I did provide um, Mr. Boring with notice that I would be tendering this during this witness. So. No problem. Let me just get out the witness, I mean, the exhibit list. One second. So, so while we're doing that, um, Judge Kimmer, if I can ask you one question. So earlier you stated you weren't familiar with our rule 1.8C, uh, which is the rule that creates the prohibition on creating an instrument where you might be the beneficiary, but you were aware of 1.A2 because you provide, that's the requirement that you provide your client in writing uh, when you're entering into potential business transaction with them. Uh, you provide them um, counsel as to seeking separate counsel. And you did that in these instruments because you said you read that to him, correct? Yes. So you were, at least you're familiar with the first part of the rule. You just weren't familiar with the latter part of that rule? Right. And because when I was doing, when I was writing the notes or entering these loans with Jim Philhart, um, I just had a sense, well, maybe you should check and see if there's a bar rule that addresses how you would go about borrowing money from a client. And is it prohibited? And so I looked at the rule. I wanted to make sure I was in compliance with that rule. And I specifically read rule 1.8a that had to do with uh, transactions that may have conflict with the client. And those... Um, so, so yes, I'm familiarized myself with that because I, I just had the sense I needed to figure out if there was a problem. I never had that, um, sort of 
tingling sense that there was something wrong with the way I was doing the wills. So I never looked for a bar rule related to the wills because I just didn't have, I didn't have a sense there was anything that would be a problematic with the way I was doing it. Thank you. Do you admit you should have looked for a bar rule? Yes. Um, Exhibit 47 is copies of checks? Copies of checks. Got it. No checks. All right. We tender Exhibit 47. Admitted. That was backwards. Um, <laughs> he said no objection before I tendered. But right. yeah, okay, great. Um, so may I um, publish, Judge? May, let me press the magic button here. <clears throat> All right. What is Exhibit 47? These are copies of canceled checks from CAC Holdings. And is this, does this show that every month CAC Holdings and by your signature on a check made a payment to Mr. Philhart for every month until the loan was paid back in full? Yes. And so the March 2018 loan had installment payments due, right? Yes. And the September 2018 had a balloon payment due at the end of the term, right? Correct. And the end of that term was that when Mr. Philhart's Teamsters pension was due to dry up. Uh, yes, is what he had told me. Um, now, did Mr. Philhart, looks like we've got signatures on the backs of these checks. Did Mr. Philhart cash the checks that CAC Holdings sent every month? Yes. And did you ever hear back from him that the payment wasn't enough or it was late? I don't recall ever hearing that. Did you also pay off the March 2018 loan early? Yes. And there was reference before to the fact that a lawsuit had been filed before you made that final payment, right? Yes. But up to the point of that final payment, did you make all monthly payments? Yes. Even during the litigation. You became a judge in November 2018, right? Or October? Uh, October 31st was when I was sworn in. Started work in November 1st. Did you hear Mr. Bryson's testimony that Mr. Philhart had told him you weren't paying any of the monthly payments on the note? Did I hear, can you, can you ask me that again? Did you hear Mr. Bryson testify in this case that Mr. Philhart had complained that you weren't making monthly payments on the notes? Yes, I heard that testimony. And was that true? No, it's not true. Was that ever true? No, I, I, don't, I don't mean that it wasn't, I don't know what Jim Philhart told Judge Bryson. I'm not saying Judge Bryson was testifying That's untruthfully. I'm saying what the substance of that testimony was untruthful. I was never behind on any payment or failed to pay Jim. Would you ever take out a loan from a current or former client again? No. All right, let's talk about Mr. Philhart's file. Before we do that, what was your understanding, Judge Kumar, as to what would happen if Mr. Philhart were to have passed before you paid off one or more, I don't remember now if there were some that were concurrent or if they were all consecutive, one loan, one loan, one loan. But regardless, if Mr. Philhart had passed away um, while there was a balance still due on one of the loans, given the role he had asked you to write into the will, the role for you, he'd asked you to write into the wills. That question makes sense, in other words, to whom would you, would not you, to whom would CAC Holdings owe money if Mr. Philhart passed away? And who would it be who would ensure that that got paid? Well, the money would be owed to his estate and I would be the person to make sure it got paid. You understand that places you in somewhat of a conflict? Yes. And would you do it that way again? No. But I would have, I would have also, met my obligations morally and legally and there would not have been a, there would not have been any problem um let's talk about mr philhart's file um did you provide mr philhart's file to mr gammon counsel for mr philhart yes after the lawsuit was filed correct um do you agree that you should have provided the file sooner to mr philhart when he requested it, it looks like in May of 2019. Yes. And as of May of 2019, how long had it been since you represented Mr. Philhart in the guardianship case? Uh, almost three years since the guardianship case had concluded. 
And did you ever say to Mr. Philhart, no, I will definitely not provide your file or no, I won't provide your file or words of that type? No. Did it seem to you that, what, or what did it seem to you Mr. Philhart's main focus was when he asked for his file? He was really focused on the loans, the money issue, and the, the file issue kind of came up as a, I think as an afterthought. I don't think that was his main focus. Did you provide documents relating to Mr. Philhart in April 2019 to Adult Protective Services? Per yes. Their, per their request? Yes. And Mr. Boring has mentioned that there was something missing from this file. Did you try to make something be missing from that, those documents you provided? No, I, I tried to provide everything they, they wanted. And did you tell Adult Protective Services that you had concerns about Mr. Philhart's mental health as far as whether you could negotiate a resolution with him? I, I told them that I still insisted on him having some letter uh, or something to reassure me that he was capable of, of dealing with me. And by the, at this point, as we sit here today, how long have you been in the private practice of law? At that time? Well, before you became a judge, mm -hmm. up to the time before you became a judge, from the time you graduated law school and were uh, passed the bar and became a yet. lawyer and sworn in as a lawyer to the time of becoming a judge? Uh, 18 or 19 years. And has this ever happened in your private practice where a client complained they didn't get their file timely? No. Um, if this ever rose again, how would you handle this differently? I would just make a copy and give them the file immediately or quickly. Let's talk about the request um, that Mr. Philhart get something certifying he was mentally healthy enough to negotiate. Um, did you ask Mr. Philhart to provide a letter from a mental health provider? Yes. Why did you do that? <clears throat> because in an email to me, he said that he had um, been depressed and making wrong decisions or bad decisions, and that he was not in his right mind when he was dealing with me. There, there was a responsive email that Mr. Boring has pointed out about where you said something about Mr. Philhart expressing suicidal thoughts at some point. Yes. When did he do that? That was, that was after I had already come onto the bench. I was a judge, and, and those were in our personal conversations. He told me that. Did you have concerns about his mental health before he entered into loan agreements or before he did his estate planning documents? No. Did you think he had diminished capacity when you dealt with him? No. Did he ever say he didn't want to live anymore or that he had mood swings before he executed his estate planning documents or the loan documents? No, he never said that to me. And let's um, shift topics a bit here. And um, there, there's somewhat of an elephant in the room here that you are a sitting court of appeals judge and you are serving a voluntary suspension, right? Yes. And it, when did you voluntarily suspend? Well, I consented to the suspension. Uh, it was either the end of December 2020 or the first part of January 2021. Why did you agree to a voluntary suspension? Even though I knew the allegations against me were not true, I, I did not think I could continue to serve as a, as a sitting acting judge while allegations of fraud and and dishonesty were swirling around. Uh, and I thought it would be more detrimental to the judiciary itself for me to try to continue serving while those allegations were floating around. I needed to be able to demonstrate that they were not true. Uh, and I didn't think I could do that as a sitting judge. I needed to deal with this process. Did you want to suspend? No. What is your response to these allegations you just mentioned? The director made them an opening statement. It's in the formal charges that you engaged in fraud, deceit, and dishonesty. It is absolutely untrue. I, I've denied it at every phase of this process, and I continue to deny it now. Did you deny those allegations in your deposition in this case? Yes. Did you deny them an answer to the formal charges in this case? Yes. 
Did you deny those allegations when Mr. Boring cross-examined you? In this yes. Case? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Yes, sir. Um, when you voluntarily suspended yourself, was there anything from the judicial system that came to you first that you responded to, or did you initiate this totally on your own to notify the judicial system that you are now voluntarily suspending yourself? I received the formal charges from the JQC that included the, the various allegations. And I began a discussion then with counsel about what do we do and how do we do it? I notified- your, your counsel. Yes, my counsel. I, I notified my court, the Court of Appeals, that I was going to voluntarily suspend. We learned through that process that I couldn't do that. I didn't have that authority. So I can't tell you as I sit here what, what the chronology of events was, what the timeline was, but part of our process included me uh, consenting to a suspension, an interim suspension, while these charges were pending. I don't know if that was a, I can't remember if it was a motion by the director first, and then we decided to consent to it. I don't remember the process, but it was something I had to consent to, or something I chose to consent to. Thank you. All right. I, I want to talk about the guardianship <clears throat> case for Mr. Philhart. Um, and there is a fee agreement which has already been admitted as Exhibit 128. May I publish that just for confirmation that it was admitted? I believe it was. 128. Um, I don't know the sheet I have says no, and there's a check mark next to it. So I don't know if it was unadmitted. Um, let's see what. Yeah. Yeah, we we show it as admitted. You yes. agree it was in? I believe it is, yes. Okay. okay. Well, there's no objection. Number under a different number. Okay. I have no objection. No okay. Can we tender exhibit 128 at this time then? It may already be in under a different number, but Mr. Boring, any objection to the admission and publication of what's listed as 128? No objection. Okay, it's in. Okay, thank you, Judge. Um, when did Mr. Philhart first come to your office regarding getting guardianship over his girlfriend? Um, he first came to see me on February 5th, 2015 about this case. And did you tell him whether you thought it was a good idea to file that case? I told him it was a bad idea. He shouldn't pursue it. All right. And in this, is this, is exhibit 128, is that the fee agreement you had with him? Yes. And specifically, I want to look at this highlighted clause. You see where it says, quote, attorney has advised client that obtaining guardianship over Wynell Waycaster will be a difficult task, that he is unlikely to be successful that he would be better advised not to pursue this case because of the substantial expense and the very low likelihood of success, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Is that a common clause that you put in engagement letters? No, never Did, used that in any other engagement letter to my knowledge. Did Mr. Philhart reject your advice regarding whether to pursue that matter? Yes. And was he determined to file for guardianship anyways? Yes. Is that level of determination consistent with the Jim Philhart you know. Yes. If he had followed your advice, would he have incurred any attorney's fees in the matter? No. Did you overcharge him for attorney's fees? No. Did you reach an agreement with him after the case was over as to how to handle attorney's fees? Yes. And you discussed that. Did you discuss that in your cross-examination? Yes. Let's look at the level of diligence that you engaged in in representing Mr. Philhart and uh, if you would um, look at exhibit 25 should be in your stack that has not been tendered to this point it is the guardianship case that was filed on behalf of Mr. Philhart. Um, the petition for appointment. Yeah. Uh, we tender exhibit 25 at this time. No objection. And so before we get there, let's look at your fee agreement, your fee agreement. You see where it's dated April 7th, 2015. Yes. 
And then let's look at exhibit 25, the petition. You see the highlighted portion that shows that you filed that petition on behalf of Mr. Philhart, April 23rd, 2015. Yes. Did you have to, did you do promptly, did you act promptly to do the work that Mr. Philhart hired you to do? Yes. Um, did getting ready to file that matter include just filling out a form or were there other things you needed to do? No, there were other things we had to do before we could submit the form. What did you have to do? Had to locate, um, we had to locate, I think, uh, her heirs, uh, her or her children, her family members, her children. Yes, and we had to, um, and we had to. Um, I think we had to consult with a physician um, regarding her uh, her condition, whether she was in need of a guardian. And um, I don't remember what other work we did in advance, but there were some some preliminary steps we had to do before we filed the petition. All right, let's talk about what happened in the guardianship case. Um, were there major challenges to the guardianship petition by Mr. Philhart? Yes. What were those challenges? Well, for one thing, Mr. Philhart was not related to the potential ward. He was her, her boyfriend. Um, they had a, a history of uh, allegations of domestic violence involved. They had um, more recent allegations that the gym was engaged in inappropriate conduct of a, I'll just say of a romantic nature at the, at the, um, at the nursing facility um, where Winnell was. There were, <clears throat> there was opposition from Winnell's uh, relatives, her sisters and brothers. And um, there was also this complicated financial history with Jim and Winnell in which he had uh, taken a mortgage on her home and foreclosed on it. Um, so th there were a lot of challenges with this case. When the guardianship case was filed, was Mr. Philhart living in her home? He was living in the home that he had foreclosed on that had been her home previously. And had he sold his own home? Yes. All right. Um, at this point, I want to look at exhibit 27. Um, that is the affidavit of Mr. Verzal. Um, and we tender that at this time. Submitted. Judge, um, what is exhibit 27? Oh, got it. This is an affidavit from attorney Gerard Verzal. And what does that affidavit pertain to? It pertains to the um, domestic violence abuse uh, arrest uh, and allegations that were made by Ms. Waycaster against Jim Philhart. And did, was this issue a challenge to obtaining guardianship for Mr. Philhart over Ms. Waycaster? Yes. All right, at this time, I would like to look at exhibit 29, which is the objection to the petition for appointment of guardian. I don't, oh, has that been admitted? All right, I would tender exhibit 29. No objection, 29 is admitted. Did you also receive an objection in the guardianship proceeding from a guardian ad litem? Yes. <clears throat> was that yes. guardian ad litem appointed by the probate court to look after the interests of Wynell Waycaster? Yes. Was that a challenge to obtaining guardianship for Mr. Philhart? Yes. And can you give just a general description of the work that was done in the guardianship proceeding for Mr. Philhart? Well, we had motions, uh, multiple motions that had to be prepared and argued in different counties. We had discovery that we engaged in, including medical records discovery. We engaged in depositions. Um, and, uh, and then of course we had multiple hearings and, and the trial itself. Um, you initially filed it in Bart the petition in Bartow County, right? Yes. And did it get moved to Hall County? It did. And this was pre-COVID, so nobody was doing Zoom hearings, right? Correct. Did you have to travel back and forth from your office in Bartow County to Hall County every time there was a hearing? Yes. Um, at least for the ones in Hall County, right? Correct. And that's how many miles approximately from your office? <laughs> About uh, 70 to 80 miles. Did you also take Mr. Philhart shopping for clothes? I did. All right. This time I want to draw your attention to Exhibit 31, which I believe has been admitted. 
you know. No? I, I don't I don't have a check mark next to it. That doesn't mean I'm looking to Miss Cross because he actually got her I list. Have, I haven't seen any of those. Okay. It's well, I, I would retender exhibit 31 just in case. There's no, there's no objection. It's readmitted. Thank you, Judge. All right. Exhibit 31, is that a true and accurate copy of the final order from the guardianship case? Um, that appears to be. So you started the work in April 2015, and when did that order come out? June 2016. Did Mr. Philhart, was he successful in getting guardianship? Yes. And we've heard the details already, but after the case was over, did you and Mr. Philhart settle on a fee? Yes. Did he offer more than the fee you ultimately agreed upon? Yes. And why did you reject that? I told him I, it was too much. I hadn't, I hadn't uh, put the billing together, but I knew it wasn't <laughs> going to reach $100,000. Did you want to take the time to put a bill together for him? No, did not. Is it as simple as just printing out something from your billing program to create a bill? No. It, it involves a lot of uh, going back and making sure the details are right and, you know, all the, all, uh, you know, making sure that um, dates are correct and times are correct. And, and that there aren't inadvertent entries from other cases. To right. Um, had it been a long time since you billed him last at that? Yes. Time? Um, the last time I billed him was, I think, October of the year before. So it had been eight or nine months. And so you had worked through the $20,000 retainer and he had had to pay you beyond that for all the work you were doing. Right. And was there a flat fee that you and Mr. Philhart agreed upon? At, at the end of the case? Yes. Yes. And when was that agreement reached? Like in terms of the proximity to the final order? It was, it was after the final hearing and, and, uh, I don't know if it was the same day as the final order. I, I couldn't tell what day that was filed, but it was after the final hearing when we knew we had we had prevailed. Was that fee that you agreed upon based on a calculation of exact amount of hours times an hourly rate? No. Did he agree to the fee? Yes. And before he started contacting you in February 2019, had he objected to this fee that he paid in June 2015? No. Did he ever suggest before February 2019 that he was unhappy with the fee he had paid in June of 2016? No. Let's talk about things that you did to help Mr. Philhart with the guardianship case after the final order. What sorts of things did you do? Well, we had to file... Um, we had to file annual, guard, uh, annual reports. Uh, we also had uh, an issue arise with, um, I think, his bond. We had, we, had a, uh, we had a hearing schedule on the bond um, issue. We had some problems with how he had uh, dealt with some property. We had addressed that. We had um, hearings that came from, uh, I think it was Department of Human Services, uh, the Medicaid, Medicare folks. Um, with regard to YNL, there were other um, issues that came up with regard to YNL's uh, dental care, with regard to various infections she had, with regard to moving her from one home to another. All of these things were um, part of the ongoing guardianship responsibilities he had. Um, other than the money he had already paid to you, did you ask Mr. Philhart to pay any fees for those services you just described? No. Did you keep time records of some of the services you provide? Yes, some, but probably not all. Why did you do that? Just trying to track what I was doing, where I was, you know, where, what I was supposed to be working on. All right. At this time, I want to draw your attention to Exhibit 33. That is the annual report or one annual report that was filed in Mr. Philhart's case. Um, and I would we do that. What, what's the bond that you were referring to? Mr. Philhart was out on bond. No, no, I'm sorry. No, he he had he had to obtain a bond to serve as the conservator, and there was a problem with the bond that arose because he had um, he, he did something with her property that I can't remember the details, but there was a problem that 
the bonding company, I think, filed a petition in the probate court and we had to deal with that. Okay, but it was bond flowing out of the conservative. Yes, yes, not, not, a, not a criminal bond, it was, yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, did I just tender exhibit 33? Not yet. Okay, I tender exhibit 33. No objection. Admitted. Um, let's look at exhibit 33. Is this an annual report that you assisted Mr. Phil? Oh, it's not up. Is this an annual report that you assisted Mr. Phil Hart in filing? Yes, what I'm looking at um, is, is four pages long. So it looks like there may be some pages missing, but this is at least the first four pages of the inventory. Yes, sir. Um, did you draft that report for him? Yes, with my, my staff. Did you bill him for it? No. Did you charge him for it? No. Did you make an entry in your records for the time you did it? I, I haven't reviewed them to know that, but maybe. Yes, sir. All right. Um, Say your staff. Um, I thought you told us you didn't have a staff except for the young lady. So that would be your staff. That's who I'm talking about. Okay. My assistant. Your assistant. That's fine. I want to make sure. Staff sounds so much better. <laughs> I had an assistant. Yeah. Um, let's talk about non-guardianship work you did for Mr. Philhart after the guardianship case was over in 2016. Did you do some work for him besides guardianship work or guardianship related work after June of 2016? Yes. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Was it a lot of work you did for him? No, just little, little things here and there that were just kind of incidental to our friendship. For the majority of that work, did you ask him to pay fees for that? I didn't ask him to pay fees for any of it. Um, was there a, a, a garnishment where some of the money from the garnishment went to you? Yes. Yep. What was that for? Um, the, he had a dispute with a, with a contractor, an HVAC contractor, and he had filed a, a, a lawsuit on his own and couldn't collect and asked me to do the garnishment for him. And then I got the, the garnishment award and he said i'll just keep the money i said okay i kept the money and how much was that it was i think it was a thousand dollars um it sounds like the guardianship was a big thing you handled that was pretty involved right it was a it was a definitely a piece of legal work yep. and was this were these other things you were doing for him as involved as that guardianship proceeding? no that was the most significant piece is that something that you do for a lot of people or did for a lot of people in your private practice where you did things and didn't charge them? I mean, occasionally you'd have somebody you do work for and didn't charge, but nobody, nobody like Jim. Why, why was he special and why did he get that? Well, we were friends and, and he was around all the time and we were talking all the time. It was just a different relationship than I had with any other. Every time you did one of these things, did you do a separate engagement letter for him? No. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about your friendship with Mr. Philhart because Mr. Boring in opening said the word really um, with refer referring to whether you were friends with Mr. Philhart. Were you friends? Yes. How did that happen? Well, I suppose it really happened over the course of the guardianship litigation. We spent a lot of time together. We talked a lot. I came to share his um, concern and interest for Winnell Waycaster. And uh, I, think, I think he could tell that I was genuinely concerned for his case and for him as a person. And that, that developed into our, our friendship that then lasted beyond that time. Um, <clears throat> So I think that's how it really started. It, 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 there were other aspects to it, but that's how it began. Did you visit with him? Yes. Did he visit with you? Yes. What do we mean by visit with? As in he'd come by your office and chat or he'd come by your house and hang out? No, uh, he would come by my office and chat probably once a week. Um, and he knew that's where I was a lot. That's where he could find me. So that's, that's where we tended to get together and talk. Were most of the visits you had social or work-related? Mostly social. Um, so 
tell me what you know about Jim Philhart from being friends with him, if you could. <laughs> well, I guess this is a, another part of why we were friends is uh, he, he reminded me of my grandfather. Um, he was a, a veteran like my grandfather. He had um, a very keen interest in women like my grandfather had had. Uh, my grandfather was passed and, and, um, and, and, uh, and, you know, Jim liked me. So it was easy to like him back uh, in the way that, that I had that relationship uh, with my grandfather. But also, um, you know, I knew that Jim was from Michigan. I knew that his family lived other places. They weren't there. Um, uh, you know, I knew that, um, I knew that he had served in the army. I knew that he had been a Teamsters Union truck driver, also like my grandfather. Um, I knew that, um, you know, I knew that about all about his relationship with Winnell, even the parts that didn't have to do with the case. I um, knew about his other girlfriends uh, and about, uh, you know, other experiences he was having all the time. We, uh, I knew what he liked to eat and, and didn't eat for dinner. I knew he didn't like to go to restaurants to eat. I knew he didn't, uh, I knew he had only eaten a taco once in his life. Uh, so there were, there were lots of little things that I know about Jim from our friendship that didn't have anything to do with legal work. You know how many times he was married? Four times. Um, do you know what types of activities he did? Oh yeah. He was, he was involved in the Patriot Guard Riders, which was a veterans organization. He was involved in a food bank program, volunteering there. He loved riding his motorcycle. He liked traveling. He had a few friends that he would do things with. He would uh, travel with a friend from Alabama. He would participate in a fishing tournament every year in Alabama. He had been a volunteer for the VA for some years when he lived in Alabama to drive veterans to VA medical appointments. Uh, I knew he got sort of fired. He's the only person I ever knew that got fired from a volunteer position, but he, I know he got fired from that position because he had a dispute with one of the veterans. Uh, I chuckle because he, he described this uh, six hour drive with this veteran and the two of them were arguing and yelling at each other for six hours. Uh, and, and then he was asked not to do, do that job anymore. Um, so I, I knew a lot of things. I know a lot of things about Jim that have nothing to do with my representation of him. All right. Um, without saying what they are, are there private things you know about Mr. Philhart that might be embarrassing for him that you're not gonna disclose here? Yes. And did you only know that because of your friendship? Yes. Was what? it two ways? Did he get to know lots about you or you were polite and listened to him talk, but he was a talker and you were a listener? Well, I think it was two ways. I mean, he, he certainly knows, I mean, for example, in one of the handwritten lists, he's, he, he leaves some musical instruments, um, which seems kind of out of the ordinary if you don't know the story. But Jim knew that my sons were both musicians. He knew that one was a drummer, one was a guitar player, and he knew they'd been taking lessons for years. And um, I think he had heard them play. And so he intended to leave to them those musical instruments. Um, so he knew, he knew a lot of personal stuff about me as well. Um, <coughs> I didn't confide in my deepest, darkest secrets in him, but, but we were friends and he knew a lot of things that a lot of my other friends didn't know. Um, he knew when I was out of town and when I was in town, because I shared that with him. After the guardianship case ended, were you more friends with Mr. Philhart or attorney and client? Friends. What kinds of things did he do for you as a friend? Well, um, he listened to me and, uh, and I listened to him, of course, but um, you know, uh, he offered to lend me money as a friend. And, um, so we, we had, um, you know, we just had this overlapping friendship that lasted for years. Did you visit Ms. Waycaster with him? Yes. And did you do that only during the guardianship case for purposes of your representation? No, I visited with Ms. Waycaster with Jim in the nursing home in Cartersville after I was a judge. And did you visit Mr. Philhart at his house? Yes. Why'd you visit with him at his house? Because we were friends and I was checking in on him and uh, because he wasn't able to visit with me in my office anymore, uh, I went by his house to visit with him on several occasions. 
was there a time he was having a medical emergency and he called you? Yes, he called me on my cell phone and said he was out riding his motorcycle and he was having a heart palpitation and what should he do? I said, well, you should get to the hospital and I wouldn't recommend you ride a motorcycle there, but that's, you know. Um, we, we, I'm gonna shift a bit here. We've dealt with this in kind of summary fashion, but I wanna talk about Mr. Philhart's estate planning. And let's start with your background in drafting estate planning documents. How did you learn to draft wills? Uh, I think the first training I ever had on will drafting was in the Air Force when I went to JAG school. Um, were those complex wills? No, they were simple wills drafted on a, on a computer program. Did you use Air Force forms you would learn to use when you transitioned to private practice? Yes, I used the same program. Bought a bought a lease with that program or a license. When you drafted wills for Mr. Philhart, did you draft them in accordance with his wishes? Yes. Did you solicit becoming a beneficiary of Mr. Philhart's estate planning? No. Did you solicit for your kids to get designated to, or for you to receive for your kids musical instruments? No. Did Mr. Philhart say why he wanted to designate you as beneficiary? He wanted me to carry out his wishes uh, as he expressed them in his estate in, in his in his will and his in his personal handwritten list. Were you a judge at any of the times you drafted estate planning documents for Mr. Philhart? No. Did you ever accept any benefits from Mr. Philhart's wills or estate planning documents when you were a judge or before you were a judge? No. Um, have you given advice similar to what you gave to Mr. Philhart about estate planning to other clients before? Yes. Not, not involving me, but I have advised other clients that this is a way you can, um, you can, you can have your estate distributed uh, if you so desire. If there's somebody you trust enough to do it this way, you can do it that way. What is the this that you're talking about? The, the beneficiary of convenience provision. And did those clients that you advised to do that without saying who they are, did they follow, the ones who followed that advice did they designate you as their beneficiary? No. And did they designate others like family members or friends? Yes. Did Mr. Philhart say why he wanted you to fill that role of beneficiary for convenience? He said that I was the person he trusted to do it. And how do people who don't do these arrangements <laughs> normally change or make changes to their wills? They would have a, uh, either a new will drafted or a codicil drafted to the will. Is that usually something lawyers charge for? Yes. Did Mr. Philhart express whether he wanted to pay lawyers to change his will? He did not want to do that. Is that what he told you? Yes. So was this beneficiary for convenience arrangement something to help him get around having to pay lawyers to do codicils or amendments to his wills? Yes. Did you also have witnesses to the wills? Yes. Were they just people in your office or somebody else? No. Uh, interestingly, the, the witnesses on these wills were Jim Philhart's personal friends who he knew from other aspects of his life, uh, Richard and Faye Phillips. They were his friends. Did he sign the wills in your office? Yes. And in the presence of his friends? Yes. There's a trust document that Mr. Boring has been referring to, you recall that? Yes. Um, what was the purpose of the trust that you set up for Mr. Philhart? Initially, we thought it would help him preserve some assets if he ever needed significant medical care that might be provided by government services. Did you hear Mr. Boring refer to it as a mechanism for you to just take Mr. Philhart's things? I think he said that. Did you intend to do that? No. Is that why you set it up? No. And what happened with that trust? I my, was, it, was it ever funded? No, no, it was never funded because I think that uh, it would not accomplish what Jim wanted to use it for. I told him that, and I said, "Don't put any money in it. Just, just disregard it, and don't ever use it." Did you change any of the? Well, first off, how did you get a trust form in the first place? 
from the same program I used for wills. Did you change any of the form language to the detriment of Mr. Philhart? No. Um, would you have ever district, would you ever use the trust documents to distribute to yourself as, in the manner that Mr. Boring suggests? No. Um, would you ever have done that with any kind of trust? No. Um, did you do a lot of trust work in your practice? No. Did you tell Mr. Philhart not to fund the trust before he started asking for the loans to be paid back or after? I, I, I can't remember the date on the trust, but I told him not to fund the trust shortly after it was drafted before any money went into it. Um, we've seen some handwritten lists that Mr. Philhart prepared designating things like you mentioned of musical equipment to you and guns to Brandon Bryson. You recall those? Yes. Um, did Mr. Philhart tell you that he had handwritten lists designating the property that he was going to dis or he wanted distributed and the way he wanted it distributed? Yes. What did he say he wanted you to do with those lists? He wanted me to distribute, he wanted me to use his, um, his assets and his property to satisfy the directions of those lists and to satisfy the instructions of his will. And would you have distributed per his wishes? Yes. Did you tell him how to draft those lists? No. Did you solicit becoming a beneficiary on those lists? Did not. Did you write yourself into those lists? No. Did he tell you that he was going to give you things or designating you to receive things on any of those lists? No, he did not. I had no involvement with, with those lists being created or the creation of those lists. We've seen some payable on death forms in this case. And I believe exhibit three has been admitted. Yes. All right. So at this time, I'll show you exhibit three. Is this one of those payable on death forms of Mr. Philhart designating you as payable on death for one of his accounts? Yes. And do you understand accounts pass outside of probate? That's my understanding. Meaning yes. outside of a will? Right. And was that where the majority of his assets appeared to be in things that would pass outside of probate? Yes. Um, do you see where Mr. Philhart has designated you as friend to receive 100% of this account in exhibit three. Yes. And do you see the date that he has done so on Bates label page five, but it's the second page of the yes. exhibit, exhibit May, three. What's the date? May 4th, 2017. And is that a year before <laughs> he executed a will that designated you as a beneficiary of his will for convenience? Yes. Did you ask him to make you a beneficiary or a designee under his payable on death accounts? No. Did he tell you he was doing that? Uh, he did not tell me before he brought the form and showed it to me. Um, at this time, I wanna show you exhibit 164. Has that been, I don't think that's been admitted. It's the, yeah, it's the payable on death um, to Fran Bragg. I would tender exhibit 164 at this time. So I've got a 164 that says the Bank of America statement from August of 2015. That's right. The Bank of America statement? It's, it's a Bank of America um, statement that has, that lists the beneficiary of that account on the statement for Mr. Philhart. But it's just a monthly statement from August 2015, but it's going to have the beneficiary, or is it like what we just saw, um, number three, where it's a form expressly designating Judge Coomer as the beneficiary upon death? The former judge. Okay. Any objection to 164? Uh, yes, I don't think it's relevant. It doesn't involve Mr. Uh, Judge Coomer's relationship with. Mr. Phil Hart at all, it's somebody completely separate. Oh, the name on there is not um, Judge Coomer. Right. Okay. What's the relevance of 164 and how would Judge Coomer know that there's another name on there other than you put it in front of him? 
Mr. Boring has suggested that somehow Judge Coomer improperly got himself onto payable on death forms for these accounts. He suggested some level of impropriety in opening statement, and I'm showing Mr. Philhart's done this before with friends. Okay, that seems relevant. 164 can come in. Is, may I, I apologize, Judge, I was taught this in law school, but is that admitted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me show you exhibit 164. Do you see on exhibit 164 where it is an account statement for Bank of America where it is named James P. Philhart, P.O.D. Francis O. Bragg? Yes. And do you see that that statement was from 2015? Yes. Just so we're balancing all this out. Yep. Does this Bank of America account persist into 2017, which I think was the date for the document you showed up? And if it does, did Mr. Philhart make a change in the designee of the beneficiary upon his death? He did, Judge. Um, that's Exhibit 6, which I believe has been admitted. It has. All right. Let me show you Exhibit 6. That's the same account, Bank of America. You see where the account name at that time is James P. Philhart, P.O.D. Christian Coomer. Yes. Did you make yourself payable on death for that account? No. Did Mr. Philhart do that? Yes. Did you ask him to do that? No. But I guess that makes 164 a whole lot less relevant, but it's in, so um, it'll stay in. Um, was Francis Bragg somebody Mr. Philhart appeared to trust? Yes. Did you solicit any gifts from Mr. Philhart ever? No. Did you pressure Mr. Philhart to make you payable on death? No. Did you tell him he had to? No. Did you suggest to Mr. Philhart that Dr. Moon could not serve as his payable on death? No. Did you suggest that Dr. Moon could not serve or had some sort of ethical issue with being his executor? No. Did Mr. Philhart indicate to you why he wanted to change from Dr. Moon to you as executor under his will? Just so I'm clear of what we're, we were talking about Fran Bragg and now we're talking about Dr. Moon. Right, Dr. Moon was another person that he designated as payable on death right. on accounts, right? Yes. Um, did Mr. Philhart say why he wanted to make a change from Dr. Moon? Yes. What was, what was that reason? Uh, he was concerned because Dr. Moon had, <clears throat> excuse me, had been the victim of embezzlement from two different people in his office, in his, uh, in his medical practice. And he, he worried that Dr. Moon may not be able to do what he wanted him to do um, with regard want, to his estate. Yes, Judge. I want, I want to shift topics to the September 2018 will. Um, and why did you draft, and that's Exhibit 57, which I believe has been admitted. Probably has under a different number, um, as I'm sure we've seen all the wills and the loans. You have it in as 57? Okay, it's in. All right. Um, how did that will come about? Why'd you draft that for Mr. Philhart? This is the 2018? September 2018, when you were <clears throat> getting ready to go on the bench. Okay, yes, that was uh, because I was going onto the bench. Um, I knew that I'd wouldn't be the person to serve as the executor or trustee for him after that. And I told him he needed to find somebody else to do that. I don't know that I told him it was because I was going on the bench, but I told him he needed to find a new executor or trustee. And who became the executor or trustee under this will? My wife, Heidi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did she appear to to you at that time and as, as of now, to be an intelligent person of good moral character who could be trusted to carry out Mr. Philhart's wishes? Yes. Did Mr. Philhart know Heidi? He knew her through me and he knew her, uh, he had met her once or twice. Did you tell him he had to choose Heidi? No, I told him he had to choose somebody he would trust. And what did he say about the people he trusted? 
He said, I'm not sure who I, I mean, we, we had a long, sort of a long conversation about it. And he, the names he identified, he said, I don't really trust that person. I can't use this person. If Mr. Philhart had asked you to designate someone else other than Heidi Coomer as executor and trustee, would you have done so? Yes. Is she the type of person who you think would let anyone use her as what Mr. Boring called a crappy attempt to obfuscate your involvement? No. What is your response to Mr. Boring's suggestion in opening statement that she didn't know what an executor or power of attorney were and wouldn't know how to exercise those powers? Well, without making a personal response, I'll just say she was a person uh, of, of sig significant intelligence. She has a college degree. She has um, also been licensed in three states to be an insurance uh, a contractor. And um, she has in fact drafted wills herself. So I don't think his comment was correct. Did she wanna be executor? No. Did you really want her to be executor? It, it, didn't, it didn't matter to me. I was trying to satisfy what Jim needed done and she was the person to do it. If he had said, I want my niece to do it, would you have drafted it that way for him? Yes. Did you charge him a fee, Mr. Philhart, a fee for this September 2018 will? No. Why not? I was doing it as his friend. Um, as to the powers of the executor, or trustee in these wills. Did you hear Mr. Boring an opening statement that you could have given it all to yourself? I think he said that, yes. Would you have ever done that? No. There is a power of attorney form that we've looked at and I believe exhibit 58 is in evidence, but if I could confirm. Hmm. It's under a different number. No, no, 58 is exactly okay. it's the May 2017 power of attorney. I just don't have a check mark next to it. That doesn't mean it wasn't admitted because. Um, okay. Give us a bad version of your list. It doesn't have a check mark. I didn't All get right. her list. 58 is in. All right. Um, <laughs> exhibit. Your check mark. All right. Uh, exhibit 58. Um, do you recognize that as a power of attorney that you drafted that Mr. Philhart signed? Yes. And there is a particular clause which Mr. Boring has focused on in this power of attorney, which is on the page Bates labeled 182, but it's the fifth page of this document, Exhibit 58. And it's this one. Um, Quote, this power of attorney shall take effect upon my becoming physically disabled, mentally incompetent, or otherwise incapacitated. Any third party may rely upon the written declaration of my attorney, in fact, that such contingency has occurred. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And was this language that you just made for Jim Philhart? No. Was that from a form? Yes, this is standard language for a springing, what's called a springing power of attorney. Um, what's the purpose of language like this? The power of attorney does not go into effect on the date it's executed. It, it only becomes effective for use by the attorney. In fact, if the person who's given it has become uh, incapacitated in some way. Why is it important for third parties dealing with somebody with a power of attorney to have confidence that that power of attorney has authority to act for the for the um for the person so um the 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 language is intended to protect a third party from uh being abused by a bad actor who's who's using this uh, uh, power of attorney the the power of attorney is only as effective as the willingness of the third party to honor it so this gives that third party some level of protection when a person says, hey, I'm here to, I'm here to do business for Mr. Philhart um, and here's the power of attorney and here is a written certification or declaration that he is in fact incapacitated at this time. Would you have just declared him incompetent and taken Mr. Philhart's things? No. Have you ever done that? No. Was that clause intended to do that? No. 
would that clause have assisted you in getting if Mr. Philhart became incapacitated, getting information such as information on his balances owed on bills? Yes, or medical records or, or his mortgage or, or whatever, whatever issues needed to be addressed quickly before you could get to probate court to have a declaration of guardianship. Have you ever declared yourself somebody incompetent? I'm sorry, say that again. Have you ever yourself declared somebody incompetent? Uh, I, I don't know whether I've ever done that in my judicial capacity, but I have never done that in any personal capacity. Right. Um, let's talk about Mr. Philhart's mental state at the time of his estate planning. Um, before he executed his estate planning documents with you, did he ever express that he was making mistakes, that he was depressed or didn't want to live anymore? All right, ask me that again so I have the... I, Before Mr. Philhart executed the estate planning documents that you drafted, did he ever express to you that he was making mistakes, that he was depressed, or that he didn't want to live anymore? He did not, no. Did he seem to be of sound mind? Yes. And did the witnesses, his friends that were there, express any reservation on whether he was of sound mind? No, and I asked him. What'd you ask them? Well, as part of the, the will signing uh, a ceremony, I would ask Mr. Philhart in front of the witnesses if this, if he'd read the will, does it do what he wants to do with his estate? Does it satisfy the wishes as he expressed to me? And does he want to sign it? Is he under any duress? Is he of sound mind? Are you over 18 years old? All those sort of standard questions. And then I would turn to the witnesses and say, you're here, you've, you've identified Mr. Philhart as who he claims to be. Does he appear to be under duress? Does he appear to be of sound mind? Does he appear to be making these decisions on his own volition and accord? So we'd go through all of that as part of the signing process. I wanna talk about the loans for Mr. Philhart. We talked about them in summary fashion earlier, and I wanna get into a few of the finer details of this. Before um, we dive into yep. the finer details, we're a couple minutes away from noon, so we'll break for lunch soon. Wanna be a natural spot for you. Um, are you close to finishing? Are you close to finishing loans? How would you like to work this short of keeping us away from lunch until 1.30? <laughs> I think this is probably a good time for lunch, Judge. Right here? Yeah, okay. yeah, because this is a new section. So. Okay, great. I, I didn't mean to trip you up, but it, since you were transitioning, I thought let's, let's pause here. No, I like lunch, thanks. Great, <laughs> enjoy it. Um, let's try to be back by one o'clock. Um, we experienced during our week together that it is hard to get to the square, get served, and get the food in you and be back in that one hour, but let's make that our aspiration is that we'll all be back by one. It may be more like one ten, but we'll all do our best. All right, thank, thank you. you.
Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Sure. Here you could thank Ms. Cross, but I'll take credit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Ms. Johnson, are you ready? Great. We are back on the record after a frigid lunch break. Um, we've got Judge Coomer still on the stand, still under oath, and Mr. Lefko still at the podium. Yes, sir. And you were going to, I think it was back into the loans. I don't remember, but you, I'm sure you remember where you were. I'm going to rewind for one second and then we're going to go forward. Okay. Um, so, Judge Coomer, um, we had talked about your history of serving in the Air Force. Um, the ranks go second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, major, and then your rank, right? Right, lieutenant colonel. Did you start as what kind of lieutenant? First lieutenant. And do you know how what the percentage of officers that reach the rank that you've reached in the United States Air Force is? About, about 8%. What about um, who have reached the rank that um, uh, Lorraine Mink, Colonel Mink, who was here earlier? About what, 2%. So 2% of officers who in the United States Air Force ever become colonels. That's right. Um, and how many, as, how many reviews per year do you get in the Air Force? At least one. And who has input on those reviews? The, uh, my immediate supervisor, who would be a, a superior ranking JAG, and then the unit commander, who would, um, in my current job, is a three-star general. And how many years have you served in the United States Air Force? Um, 21, almost 22. All right. Were there ever any issues with ethics, truthfulness, or professionalism found in any of those reviews? No. And how often was Lorraine Mink involved in those evaluations? Well, she was, she was more directly involved in the last few years. Um, and throughout my career, she's been in positions where she had some level of oversight, but it was usually more distant. Like she would be in the Pentagon and I would be at a, at a base office, but we would interact. Um, did you get every promotion you sought in the United States Air Force? All but one. And what was the one you didn't get? Uh, the, the promotion to Colonel, which came up uh, during this process. And I was dealing with this and I didn't get my paperwork in time for the promotion. Right. So I want to talk now about what we were about to talk about before launch, the loans with Mr. Philhart. Um, tell the, the panel, if you would, how you first came to borrow money from Mr. Philhart or how CAC Holdings on the paperwork borrowed money from Jim Philhart. Well, um, in 2017, uh, Jim told me that he had made loans to other friends and that he was willing to make loans to me. And this was just, it was just kind of conversation. Um, I wasn't seeking a loan, but he brought this up a few times in our conversations. Um, so at a point I said, okay, I've got a loan outstanding. I'll borrow money from you, pay you interest instead of paying the bank. And um, so that's when I borrowed the first uh, loan in 2017. Uh, that was with regard to a, a piece of real estate uh, the, the CAC Holdings owned in Tennessee. And did he inform you that he had loaned money to other friends before he loaned money to you? Yes. And if Mr. Philhart was just your client and not your friend, would you have been involved in any loans from him? No. Are those notes on the loans repaid? Yes. And when they were repaid, were they repaid with interest? Yes. Was the interest amortized, for instance, for the 30-year loan on a 30-year amortization? Yes. And on that amortization, is interest heavy on the front end? That's right. And was interest, was, was the loan for the one that was due in 2026, was that paid back with interest? Yes. Was that based on amortization over an eight or nine-year loan? Yes. Did you make any misrepresentations to Mr. Philhart to get him to enter in any loans? No. Did you say anything to Mr. Philhart that was untrue? No. Um, there's been some talk about a 30 year term on one of these loans and we heard from Mr. Philhart. Um, what was the reason on your end personal to you why you wanted it to have a 30 year term? I was paying off a mortgage and the term just was a term that made sense to me. And that loan 
came about because I was paying off the first loan. And when I called Jim to say, I'm paying off this loan, he said, well, I'm back in the same position I was in before. I've got money in checking that's not earning any interest and more money than I'm going to spend. Um, so let me, you know, do you have an, you want to make another loan? So I said, okay, yes, I can make an, I can do another loan with you. The, the mortgage, there was some testimony that you paid off a mortgage with the funds that Mr. Philhart loaned, right? Yes. And was your credit good at that time? Yes. Um, were you paying your debts as they came due? Yes. Were you having financial difficulties? No. Why didn't you just borrow money from a bank? <clears throat> well, like I told Jim, I, I'm happy to pay him interest instead of a bank. There was no, um, there was no pressing need for, for me to change my loan structures or anything like that. Could you have borrowed money from a bank? Yes. Did you need Mr. Philhart's money? No. Were you paying your debts as they came due? Yes. Can you tell the panel, there's been some talk in, in the campaign finance context about whether you had enough assets to extend the $50,000 extension of credit to your campaign. And did you have sufficient assets at that time? Yes. Um, and were your assets limited to just what was in your bank accounts? No. What other assets did you have? I had my home. I had uh, probably $100,000 or so in vehicles, maybe $70,000 in vehicles. I had the UBS investment account and I had cash. And even if the UBS investment account were completely discounted, would you have had enough to extend yourself $50,000 in credit or to extend the campaign $50,000? Yes. When was your home purchased initially? 2005. So by refinancing to a 30 year term, did that extend out payments beyond when you had expected to repay your first mortgage? Yes. That paid off? Yes. Did you also have a line of credit with UBS? Is that right? Yes. How much was that? Um, it was um, $133,000 line of credit. And did you max it out or was No, I never used it. When did you start having that available to you? It was in 20, I think it was 2018 or 19. Why did you get it? Um, I don't remember when I got it. I, I never used it. I don't. I think my I think my broker was selling me a product. Maybe I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. So December two thousand seventeen is the is the first loan with Mister Phil Hart, um, and I want to pull up Exhibit thirty seven, which I believe has been admitted. Okay. Great. All right. Exhibit thirty seven is that the loan the promissory note to Jim Philhart from December, 2017. Yes. And if you look at page one, the note was for $80,000, right? Yes. And it's got $506 due every month, right? Yes. And this is the one you paid off in March, 2018, right? Yes. All right. Um, now, on the first page again, there's some what I call lender protective language. And we talked about this before, but it could have been stronger for Mr. Philhart. Is that fair? I, I suppose so. I mean, this was language that was in the form that I got. I just, I didn't change any of that language. And it contains language for late fees and interest at 16% upon default, right? Yes. Did you change any of that from the form you got? No. We also saw that there was this disclosure form on the third page of that document. Um, that's what Mr. Lopez referred to, the 1.8A disclosure. Call that? Yes. You also see that instead of the um, $506 per month, it is written in typewritten language that it was $406 per month. Correct. And that number 406 is crossed off with handwriting. Do you see that? Yes. Who made that change? I did. Did Mr. Philhart ask you to make that change? No. 
Was that an error to put 406 in that document? Yes. Was that your error? Yes, my error. Let's talk about um, the March 2018 loan. And that is exhibit 131, which I believe was admitted by the director. Before we go to the next loan, um, Judge Coomer, you, you paid this loan off. I just don't remember how that worked. You borrowed $80,000 and you paid, given the 4.5% interest rate, 506 per month for a few months, <coughs> but then you paid it off. By paying it off, did you simply pay off the remaining principal or did you do the complicated math to say, here's the interest I would have paid more importantly, Mr. Philhart would have earned over all that extra time, so I'm paying him principal. <coughs> uh, I, what I, I'm not sure I can answer that with a yes or no. I'm not. So what I did is I calculated the amount of payments. I tell you what I did. I went to some mortgage calculator website. I typed in the numbers, and that's what I paid him. Okay, and it was meant to be the remaining unpaid principal. Because each of the 506 payment, some of its interest, some of its principal. Yes. It's not that you paid 506 <coughs> times number of checks and that's principal. You Correct. In that. But what you paid off was just the remaining principal. There wasn't an early payment penalty because um, Mr. Philhart didn't get that stream of payments over time. That's correct. Okay. It just it calculated the interest on the loan as it had accrued to the time of payment. And we had... Yeah, so there was no payoff penalty. Right. Um, on the March 2018 loan, and we, we confirmed 131 was admitted, right? Okay. Um, let me show you exhibit 131. Um, do you see, is this the March 2018 loan with Mr. Philhart? Yes. And do you see where in bold on the first page, that the last payment is listed as of April 1st, 2048. Yes. That's the 30 year note, right? Yes. Where did the interest rates come up with? Where did you come up with the interest rates? I don't uh, this is a loan from just a few months later and it's like a percentage point less on interest. Yeah, I don't remember. Do you recall if it was a back and forth between the two of you as opposed to you just picked an interest rate or he just picked an interest rate? I really don't remember. I know we talked about all of that and we we went through the detail, the terms in detail. I don't remember how we reached a particular <coughs> interest rate. Um, when you repaid him in full for this note, um, did you repay him with interest at a 30-year amortized interest rate? Yes. With the interest heavy up front? Right. And is there, does this note contain the same lender protective language that we saw in the last one? Yes. With 16% interest in the event of default? Yes. Right. And then did the loan ever go into default? No. Let's look at exhibit 46, which is the September 2018 loan. If we could confirm that that one is in, I believe it is. Okay. Yep. All right. Exhibit 46. Now, this is a different form, isn't it? Yes. Where'd you get this form? I think I had this form. I think I found it online. I can't remember exactly. You see at the top that, that the amount of the loan and the interest rate, um, those are bold terms. Yes. You see January 1, 2026 is the single payment due. Yes. Um, how did it come about that it, January 1, 2026 was the date of the balloon payment? That was uh, Mr. Philhart's desire. He had, Jim had come to me uh, um, earlier in the summer and said he wanted to, uh, he had this issue with the Teamsters Union uh, pension fund that was going to dry up. And, you know, I explained all that previously. I don't have to yep. go into all that again, but, um, but that date was intended to correspond with when he thought the Teamsters Union pension was going to be evaporating. Did you need to borrow Mr. Philhart's money through 2026? No. Did you need his money? No. Is there a mistake in this document, document that's to your detriment? Yes. 
And what's that mistake? This is $140,000 at the top, uh, but it was only a $130,000 note. He only lent $130,000, is yes, that right? He, yes. Um, do you see that there's an address listed in that note? Yes. And what's that address? That's the address where you would pay the payment. And is, whose address is that? It's Jim Philhart's address. Did you also do a conflict waiver with this one? Yes. Is that the third page? Yes. Now, you knew, right, that um, Mr. Philhart was considering selling his stocks in July 2008, right? Yes. And do you remember why he said he was considering doing that? I, I don't remember independently what the, what the full context of that conversation was. I, I, looking back at it, I believe it was about him liquidating some stocks. Did he mention his Teamsters pension at that time, or do you remember? That's when we were talking about the Teamsters pension. It would all have been at the same time. I, I, so I assume that's what that was a reference to. Did you tell Mr. Philhart to, tell, to sell stocks? No. Did you ask him to sell stocks? No. Did you convince him to sell stocks? No. And you had correspondence with him that he forwarded to his financial advisor about tax consequences, right? Yes. Why did you do that? Uh, because if he was going to liquidate stocks, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that he knew the tax, tax consequences before he did that and could account for that and whatever whatever arrangements were gonna be made with regard to the funds he was gonna use or the, the, the money he got from that liquidation. We heard from Mr. Philhart that he did in fact sell stocks. Did you hear that testimony? He did, yes. Um, and did he tell you when he sold the stocks, hey, I sold stocks? No. <clears throat> um, I wanna show you exhibit 44. Don't have that. I tender exhibit 44. It's the check for this loan. Okay. Submitted. All right. Let me show you exhibit 44. What is that highlighted check from James Philhart dated September 10th, 2018? Ooh, here. Here you go. For James Philhart dated September 10th, 2018 to CAC Holdings. Right. That's the payment the funds for the note that we signed. Is there any indication on the check itself that it came from liquidation of stocks? No. What did you do with the money from this particular loan? Uh, ultimately, I put it in my investment account and then paid it back to Jim. Did you intend to pay the loan back within the term agreed upon? Yes. Had it not been repaid early, would it have been repaid on time when his pension was supposed to dry up? Yes. All right. Mr. Boring said something in opening statement about the fact that there were no witnesses or notaries to the note itself. Did the forms you received have any spaces for notaries or witnesses to a promissory note? No. Are promissory notes, to your knowledge, required to be notarized or witnessed by law as estate planning documents are? Not to my knowledge. Or deeds? No, correct, no, not to my knowledge. Judge Kubert, um, on this particular loan, so you're paying interest on this loan, correct? On the third loan? Yeah. Oh, no, this is just a balloon payment. Right? Yes, sir. But you would owe just 130000 at the end of the balloon payment? No, plus the accrued interest over the term. So okay. when I paid that loan off, I paid it, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was 130,000 principal plus whatever the accrued interest was through that date. My question is, why would you agree to do that? If you didn't need this money for a particular purpose, you're just doing this as a gesture to a friend that I'm going to basically hold this money, but I'm not just holding your money. I'm going to pay you more than you let me. Were you expecting to make more money on this, make more money in interest in your investment account than the interest you would owe on the, on the payment? eight years down the road? Well, I expect that I would earn at least 4% to pay, the, to pay that cost. 
And at the time I made the at the time I entered the note with Jim, I didn't know if there would be some other use of it, some other investment of it in the future. It just didn't happen in this case. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wasn't using it to live on. I can tell you that. Did Mr. Philhart? It seems like you entered into one loan in March 2018, and then all the way up through February 2019. Did you hear from him saying he was dissatisfied with the loan arrangement? <clears throat> no. And was he continuing to accept payments under the March 2018 loan during that time period? Yes. And did he in fact continue to accept payments under the loans all the way up until they were paid in full in April, 2020? Yes. All right, let's talk about how this relationship with Mr. Philhart started to break down. And um, I wanna turn your attention to exhibit 75, which I believe have been admitted in this case. Yes. Okay. Um, exhibit 75 is exhibit 75. And you've looked at this exhibit before, right, Judge? Yes. Without having to look at every page. Is that a true and accurate copy of correspondence between you and Jim Philhart? Um, I think this one is between Jim Philhart and Deborah Conley, who was my assistant at the time. Between you and Jim Philhart or Jim Philhart and your law office is exhibit yes. 75. All those emails, emails involving correspondence with Jim Philhart. Yes. And where the emails say they came from Jim Philhart, did they come from Jim Philhart? Yes, to my knowledge. Um, let's turn to page seven of exhibit 75. And this is an email string from July of 2018. And what was going on here? Um, Jim was having an issue with uh, 1L Waycasters Dental Care. Um, and he had a personal issue, right? Right. And he was consulting you on those? Yeah. And had he said anything to this point between March 2018 and July 2018 to the effect that he'd made some kind of mistake or was depressed before he entered in any loans? That's right. No, he had not. All right. Let's turn to page... 11. And this is an email from September 2018 um, from uh, K. Smith to you concerning a call from Mr. Philhart. You see that? Yes. And he, it says that he had called and wanted to talk about a business deal. Do you recall that? Yes. And he had been invited to go see the governor, right? Yes. Um, as of this time, was Mr. It wasn't the governor yet, but yes, sir. Right, right, Brian Kemp. Um, as of this time, was Mr. Philhart complaining in September 2018 that he made some kind of mistake, he was depressed, etc.? No. October 5th, 2018, um, which is page 12 of Exhibit 5. This is an email between you and Mr. Philhart or emails um, about a will for Shirley. You see that? Yes. And is this something that you did for him free of charge? Yes. Um, and was it a will for a friend of his? Yes, it was a will for a friend of his. And in October, 2018, was he complaining that he was depressed and had made mistakes? No. Let's look at a November, 2018 email, which is, um, well, actually, November 2018, you went on the Court of Appeals, right, sir? Yes, I started, I started working November 1st. And did you tell Mr. Philhart that you can no longer do these things like drafting wills and things while you're on the court? I, I would have told him that at some point, yes. Did he express that he was disappointed? Yes. Mr. Me... Judge Coomer, um, Mr. Philhart talks about your, your dad, I think, contacting mm -hmm. him. This is because your dad was running for your seat? Yes. And who is Scoggins? The other person running for that seat. Your father's opponent. Yes. And Scoggins was also the probate judge for Bartow County when we filed the Wynell Waycaster <clears throat> litigation. So Jim had a personal dislike for then Judge Scoggins. 
It says something about what Scoggins did to him a few years ago. Do you remember what that was? He's referring to the, the Waycaster litigation. Let's see. All right. Let me show you exhibit 191, which I'm sorry, I believe has been admitted. I show it as admitted. This is Mr. Cool. Mr. Cool. All right. Um, is this a true and accurate copy of emails between you and Mr. Phil Hart from, well, this is too small. Yes. Let's get that bigger. Sorry. You from uh, December, 2020. December, 2018. I'm sorry, December, 2018. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. Um, you see, that Mr. Philhart sent you a better business complaint. Yes. <clears throat> and you see where he is saying, Mr. Cool should not be sold in the United States at all. He sees the governor about this in person, right? Yes. Um, you also see that he's mentioning that, uh, I believe this is, the trouble is ongoing <clears throat> breaking me. You see that? Yes. At that time was Mr. Phil Hart complaining that the loans were unfair to him or he somehow had memory issues or mental issues which caused him to enter into those loans. No. Let's look at exhibit 193. And these are further emails concerning Mr. Cool. You see on January 6, 2019, where Mr. Um, you are emailing Mr. Phil Hart about talking to a lawyer in Kentucky about Mr. Cool. Yes. And what, what was that about? Uh, it was just, it was just what it says there. It's about him trying to get some help with the, what he believed was a legal claim he had against Mr. Cool. And you see, it looks like you responded January 6th and he had sent his email December 28th. You yes. see that? And why did it take you a little while to respond? I think uh, I probably was away from my anniversary trip. Um, and then it was just the holidays and took a little few days to get back in touch with him. All right. At that time, was Mr. Philhart complaining that he had um, been depressed before he entered into the loans? No. All right. And then we get to January 15th, 2019, which is page 13 of exhibit 75. Um, th this is the first, is this the first email where Mr. Philhart mentions being upset to you about the loans? Yes, this is the first time he mentioned anything about a problem with a loan. And do you see where at that time he's talking about that his stockbroker had told him that he could have made him more money? Yes. But he also mentions his problem with his heat pump later in the email. Do you see that? Yes. Then we get to dinner. Um, February 8th, 2019, Mr. Philhart came to dinner at your house, right? Yes. Um, was he coming to dinner to talk him out of anything to do with the loans? No, not did, that wasn't my purpose. Did you even talk with him about the loans? No. Did you talk with him about any business between you and him at that dinner? No. Did he sit at dinner with your children? Yes. And your wife? Yes. Were there other things going on with Mr. Philhart, such as his heat pump that you were helping him with during that time? Yes. Did you go over to his house and look at his heat pump? Yes. Why'd you do that? Um, it was something he was concerned about and I was his friend and I just went to, I guess, lend a sympathetic eye. How many times did you go over to his house? Four or five times. All in connection with the heat pump or over the course of your friendship with him? Well, all in the course of my friendship with him, and that all was, all of those visits were while I was a judge, because I don't think I'd ever visited his home before I was a judge. All right. So exhibit 75, page 31. This is where Mr. Philhart expresses that he enjoyed being over to dinner, and you responded back, right? Yep. Um, what do you think about the status of his January 15th, 2019 email 
expressing that he could have made more money instead of loaning money? Uh, he never brought it up to me again. I had talked to him several times uh, after January 15th, both in person and email. I think I had 20 something emails from him after that. Uh, and, I, and he never brought it up. All right, so let's move to the no email at 1.14 in the morning on February 22nd, 2019. Um, or actually it looks like on at 2.14 in the morning. Um, do you see where Mr. Philhart sends you an email with the subject no exclamation mark? Yes. All right. Um, do you see where he's calling you Mr. Comer? Yes. Is, is in private correspondence between you and Mr. Philhart, is that what he did? Call you Mr. Comer or Mr. Coomer? No, in, in private he would not. He would call me by my first name. Did that seem odd to you? Yes. Do you see where he signed his name? Sincerely, James P. Philhart. Yes. Is that how we usually corresponded with you privately? No. Did that seem odd to you? Yes. Um, do you see where he mentions? He says, "Quote because of you talking and talking me into selling all my stocks at one time." I owe eleven thousand dollars more taxes than I would have if I hadn't sold them. End quote. Yes. And was that true? No. What would that make you think? Well, the the tenor of the whole email was very odd to me, and it just it didn't sound like Jim. It didn't sound like the Jim I'd known for some time. What about this statement? Please, if you must communicate with me, do it by computer only. Did that sound like Jim Philhart? No or any correspondence you'd ever received from Jim Philhart? No. And then he says, quote, I have printed everything on my computer having anything to do with you since I met you and have all correspondence with you since the beginning of the guardianship suit all ready to go, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And did that sound like Jim Philhart wrote his emails? No, I've never had any communication with him like this. All right, let's look at page 36, which is the next page. And your response. You see the statement, I didn't tell you to sell your stocks and I don't know anything about that. Yes. You see that? Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? I mean, I didn't tell him to sell his stocks and I didn't know he had sold his stocks. Do you also see where you state, we should resolve this matter together as soon as we can? To make that happen as easily as possible, just tell your lawyer to call me and we'll get this worked out so there are no misunderstandings and no loose ends, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And you've seen exhibit 363 from Mr. Gammon's, well, at least from Mr. Gammon's experts file. Did you see that actual email where you invited a lawyer to talk with you in Mr. Gammon's file from the expert, Mr. Lundberg? Yes. All right, let's talk about the next email, which is on page 41 of Exhibit 75. And this is March 5th, 2019. Do you see where Mr. Philhart says, quote, and it was a mistake to loan you the money in the first place. I was depressed and making a lot of mistakes. Had I been in my right mind, I would have said no to loaning you any money at all, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And was that something he had ever expressed to you before that in the almost a year that he'd been accepting and cashing payments on the March, 2018 loan, that he'd only made those loans because he was depressed and making mistakes. No, he had never said that. All right. And then what happened next? Was there a proceeding by through adult protective services? Yes. We heard earlier that one of Mr. Philhart's friends hearing him talk had referred the matter to adult protective services. Do you recall that? Yes. Did you cooperate with adult protective services? Did. Did you sit for an interview? Yes. Did you turn over documents they requested? Yes. Did those documents include emails where you expressed reservations about whether he was mentally okay to negotiate? Yes. Did you turn over not just your bills, but your internal time records without editing or gussying them up? Right. And I sat with them without counsel. Was it just raw data in the billing system that you produced, or did you actually manufacture, create, or do something to the bill? It was just the, the bill as it existed. Is that just raw data in your system? 
I'm, I'm not sure what raw data means, but it was just it was just a basically you you printed out what was already in there. Did you before you turned it over? Did you <coughs> do what you would normally do to make a bill? No. Were there other emails in which you expressed concern about Mr. Philhart's mental acuity beyond what we've seen? Because Mr. The way Mr. Lefko asked it, it sounded like you have a whole folder of these are when um, Mr. Philhart seems unsound or unstable. Um, and I think we've seen one. That your assessment to him that he needs to see someone or talk to someone, um, <clears throat> were there more than what we've seen during the course of this hearing? I can't remember everything that's been provided, but I, I think everything, I, I don't know if there's anything else, it's just what's been provided here. Okay, and I'm, I'm not trying to lock you into one or the other. We've seen a stream where Mr. Philhart says, I want my money back and you cheated me and I shouldn't have loaned you the money. And then you at some point say, we really shouldn't talk anymore until you get evaluated. And I see that you've been evaluated. Right, that was later. Of that effect. Yes, there were a few of those emails in which I said, have you talked to Dr. Moon or do you have anything from Dr. Moon? No, I, I had a few follow-up emails with that. Okay, that would be the universe that Mr. Lefko was referring to, of things you sent to um, Adult Protective Services where you had expressed a concern about Mr. Philhart's mental well -being. I think some of those emails came after I'd already talk to adult protective services. If you hadn't written them yet, they wouldn't be in Right. Yet, but it would be those types of things. There's not a whole yes. separate stream where you guys had a falling out over Mr. Cool and you were telling him, you're so obsessed with Mr. Cool, I think you need to go ahead and get evaluated. Right. No, there was there was nothing like that. Um, um, I, I can't remember exactly what I provided to adult protective services. I intended to provide them what I thought was responsive to their request uh, for information and but there was no email like that. We didn't have any falling out over anything other than what you've seen here. Okay. And were there some statements that Mr. Philhart made to you besides this statement that we saw in the email that he was depressed, making mistakes? Were there some statements he made to you orally that caused you concern for his mental health? Yes. And when were those statements? While I was a judge in, in those months after I went on the bench in my, in my, personal visits with him. What were those statements? Well, I, I know he said that he was depressed. I know that he said that, um, I, I can't remember exactly thing, everything he said. There's an email in here in which I kind of recite a couple of those things, but that's the general nature of what he was telling me in, the, in that time frame. But that was all after the notes had been, it was a long time after the notes had been entered. So that gets us to Mr. Gammon's involvement. And these emails we've seen with Mr. Philhart are February and March of 2019, right? And then the APS proceeding is in April or March and April, 2019, right? Right. And what was the ultimate resolution of the APS proceeding? Unsubstantiated claims. Of what? Of elder abuse and financial abuse of an elder. And did they report that to you? No. They didn't tell you the finding. You learned that in this case? Yes. Um, let me show you um, <laughs> exhibit 48, which is the letter from Mr. Gammon. I believe it's admitted under 48. Am I right? I don't have it checked. I, I know we've seen it, um, so it may be in under a different number, but if you'd like it to be under 48, you should tender it. We'll see if there's okay. an objection. I'll tender exhibit 48 at this time. No objection. Admitted. All right. November 4th. 2019. Um, this letter, oh, here we go. This letter comes from Wright Gannon, right? Yes, it's, uh, yeah, dated November 4th. I think it was emailed to me on November 5th or something like that, a couple, a day or two after this date. Well, for this letter, had you heard from Mr. Gannon? No. And what did you do when, well, start with this. What do you see the, the, the part of this letter? where it says Mr. Philhart was referred by some Cherokee circuit members of the bar. Yes. Did you know who those lawyers were? I did not. 
Did Mr. Gammon indicate that he had, as we saw in his expert file, consulted with uh, Cartersville lawyer Lester Tate? Yes. I mean, no, he did not at that time, no. Did you have longstanding political and personal issues with Mr. Tate? Yes. That predate the dispute with Mr. Philhart? Yes. And what were those issues? Mr. Tate had served as the... I'm going to project the relevance of this. I think we're going way far afield. If they're making some <coughs> argument that there's a conspiracy between the JGC and Lester Tate, nope. um, I think you can take judicial... That, <laughs> that is happened. not what we're saying. The, the likelihood of that happening. No, but do tell me, help, help us understand um, what any issues between Mr. Tate and Judge Coomer might have to bear on um, this letter in front of us. Okay, um, there are some very odd things that have to do with the right gammon situation, and we're gonna get into a few other things. Um, the JQC is alleging that there was some inordinate delay by Judge Coomer in resolving the issues with Mr. Philhart. Um, is it resolving the issues or is it in, he asked for his file and under the <coughs> rules, he ought to get his file back and he didn't. And I think your clients admitted to that, but we're still litigating it. The tenor and tone of the allegations in the amended formal charges make it seem like that there is some allegation that there was an inordinate delay in resolving the issues with Mr. Philhart that goes back to Judge Coomer. Well, um, you're entitled to read the tenor and tone into it as you see fit, but we have to deal with the specific cold allegation, violation of Code of Judicial Conduct 1.2a, and there's spin from one side, there's spin from the other, but it boils down to would Judge Coomer's alleged violation of Georgia Rule of Professional Conduct 1.8a in connection with the $80,000 loan constitute a violation of the judicial conduct rule 1.1. So I, I don't want us to get too far astray um, and weaving <coughs> tape into this feels like we're getting a little far astray unless um, there is a conversation or communication between Mr. Tate and your client, but I'm gonna get you. And one way I'm gonna do that is put right gammon up to this. Um, uh, I still don't know that that would affect it the hard fact of Mr. Philhart says, I want my file now, and he gets his file when he gets it. But it's it's not, that's not the only allegation. They say it's improper conduct, how we treated Wright Gammon. They say it's improper conduct, how Judge Coomer responded to Mr. Philhart by asking him to get some certification that he was mentally healthy enough to negotiate. All those things are not bar rules. Those are just things they the, the essence behind it is they're saying that there was an inordinate delay on purpose just to delay him. So, so let's, let's lock in. Which count are you talking about? I know that count seven relates to an allegation that Judge Coomer did not timely respond to Mr. Philhart's request for documents and repayment. Um, but that is an integrity of the judiciary. It's not a bar rule. Um, point us to the charge and um, we can look at it right now. And if it is um, redolent with innuendo that um, your client was purposefully going slow, then maybe we need to explore that innuendo. I think that's chart right seven. Here. But let me find it. Yeah, here we go. Count seven. A, B, and C. A is the one that you're talking about, supposedly refusing to provide records. Um, B is saying that Judge Coomer made rip misrepresentations to Mr. Philhart by email during the time after Mr. Philhart called his loans. Um, and then C is improperly demanding that he provide documentation about Philhart's mental status. And then emailing, supposedly emailing Mr. Gammon and this second phone call Mr. Gammon says occurred, okay. which we say I did not occur. Boy, they seem pretty factual and not um, full of intimations. He emailed or he didn't. He demanded Mr. Philhart do this or he didn't. And then the debate is, was it improper for him to demand it if in fact he demanded it? So let's for now stay away from Mr. Tate. Um, if you get us closer to it through other examination, that's fine. But this is pretty dry language right here. I appreciate that improperly is a subjective and, and um, that is a 
perspective that the director is advancing, but that's what we're here to argue about. Was it improper or not? Not did it happen? If in fact, Judge Coomer did not demand that Mr. Philhart provide documentation, well, then there's nothing improper about it because it didn't happen. That's not a tape issue either. That's a let's look at the emails. But we've seen the emails. And in fact, Judge Coomer did request Mr. Philhart to provide documentation about his mental status. And that may have been perfectly proper about which Mr. Tate has nothing to do. All right. Thank you, Judge. Um, let's talk about this second phone call Wright Gammon claims to have had with you. So let's start with the first phone call, the one phone call. Right. Okay. Um, did you call Mr. Gammon after receiving his letter? Yes. And how soon after receiving his letter did you call him? I called him on the morning of November 7th. Okay. And what did he say and what did you say? Um, I said to him, I am very happy to hear from you. I'm, I'm glad to finally have somebody that I can deal with in resolving this issue with Mr. Phil Hart. And I'd like to know what your client wants to do to resolve it. Let's talk about how to get this finished and get this wrapped up and done. And he responded to me by saying that um, there were problems with the notes. And in particular, there was a problem with the security on the note and that I had listed Mr. Philhart's address as the, the address to secure the loan. And I hadn't looked at the loans a lot, but I, I knew that they were not secured loans. They were never intended to be secured loans. So I said, well, I'm not sure you're looking at the same thing I'm looking at. Can you send me what you're looking at? He said, sure, I'll send it to you. That was kind of the end of that conversation. Um, on what, from what phone did you make that phone call? My cell phone. How do you know that? Uh, because I made the phone call from my cell phone. I remember it. Have you looked at your phone records to determine whether that phone call occurred and what time it occurred? Yes. Um, I, this time I would tender exhibit 371. Admitted. Thank you, Judge. Um, what is exhibit 371? And once it comes on the screen. This is a copy of my cell phone, personal cell phone record from AT&T. And is this the phone from which you called Mr. Philhart? I mean, sorry, Mr. Gammon. Yes. And if we look on, it's like it is the sixth page of this document. Do you see the phone call in question? Yes. Is this the one phone call that you made to write Gammon? Yes, it was November 7th at 1434 um, UTC, which is used to be called Greenwich, Greenwich Mean Time, which I think is five hours ahead of us. So five hours ahead, meaning what time did this call occur? It was 9.34 in the morning. And then did you email Mr. Gammon after this phone call? Yeah, uh, well, he emailed me or his office emailed me a copy of the, uh, the loan document. And then about 20 minutes after I got his email, I responded with my own email. We're looking at a Bates labeled page number 78 of exhibit 75. Is that the email string you're talking about with Wright Gammon's office? November 7, 2019. Yes. What time, what time is that email at? 11.49 a.m. And were there any other phone calls to Mr. Gammon's telephone numbers that you have in your records, in your cell phone, in what you know of his phone numbers, in your cell phone records, other than that one call before this email? No, that's it. Did you call Mr. Gammon as he testified on the stand from a court of appeals phone? No. Did you call Mr. Gammon at all after sending him this email? No, I've only ever had one phone call with him. At this time, I would like to tender exhibits 372 and 373. You all, have, I, I don't have a list in front of me right now. We may have at some point, but you, whatever he's referring to, Mr. Lefko is referring to, you, you know what he's coming Yes, I've seen it. It's uh, phone records from the Court of Appeals showing that uh, the phone call was not from the Court of Appeals phone. Okay. All right. So, oh, sorry. 372 and 373 are admitted. 
Thank you, Judge. Um, all right, Exhibit 372, is that a subpoena response from the Court of Appeals concerning phone records from the period between November 2019, when this correspondence was going on with Mr. Gammon and March 2020, when the lawsuit was filed against you by Mr. Gammon for Mr. Philhart. Yes. Right. And they refer us to One Ring Networks. Is that right? Correct. Exhibit 373. What is that? That's a certification from One Ring's uh, custodian of records certifying that there are no records of telephone calls between any court of appeals number and the numbers for Wright Gammon. Did you hear Mr. Gammon say that because you hung up on him in that supposed second phone call, he knew he had to file a lawsuit against you? Yes. Did that second phone call ever occur? No. Is Mr. Gammon wrong yes. about whether you had a second phone call with him? Yes, he's wrong. Let's look at the language of your email from, from Exhibit 75. Do you see where in the last paragraph of that email, you say to Mr. Gammon, quote, have you identified any other errors that might create questions as to the validity of the notes? If so, let's address those up front and then proceed to work on a universal resolution, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And were you intending to try to work on a universal resolution to all issues between you and Jim Philhart with Mr. Gammon? Yes. As I said, I was relieved to hear from him. After you sent that email to Mr. Gammon, reach out back to you and try to work out a universal resolution before he filed a lawsuit against you for fraud. No. Judge, Judge Coomer, as I read this email, why would you consent to having the document be amended by striking Mr. Philhart's address and inserting your address if there isn't a security on this note? Couldn't you just have said, hey, Mr. Gavin, this is actually not a secured note, so we should probably just strike all that language out of here and not just flip-flop your address for Mr. Philhart's address if there's no security on the net to begin with. Sure, we could have said that. I, I told him that in the phone call, these were not secured notes. When I got this, I said, well, you know, I don't know what, I mean, my, my initial thought was, what do we do about it? It's got the wrong, it's got his address in there in a place that if there was a security, it'd be my address. I just thought we were trying to reach resolution. I didn't, I didn't think this had any effect on the validity of the loan. I didn't think it would make any legal difference in whether I was, or whether I was gonna pay the loan, whether my company was obligated to pay the loan. And so to me, the first par paragraph was, okay, if you got a problem with this, let's just fix that problem. Tell me if there are any other problems and then let's resolve it. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, I had no intention of raising defenses to the loans. It wasn't about uh, exploiting problems with the, with the note. It was, let's resolve the dispute. So I didn't care. He, he could have written Mickey Mouse in there. I didn't care what it said. Let's just resolve the note. Thank you. Um, were you aware that there was an Atlanta Journal-Constitution article in March 2020 with the title state appeals court judge accused of fraud malpractice as a result of the lawsuit that Mr. Gammon filed against you for Mr. Philhart. Yes. And do you deny the allegations of fraud and malpractice by Mr. Philhart? I deny completely and entirely the allegations of fraud, deceit, dishonesty, everything like that. What about malpractice? That was the other word he used. Uh, well, if I violated a bar rule, then I would assume that would constitute malpractice. I've admitted that I violated a bar rule, so I, didn't, I never denied that I committed malpractice. Um, after the allegations of fraud by Mr. Philhart and Mr. Gammon were publicized, were you contacted by the Judicial Qualifications Commission? Yes. Did you meet with Investigator Alford at Joe Kingla's in my office at the time for several hours in June 2020? Yes. Did you answer his questions truthfully? Yes. Did he appear to be taking notes? Yes, he was taking notes. Were his questions all about Mr. Philhart at that time or other things we hear about, such as campaign finance and a mortgage application? Only about Jim Philhart. In the conversation with Mr. Alford, did you deny that you committed fraud on Mr. Philhart? Yes, I did. I denied it then, and I continue to deny that I ever defrauded Jim Philhart. 
have you looked at the small portions of the excerpts of chronology of events from Mr. Alford that were produced in this case? Yes. Do they can't contain any of your version of events that you relayed to Mr. Alford? No. Do you recall on September 4th, 2020, the director of the JQC, Mr. Boring, emailed your lawyer to inform him that they had obtained several sets of your financial records? Yes. Was that a surprise to you? Yes. Did you know that the JQC was talking with the GBI about getting your bank records? I did not. Um, were you aware that the director himself was issuing subpoenas for your bank records? Nope. Were you copied on those subpoenas? I was not copied or served with those subpoenas. Did the bank records the director obtained include your IOLTA account and your law firm account where there was sensitive client information relating to your law firm? Yes. Are you aware of any court protections approving that search or making orders for safeguarding of that information? No. When you found out that they had obtained your bank records, did you ask for what they had obtained? Yes. And was that through your counsel or yourself? Yes, through counsel, through Mr. Kathy. This time I'd like to show or um, I'd like to offer and tender exhibit 374. Is that my email? Yep. I'm gonna to object to the relevance of this as far as this hearing as to whether we turned over records before his appearance at the investigative panel meeting. I think we're going way far afield into more of the legal arguments on things we've already covered with motions to quash bank subpoenas and that type of thing. Right, aren't we sort of getting at the equivalent of was the arrest warrant valid and we have since had an indictment and so we have someone in front of us based on a superseding legal event that makes moot preceding issues that might have arisen. Um, judge, it's just our desire to make a record as to what occurred. Okay, I think that record has been made um, through your pleadings and other files that are in. I don't find that it's relevant to what we need to work through which isn't about record creation so much as it is issue resolution but i think we're aware of your concern well there is a due process concern and we'd like to have this email in the record um in some way shape or form whether it's in this proceeding i mean or just it filed way because it's not it, it, i mean you've raised the due process concerns that this email might implicate and we've addressed those so um, if you want to make them part of the ultimate record that gets transmitted up um, that's fine, but not through these proceedings. Is is my request to admit Exhibit 374 denied, Your Honor? It is not relevant to these proceedings, so yes, it's denied. <clears throat> Did you know that the director had taken your bank records and sent those to the Campaign Finance Commission when you met with the investigative panel? No. Judge, I'm there. You say that he had sent them to the Ethics Commission, but I don't think that's what. That's what I heard, but you'll yeah, be able I, to I follow don't think up. that's consistent with what the evidence has been GBI. Okay, but I don't, I don't know that you get to object to poorly phrased or factually incorrect question. The question was what it was, and or how Judge Coomer would know the answer to it, but he's provided an answer. Did you know that the director? That was my memory of the testimony. Did you know that the director had instigated an investigation of your campaign accounts with the Campaign Finance Commission? I did not. Now, um, there are some allegations in this case concerning a judicial nominating committee. Hopefully, I've said that right. Um, what that acronym is? JNC application you made for judgeship. Remember that? Um, so let's look at Exhibit One Hundred Seven if we can confirm that is in the record. It is well, so I have it as a, and this, this is from Ms. Crest. There's a check mark, but then it says no. So no maybe, objection. oh, there was no <laughs> objection. <laughs> okay, I guess it's in. Okay, thank you. Not, no, it's not in. No, it is in. Yeah. Okay. All right, fair. Um, so let's look at, do you understand there's an allegation in this case by the director that you had inaccurate information in your JNC application. Yes. Is is that true? Did you have inaccurate information? No. Did you intend to put any inaccurate information in there? No. So let's look at what the director claims was inaccurate here. And specifically, should have bookmarked it.
which which count is this? I'm I'm looking through because right? I'm not remembering that being maybe it's a sub point to a count. Um, but if this isn't a count, I don't know why we're working through this. He raised it earlier in cross examination about the word liquidated and okay. the fact that there My was question is, um, is there a, a count, a formal charge against Judge Coomer that alleges he violated some aspect of the code of judicial conduct because he failed to disclose something to the JNC? And if the answer is yes, what number is that? It's a subset of count 23. I think it's under B talking about uh, CAC holdings and liquidation. Okay, it says judicial. Okay. I just couldn't find the phrase judicial application. So keep going, Mr. Lefko. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's look at what the question was and let's look at what your answer was. All right. Um, number 19, the question was, quote, are you presently acting in a fiduciary capacity if so state details, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And do you see your answer where it says, quote, I have ownerships, ownership interests in my law firm and a real estate holding company, which has been liquidated and I serve on the board of directors for a retirement fund. I'm not serving as a guardian, conservator, receiver, administrator, or in any other judicially appointed fiduciary capacity, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Were you intended to be honest? Yes. And the word liquidated that follows the real estate holding company, what did you mean by that? I mean, I, I meant I had converted the asset to cash. I sold the real estate and had cash, not, not realty. Was there cash in the CAC holdings account yes. at some point? Yes. At different points, maybe even before this application or at the time of this application? Yes. Did you mean to say there's no cash in any account for this company? No. Um, what was your understanding when you submitted it of the word liquidated? That it meant I had converted a fixed asset to cash. Is that what you meant when you put that here? Yes. Did you mean to suggest that there had been a receivership for your company that liquidated your company? No. Did you mean to suggest that your company had deregistered from the Secretary of State? No. Do you even know how to liquidate a company? No. Have you ever liquidated? I mean, other than what I'm talking about, liquidating fixed assets to cash. I don't know anything else. Have you ever liquidated a company? Other than this conversion of fixed assets to cash? No, I have not. Did you mean to suggest that the company had become insolvent, failing to pay its debts as they came due? No. And had to be wound up? No. <clears throat> okay, let's shift over to campaign finance. Right. Um, Before we do that. Yes, Your Honor. Great thing to do, um, but I've been asked that we take a quick break. Yep. Um, so uh, if we could um, be back, it'll be a short one. In fact, I may stay right here. Um, Let's be back at uh, 2.35. I don't know what other people's watches say. 2.35, please. Yes, sir.
we ask the court's indulgence and permission or the panel's indulgence and permission to do so. Okay. Um, and Mr. Tate and, and Mr. Coomer, when he was a representative, Mr. Coomer, um, there was an article published um, which detailed some complaints about how the JQC was being run when Lester Tate was in charge of the JQC. Judge Coomer was part of the legislative process to revise the constitution or to draft the constitutional amendment to change the constitution of the JQC um, and to reconstitute the JQC. Um, I, I mean, Judge Coomer can comment further on the issues between them, but there was a publicized article where some of the complaints um, that had to do with how Mr. Tate was running the agency came from the mouth of Judge Coomer. Um, and the point is that um, Wright Gammon has gotten on the stand and said, I just had to file suit because of a second phone call, which didn't happen. He references members of the Cherokee Bar, which have referred him the case. Um, and then he's got political Easter eggs in his file, um, which had to ask my kid what that really means, um, which is, you know, there's bonus content that you see on DVDs. Disney's famous for doing it, where he's got this just little, little nugget in there about um, politics and how they thought that Judge Coomer had a golden parachute from the governor. That's not something you ever see in an expert's file. There's no political animosity that I've ever seen in, it, in a file about somebody that they're proposing to sue. And then you've got an inordinate nine month delay between when Wright Gammon gets involved and him sending a letter and then saying he had to file suit over something that didn't happen. Um, so that's our offer of proof as to why that's relevant. Um, but why is that relevant? Uh, you've just described a series of events that may or may not have occurred that may involve some personal animosity and hurt feelings and professional mistrust. We, the three of us, are here to decide whether the director has met his burden of proof by demonstrating by clear and convincing evidence that one or more of these counts actually occurred. Your clients admitted to some. Some are contested, and we need to decide what do we do with those results, given that he's admitted to some, there's going to be some result other than nothing happened. What does the feud, and that's probably overstating it, between Mr. Tate and Judge Coomer have to do with what we're trying to find? Point me to a count where you think it is relevant that Lester Tate may have some bad taste in his mouth because of what Judge Coomer allegedly said in a newspaper article that's not before us because it would be hearsay. And Mr. And Mr. King really wants to talk. May he but talk? I'm happy to hear from either one of you. I needed links to, to a count. And I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I just point out, I believe the amended charges assert that Lester Tate was the one who We don't have in front Mr. of us Gammon. anything from Lester Tate. I don't know if he thought it happened or not, but Lester Tate didn't testify. And um, I've been told um, that he hasn't been subpoenaed to testify. So I don't think we're going to hear from Lester Tate. And, and I, obviously, I agree with you, Your Honor, on that point. But I would say it goes to show the motivation of the witness who was on the stand who testified that this phone call took place. We know that Lester Tate provided or suggested an expert to know about lawyers who fought the right gammon. I don't know exactly who those lawyers are, but I think it goes to show the credibility of the witness, something that was pled in the end of charge. That would be my argument. Um, where is the hung? So I also want to make sure we are focused on um, the charges and not all of the prefatory um, allegations, because those don't need to be proven. Um, that's not what we're working through here. And so seeking to disprove, um, for example, paragraph 38 from the amended charges, the September 2018 will was practically identical to the May 2018 will. Was it? Wasn't it? Don't know. You don't need to defend against that. We have those two documents, but it's not an allegation against Judge Coomer that the wills were too similar. It's an assertion in paragraphs that provide an unproven alleged setting to the formal charges. We're working through the evidence that was presented here and not the um, prefatory paragraphs in the formal charges. So if you all can point us 
to a charge, count one through 36, where it says one of the dastardly things Judge Coomer did was to hang up on right gammon in that second phone call, then maybe we need to explore yep. this, although it is still pretty darn attenuated because the theory would be right gammon lied on the stand about hanging up on a phone call about being hung up on because of a beef between Lester Tate and Judge Coomer. Unless I'm missing something. The, the the witness actually besides the formal charges that witness right gammon on the stand said he was just it had to kick around because he was hesitant to send a letter to a sitting judge that's testimony that they brought out and so this rebuts that and it's not because he was hesitant it's because there were polit there was political animus between mr gammon and or his friends and or the people he's consulting for this case and judge coomer and that's why there was this delay in bringing it to a resolution. Is there um, political animus between you and Wright Gammon? Between me and Lester Tate. You and Wright Gammon. I didn't know Wright Gammon personally. Okay. So I think. So I would simply say that you could probably get the proper in a you know, minute. And if, if it's meaningless and irrelevant, well, you've already made the proffer, and I'm going to maintain my ruling that it is at least one step, if not two steps removed. Right, Gammon has testified. Your client just testified under oath. No issue between Judge Coomer and Wright Gammon. Never met Wright Gammon prior to this situation. Now, was there a puppet master in the background? That's your theory, and that's Lester Tate. You're welcome to call Lester Tate to testify, but getting it in through Judge Coomer, I think, is indirect and um, doesn't get you past the relevance hurdle that um, Mr. Boring raised. So I appreciate you bringing it back up and you've now fully informed us, even though it's a lawyer proper rather than through witness testimony, your theory as to why Wright Gammon really wasn't a free actor in this case, but was being controlled by political forces inimicable to your client. I don't think I was exactly arguing that um but there are some odd things here okay. i'll um, let you know how it landed what it what it means <laughs> is another story um let's talk about the thing that we were going to talk about right before we went to lunch and which is campaign finance and were, were you a representative in the house of representatives yes did you become chairman of the transportation committee yes i did when did you become chairman of the transportation committee uh 2015 i think did that involve more responsibility in the legislature? Yes. Did that involve more kind of funds going in and out of your campaign? Oh, yes, definitely. And were there more things to keep up with on a legislative, from a legislative standpoint because of that? Yes. What about your time as majority whip? Um, actually, on the chairman of the Transportation Committee, how long did you serve? What years? Uh, it was two years, 15 to, 15 to 16, I think. Remind us when you were first elected to your legislature seat. I started serving in 2011. I became a floor leader for governor, for the governor in 2012, I believe. All right. So the, the campaign finance issues we saw in the campaign finance commission um, complaint, those began in 2015, is that right? Yes. At that time or around that time, you became chairman of the transportation committee, right? Yes. Um, and then... When were you elected as majority whip in the House of Representatives? 2000, I served 2017 and 18. And did you gain more responsibility by being majority whip? Yes. And did campaign finance become more of a task to keep up with when you were majority whip? Yes. Why? Because I had broader responsibilities, many more expenses, a lot more money coming in and contributions. Did you have campaign finance staff to help you keep up with it as some candidates and legislators do? No, I didn't. Did you do your best to comply with all the campaign rules and regulations? Yes. Were some of those rules and laws for campaign finance a little unclear to you? Yes. What did you try to do to try to understand what you needed to do to comply with the rules and the laws? Well, I looked at what other members were doing um, ask other members how they were handling issues and try to be familiar with the statute. Did you enter into a consent order with the Campaign Finance Commission to resolve all the campaign finance issues from your legislative campaign? Yes. Were there issues with your uh, Court of Appeals campaign that were resolved in that consent order? Yes. 
what were they? Um, I think there was a there was a a failure to report uh, an expense that was resolved. It was an oversight. Was that an intentional violation? No. Um, was it a law firm transfer? No. Was that a transfer that was a permissible, ordinary, and necessary expense of the campaign? Yes. But you just didn't report it because what? It was oversight. Um, was the majority whip before you were. Matt Ramsey. How long had he been majority whip? Two, I think two, two years or four years. I think two years. Did you ask him about how to manage the increased complexity of campaign finance in that role? No. Why not? And you didn't ask your predecessor, how do you deal with all this? You did it for two or four years. Um, maybe you guys weren't on speaking to, I don't, I don't know the history of how you got right. that. Maybe that's the last person on the planet. Everything. Unless you're Kate, that you should have had. <laughs> Everything's political, right? <laughs> Uh, so, no, he was no longer in the General Assembly. It was the, the primary reason I didn't sit down and talk with him about it. And uh, in terms of the internal politics, um, he's probably not a person that I would have felt comfortable asking that advice. We weren't enemies. We just weren't close. Right. Um, let's look at Exhibit 218, which is the consent order in the Campaign Finance Commission case. And I know that that has been admitted. Um, why did you agree to this consent order? Well, because I needed to uh, focus on this case. I needed to, um, frankly, stop the financial bleeding on that case. It was a case that um, I knew that I could um, continue fighting for years into the future, uh, as some cases have gone for years and years. But I knew at the end of the day, I was going to spend as much money litigating the case as it would cost me to just resolve the case. Um, it was important to me that there were no allegations of uh, willful misconduct or wrongful, you know, intentional wrongdoing. Uh, and when we were able to reach that resolution, um, I was gonna be, I was satisfied with, with just getting it closed out. Did you ever do anything in campaign finance intentionally wrong? No. Um, were all of the findings in the consent order true? No. And why would you agree to them in findings of fact? Then? Well, I didn't agree to them. I just agreed not to object to them uh, for the limited purpose of that uh, proceeding. And, uh, and the reason, again, is um, to me, what was most important was getting the thing resolved, showing that I hadn't committed any intentional violations of the law, and um, and then shifting my focus to this case primarily. Did you also donate seven thousand dollars to charitable causes? Yes, to the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers <laughs> Foundation. You understand that you could take a tax deduction for donating to charitable causes. Yes, but I didn't do that for those uh, for those donations because they were intended to cover any shortfalls that had arisen in my campaign finance. Did you hear Mr. Lane's testimony that after you became a judge, your disclosures got squeaky clean? Yes, he said that. Um, was there less campaign finance stuff to keep up with once you were a judge than there were when you were majority leader in the House? Yes, substantially. Majority less. whip, sorry. Yes. Um, did you have substantially less expenditures to account for as a judge than you did as a representative? Yes. Why is that? Well, I, I didn't have the same... Uh, responsibilities for the, the whole caucus like I did in the House. I didn't have um, the same kinds of obligations that I did in the House to go and be present at events and discussions and political uh, meetings all around the state. So I, I, there were not as many demands on those resources once I became a judge raising money for judicial campaign. In the Campaign Finance Commission proceeding over your legislative campaign, did you hear any of the types of things you heard from Mr. Boring asking you about $9.64 at Bojangles? No. And was that an issue in your campaign finance case? No. Did the Campaign Finance Commission allege any improper purchases of meals, coffee, chips, and salsa, et cetera? No. 
Did they ever suggest that you did anything improper with meal expenses? No. Did you do anything improper with meal expenses? No. It, um, to the extent I, I used my Amex card to pay for a personal meal, I uh, reimbursed the campaign for that. So I followed that. You'd pay your Amex bill off with campaign funds, but then you were extra careful to say this was an El Nepal dinner just for my family. It wasn't political. So I now need to push 38 bucks into the campaign account because that dinner paid for on my Amex, which has been paid by campaign funds, I need to reimburse. Well, I, I, yes, except I didn't typically use the Amex card for personal expenses for meals. I, I had a handful of those. Um, all of them were in 2018. Uh, um, and so there, that was not a, that was not a typical use of that card, but it, it happened at the end of 2018. Was there a provision in the consent order for a civil penalty? Yes. Did you pay that civil penalty as you agreed? Yes. Did you use any campaign funds to pay that civil penalty? Yes. Campaign funds? Yes. Okay. From which campaign? From, from the, the campaign funds that were available then at the, the Campaign Finance Commission direct or consent order said for me to use campaign funds. Yes, sir. Um, or it authorized me to use campaign funds. The donation that you made was to what for charity? Atlanta Volunteer, Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. That money and, was paid out of personal uh, funds, not campaign funds. Yes, sir. Um, you, you received a complaint from Campaign Finance in October 2020, right? Yes. And when did you make the $5,000 donation to Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation? I, I think that was October 2020. You received a first amended complaint from the Campaign Finance Commission in November 2020. Do you remember that? Yes. And the first complaint just had made it look like you had just taken money for your law firm. Do you remember that? Yes. It just dis, it just listed things that went out of your campaign into your law firm, right? Yes, many of which were inaccurate. And did not list the fact that you had returned the money to the campaign, right? Correct. Um, but when, by the time you got the first amended complaint, your lawyer responded to that. They then put in the transfers back to the campaign, right? Some of them. Um, there were some allegations of transfers to Kay Smith. You remember that? Yes. And why did you make transfers from your campaign to Kay Smith? The campaign paid Kay Smith for uh, campaign and legislative related activities. And did you think that you were violating campaign finance laws by paying Kay Smith with campaign funds? No. Did you intend to violate campaign finance laws by paying Kay Smith with campaign funds from your legislative campaign? No. Have you ever paid Kay Smith with campaign funds from your judicial campaign? No. Kay Smith is the woman who testified during our week that she didn't keep track of how she spent her time. I just want to make sure that's the same person. Kay Smith testified here. Okay. When Kay Smith was paid, who was she paid by, whether she did law firm work or legislative or campaign work? Well, she was on the payroll at the law firm. So she would get law firm payroll. And but, but there was a check. At, there was a check that we talked about that was a check from the campaign directly to Kay Smith for additional campaign work. Was this issue about a $50,000 extension of credit to your judicial campaign, was that raised in the campaign finance proceedings? Yes. And what happened to that? It was allegation? dismissed. Withdrawn, right? Withdrawn, yes. Um, and not, was it part of the consent order? It, no, it was withdrawn. So on the law firm transfers, did you hear Mr. Lane say there were 43 transfers into your law firm from your campaign? I heard him say that. Is that true? No. Did the campaign, did the campaign finance commission in one of the complaints Mr. Lane filed even allege 43 transfers between your law firm and campaign? No. 
What, what's the actual number of transfers during this three-year period that took place between from your campaign to your law firm and from your law firm back to your campaign? Um, there were six, there, there were eight in total that we, we've talked about here and that were included in the formal charges. That means 16 because it was eight in both directions? No, I, I misspoke. There were, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you were asking me. Well, the question you were asked wasn't real clear because if you'd be giving a number, was that the number that went from campaign to law firm or law firm back or just the total number of everything in each direction? So I was asking you, you gave us the number eight. That's the total number of transactions in either direction between your campaign fund and your law firm account. No, sir. There were eight transfers from the law firm, from the campaign to the law firm. In the, in the period from April 2015 to March 2017. Those, those are eight transfers from campaign to law firm. There were also transfers from law firm to campaign that corresponded with almost all of those transfers out. So 16? I think it would have been 15. So now, it may not, actually it, it wouldn't, I think it would be 14 because there were, there was one transfer that had transfer back that was for two, cover two transfers out. And then there was another transfer out that didn't have a corresponding transfer back. And so it's. At the end of the day, what was the balance sheet? By the time campaign <coughs> finance got to it, how much more had the campaign sent to the law firm than the law firm had sent back to the campaign? Or was there any more? There was a $450 discrepancy between what had been paid to the law firm and what the law firm had reversed back. Was that on purpose? No. Did Mr. Lane, when he testified on the stand, testify as to and support allegations that even the Campaign Finance Commission under his signature had dismissed? Yes. Did Mr. Lane, when he signed the consent order, give any indication that he would come testify against you um, for allegations the Campaign Finance Commission had withdrawn for lack of evidence? No, not at all. I thought I was done with campaign finance at that point. Where the 43 transactions come up, it's in the amended uh, complaint by the Campaign Finance Commission. And how many, dis and these were disclosure violations, right? Uh, well, the 43, I'm not sure what the 43 refers to. Um, how many transactions did the Campaign Finance Commission find were failures to report in the consent order? Do you recall that being 21? Yes. And that's on page two of the consent order, right? Yes. And can we pull that up for a second, Judge? So these, these are the reporting errors that you made, right? Right. And do you see that 36 of those 43 that the um, commission initially alleged for disclosure errors um, related to your reports as a legislator? Right, yes. And that leaves seven or eight, I'm not sure I did the math right, that relate to your activities as a Court of Appeals judge, right? And we have a demonstrative exhibit, which we'd like to put up. Um, the comparison of challenge expenditures versus total campaign. And I think that may have been, did you admit that, Chuck? I have no, no. Idea. I don't know. Um, it is a demonstrative exhibit that I sent you prior to trial. Challenge <laughs> expenditures versus total campaign. Something you can share with um, the director's team real briefly. Maybe there's no issue for the campaign. You may put it up. Doesn't have an exhibit number. Or you can just put it up on the screen. So in terms of so no objection to this demonstrative aid? No, Judge, I think it actually is in hard copies in the evidence. I think it was admitted. Okay. Yeah. I think that I think the director labeled it as an exhibit, but I'm not sure what number. All right. Um, what is this? comparison document that you've got in front of you. Compares uh, challenged expenditures to total campaign transactions. Is that 
expenditures challenged by the Campaign Finance Commission versus the total campaign transactions for you as a, as a legislator? I want to show that on the screen. Yeah. Did you want to show the compare? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I do. Um, okay, so well, page this, two lists the total number of transactions or, or the total amount of transactions challenged by the Campaign Finance Commission. Is that right? Yes. And that total is what number? $13,134.53. And then the third page lists the what? Total amount raised and spent between 2010 and 2018, right? 2000, 2008 to 2021. So all of my campaigns all together. Okay. And that total is what? $1,264,799.95. Did you hear Mr. Lane's testimony that, well, they were only looking starting in 2015? Did. did they ever tell you that in the Campaign Finance Commission proceeding? No, they didn't. So the percentage of total contributions and expenditures that were challenged by Campaign Finance Commission for you was what percentage? About 1%. Right, let's talk about there are what appear to be six or seven transactions that <laughs> occurred during times um, in 2018 um, that are th basically 37 through 43 in terms of chronological order of these 43 reporting issues you had identified by Campaign Finance Commission in one of the complaints. And so I want to just deal with them one by one. Um, June 28th, 2018. There was an allegation that you had failed to disclose a transfer of $30 and 60 cents um, from your campaign account to American Express. Was that allegation included in the, in the consent order? No. Um, was this expense in fact disclosed in your disclosures? Yes. How was it disclosed? It was part of the uh, non-itemized disclosures for expenses of less than $100. Did you understand that was an appropriate way to report it? Yes, it may have may it may have been a problem because it was part of a larger series of expenditures, but that's it was withdrawn. Um, there's an allegation of a uh, payment of five hundred and thirty one dollars and ninety seven cents on October twenty ninth, two thousand and eighteen from your campaign account to Kay Smith. What was that for? That was to pay for work she had done at the law firm for campaign and legislative activities. In retrospect, would it have been better to ask her to itemize what time she was spending for the campaign? Yes. And did you use her for legislative and campaign functions, including having her come to the Capitol? Yes. And what was her hourly rate? I think it was $16 an hour. And we heard from her that she was doing more campaign or legislative work when the legislature was in session, do you recall that? Yes. And how long is the legislature in session? Three to five months a year. And when did Ms. Smith start working for you? 2016. And is that the case that she did more legislative than law firm work um, during those sessions for 2016, 2017, and 2018? Yes. What? Just to be fair here, to my, when, to my, when no. did she come work for you in 2016? I, that's what I was trying to, I was trying to remember when she came to work. Uh, I know she worked part time for a while before she came on. And I think she's, I think she started working during the legislative session, but I don't remember that exactly. And is the fact that the expenses and the time of Ms. Smith not itemized, um, is that why you agreed in the consent order that these payments to her were not ordinary and necessary expenses of the campaign? Yes, because we didn't have the records for it. Did you purposely not disclose payments to Kay Smith from your campaign? No. Was that oversight? Yes. Do you take responsibility for yes, that? Yes, I take responsibility for all the errors in the campaign finance case. Kay Smith, um, there's another disclosure or disclosure issue regarding a thousand $88.69 on November 1, 2018, from your campaign account to Kay Smith. Do you recall that? Yes. And was that on purpose failure to disclose or inadvertent? 
it was an inadvertent failure to disclose. Um, did you intend to violate campaign finance laws with respect to that transaction? No. Number 40 out of 43 is an allegation that you failed to disclose a transfer of $228.53 on January 22nd, 2019 from your campaign account to American Express. Do you recall that? Yes. And why was that not reported? Uh, it, it, it wasn't reported because I didn't know about it when it happened. It was on a card that I thought had been discontinued and... So when I realized the transaction had occurred, I reversed it. I paid the money back and um, campaign finance accepted that explanation and withdrew the charge. Who used the card that you believed wasn't working? It was an auto payment for a, a, a service that had a once a year fee. An annual renewal. Right. And you thought that was shut down. So it would have bounced back to that vendor. Correct. It didn't, it went through. Correct. All right. Um, number 41 out of 43, dealing with this chronologically here. April 25th, 2019, there was an allegation by campaign finance that you failed to disclose on your disclosure report a transfer of $144.45 from your campaign account to ATP Printing and Graphics. What was that? Why did that happen? Well, I think I think that's one of the trans one of the transactions that did happen, and I did report it correctly, and they just alleged it incorrectly. So, and the campaign finance commission just got that wrong. Yes. Was that allegation withdrawn? Yes. Number forty-two, um, again chronologically in terms of the allegations of the campaign finance commission. May 1st, 2019, there was an allegation that you failed to disclose a transfer of $65 from a campaign account to Cass Mini Storage. What happened there? That was a that was a legitimate expenditure of campaign funds, but it was less than $100, so it would have been included in the unitemized disclosures. Was it a campaign related expense? Yes. And did the Campaign Finance Commission withdraw this allegation? Yes. Number 43 um, on the list of 43 transactions of failures to report alleged by the Campaign Finance Commission. And again, this would be the last in chronological order, alleged a failure to disclose a transfer of $390 on July 12th, 2019 from your campaign account to Cass Mini Storage. What was that about? That was for storage of campaign uh, related materials and it was a legitimate expenditure but I had inadvertently failed to report it, and they would they uh, withdrew that as well. Was it a campaign related expense? Yes. All right. So <clears throat> let's put the the trips to Israel and Hawaii in some context on the campaign finance stuff. And were you doing a lot of traveling as a legislator? Yes. Did you? charge your campaign for a bunch of what Mr. Lane called ski LEs, where you just went off to a bunch of destinations? No. Um, over the years that you were in the legislature, how many um, out of the country trips did you take? I, I took three trips that were outside the continental US. Okay, and I have in my notes, Oconus, is that what they call in the legislature? Yes. yes. Um, did you intend to violate campaign finance laws with respect to the partial payments by the campaign for your Hawaii or Israel trips? No. Did you work in good faith with the campaign finance commission to correct any mistakes and account for them? Yes. Do you take responsibilities or take responsibility for your mistakes in accounting with respect to those trips? Yes, I, I take responsibility. It was, it was a poor accounting practices throughout. Did the donations that you made to charity account for with the Campaign Finance Commission any errors you made with respect to Hawaii and Israel? The, those, uh, those donations should exceed any, any of the questionable uh, expenditures or, or unpaid expenditures. All right. Let's look at Exhibit 355, which I would now tender. That's the spreadsheet. Revised one. No objection. No objection to three five five. Admitted. 
All right, what is exhibit 355? Uh, this is a spreadsheet showing the um, total expenditures for the Hawaii trip. And so in one column, you've got the total Amex charges for Hawaii travel, right? Yes. And that does that include like meals and things of that sort? Everything. That Airfare would, as well? Everything that was on the American Express card for that trip. And then you've got another column where you paid with non-campaign funds. Is that right? Yes, correct. And is that a true and accurate reflection of how much you paid with non-campaign funds before campaign finance ever sent you a complaint? Yes. And is that reflective of your efforts to try to balance out personal expenses versus campaign? Yes. Um, and then there's a column that says um, total Hawaii trip cost, and that's going to be balanced out at the end, right? Yes. And the total Hawaii trip cost was what? $9,500? $81.05? Yes. And what was the total in terms of the payments made by you before Campaign Finance Commission said anything to you? Um, it was about 3000 Well, it was the $4,669.37 plus $1,031.80 uh, and plus $2,030.40. Leaving a shortfall of what? $1,849.48. So you tried to make sure you balance it out through two methods. Is that right? One, by paying Amex directly personally? Yes. And had you done that before the Hawaii trip? Yes. Were there, in fact, payments that you made to Amex before the Hawaii trip personally? Yes. Let's look at briefly at exhibit 327, which I would tender at this time. Is it still about Hawaii or are we leaving? Hawaii? Still about Hawaii. Okay. Admitted. Thank you, Judge. Um, exhibit 327, is that a compilation that we prepared just of bank records relevant to? the Hawaii trip that underlie this chart? Yes. And I wanna just draw your attention. The chart says what it says, and we don't need to look at every single page, um, but I wanna draw your attention to an entry, a couple of entries um, on page two of exhibit 327 before Hawaii even happened. Um, do you see where there is um, on June 4th, 2018, there were, uh, auto pays and online payments. You see that? Yes. And there's an auto pay on June 11th, 2018. Do you see that? Yes. And who would be paying if it was auto pay? The campaign account. And if it was not auto pay, who was paying? Non-campaign funds. That would be a, 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 an affirmative payment I was making from non-campaign funds. So even before purchasing tickets to Hawaii, were you trying to balance out your campaign account? Yeah, I was, I was trying to make sure I didn't have unpaid personal expenses on the MX. Were you know, both, both the, I'm curious how you remember the specifics because it's down to pennies, but were both the June 2 and the June 4 somehow a calculation on your part, uh, this addresses a Hawaii expense. And no. So why not? No, they weren't. Okay. What's June 2 supposedly all about? The, the June 2 and June 4 were for a different uh, a different trip. Not Hawaii. Not Hawaii. Okay. I must have misunderstood Mr. Lefko's point. I thought he was showing us that, look, in June, you're already paying for Hawaii with personal funds. Um, and that is not what we're saying. We're just showing that he was making attempts even before Hawaii started to balance out personal expenses on this card versus campaign expenses. But now you piqued my curiosity. What's the different trip you were now trying to balance um, measure on where you'd use? That was a personal trip to Florida, I think. Yeah, it's on the next page, top of the next page, 17, 23, 30. And $200 okay. um, for Destin, Florida. Got it. 
So is this the same card that you just told us? I don't use that for restaurants. I use a different card. But then you do use this card for going to Florida with the family? Um, well, or a different, are we talking about different cards altogether? No, we're, we're talking about one card that I, <clears throat> that I occasionally used for travel, uh, personal travel. I mean, I use it all the time for travel, but I occasionally use it for personal travel. Um, you asked me about restaurant expenses. And I said that except for in October, late 2018, there were not, I didn't use this for personal meals. Why would you use it for personal travel? Why, whatever card you use for personal meals, just keep your life simple and avoid <coughs> bright yellow on the screen and blue and whatnot. Why wouldn't you use the restaurant personal card for personal travel? This card had um, certain, I don't know if it was called insurance, but it had certain benefits so that if, a, if a, an expense for travel or canceled, I wouldn't have to pay for that travel expense. So it made sense to uh, put an expense for a hotel or an airline or, or, or something like that, that even if it was personal expense and I was gonna pay for it, I'd get the benefit of the, of the um, you know, safety of the of cancellation forgiveness or whatever you would call that. So that's why I had some personal travel expenses on there. <coughs> When did the Hawaii trip actually occur? September, uh, the end of September through the first couple of days of October of 2018. You mentioned earlier you had a lot of things going on in October 2018. Is that right? Yes. Um, did you intend to violate any campaign finance laws with respect to the partial payments um, for your Hawaii trip? No. Since the Hawaii trip, have you taken any judicial trips where you failed to account for campaign funds? No. Let's talk about Israel, and I want to show you Exhibit 356. Before we go to Israel, I had a Hawaii question. Okay. I know when you did it. I'm trying to remember, Judge Kumar, um, we saw some texts that you exchanged with, I think it was Kaiser, a healthcare provider. You were attempting to arrange... <clears throat> what would seem like to someone from the outside, like a fact-finding, educational, because of your legislative role, seeing something in Hawaii that right. I, I think, and I think this was the testimony, would convert a personal trip into a legislative trip, or at least parts of it, and at least for you, it would make it a legislative trip. Um, can you remind us when in the timeline those texts were happening vis-a-vis, -vis, I'm already reimbursing for some of the expenses and I've already bought the tickets. When, when were those, if you recall, I'm not, I'm not trying to track you. We can get them back up on the screen if we need to. I just, I don't remember when the texts were. I don't remember when the text started. I know that there were conversations not in text before the texts began. Um, and because I had conversation with one person who then put me in touch with the other person that started the text messages. Um, but the, I know that the texts ended while I was on the trip to Hawaii. The, in other words, the final resolution that there was not going to be a legislative purpose was while I was in, in Hawaii. You were already there. Then the trip to Hawaii fell where in the spectrum of, um, I've been appointed to um, the Court of Appeals. I know you, you, you get appointed and it's a few weeks before you're actually sworn in. October 31, you are sworn in, you start November 1, but it was a few weeks before, maybe more than that, that you were uh, appointed. Right, I, I know I was still a member of the General Assembly at the time of that trip. Um, I don't remember the, so this would have been the end of September. So there had already been an announcement that I was gonna be appointed. There had been. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it was early September or okay. September. So while you were in Hawaii trying to convert the Hawaii trip into a legislative trip, you knew that your legislative career was down to a few weeks and certainly not extending into the next session. Correct. Yes. Okay. But I still 
I was still serving in that role, even at that time, and attended, I attended legislative meetings until about four days before I went onto the bench. So there was not a, there was not a uh, cessation of political or, or legislative activities, as well as uh, the, the planning of the trip certainly occurred well before the, um, the time when I was applying for the, the bench. Um, and even if I had, uh, even though I was transitioning, um, there was still an opportunity for me to gain information that I was going to be able to pass on to other legislators in the particular issue we were discussing. Okay. Okay. All right, let's talk about Israel. Um, at this time, I would tender Exhibit 356, which is the spreadsheet for Israel. Objection. All right. Did it? Let's look at what happened with Israel. Um, now, this trip was in 2017, is that right? I'm sorry, I'm looking. Um, this trip was in 2017, yes. And so what happened with the accounting on this trip? So most of the, um, so I made an effort to pay for, uh, part of the trip with non-campaign funds so that um, there, so there would be enough uh, balance between the campaign and the non-campaign expenditures that it, it would work out, it would balance out. Um, this particular document shows where I paid the airfare for my children uh, for that trip. I had paid for it originally on Amex, um, again, because I could, I had the cancellation protection when I, when I purchased those tickets. We then took the trip in September, October. I think we finished the trip in October. And then I paid it back. I paid those airfare costs back in February, 2018, you, a few months after the trip. Do you understand that the campaign shouldn't have paid for any of it for any, or the, the, the campaign should not have paid for the amount this 3507 when it did. Yes. And did you do that on purpose? Have the campaign pay for something it shouldn't have paid for? Well, I, I intentionally incurred those expenses using the Amex card. Um, and my intent was at all times was <coughs> to reimburse the campaign for that expense. Okay. Why did it take so long? I just was busy. I got busy and it's one of those things I needed to do and I kept putting it off. And, and did, did you too long. Did you think your wife had a legislative purpose when you were out there? Yes. Why? In Israel. Yes. Uh, there were some meetings that I would not have been able to attend if my wife wasn't with me. There were some meetings with, um, in particular, with um, Palestinian uh, women leaders who uh, would not have been, frankly, I mean, we don't like this idea, but they wouldn't have been permitted to meet with me if my wife wasn't present. Did the Campaign Finance Commission during its proceeding reject your wife's presence as being part of an official function? I was not aware of that. Um, did they tell you that it rejected your wife's presence as being part of an official function? I don't, I don't remember there being any communication to me about that. Did you take any per diem payments while you're in Israel? No. What was the per diem rate back then for Israel? $571 per day per person who was eligible for per diem. All right. Um, at this time, I would like to tender exhibits 329, 330, 331, and 333. These are records relating to the campaign purpose for Israel. 329 through 333, excluding 332, but we can also, 332 would be maxed out. Um, can you, can we pause for a sec? Um, during our long week together, we would get copies of um, what you're tendering. I don't know if, if um, we could still get maybe even one set um, so that we could have them up here or- He has if, the or originals. Um, we could pass those up. Um, okay. So there's, there's not a bonus hearing binder for these exhibits. <laughs> these exhibits, I, I didn't think were particularly things that needed to be on the panel's okay. um, table. Um, All right. But, um, is there an exhibit list? Even that would help um, uh, just so we can keep track 
of the um, numbers you're yes. sharing. Yeah, we do have one. We have a copy of an exhibit list. That that would be even more helpful because I know you're going to put on the screen the things that you really want us to focus on. Um, one way of, to have kept track would be to have the exhibits, but exhibit list would be great. And those are in numerical order, Mr. Lopez. Okay. Um, so shall we give them ours or do you need that? How about- I don't a, mean to take yours. That's okay. During a break, we could, we could make that happen. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Um, 329, 330. So let's look at 329. Are these emails concerning the legislative purpose for your trip to Israel? Yes. 330. Is this a document concerning the connection between Georgia and Israel? Yes. 331. That's is, produced by the Georgia Department of Economic Development. 331. Is that a resolution on Israel passed in the House of Representatives, the Georgia House of Representatives? Yes. 333. Um, is this a document showing camp Israel expenses paid by non campaign accounts? Yes. And Tell me what these payments are. Um, meals and things of that sort. Yeah, meals, um, probably souvenir, hotel. And were those paid with non-campaign funds? Yes. All right. Um, oops, wrong thing. All right, let's look at 332. And 332, is that a <laughs> compilation exhibit like we did before? showing all the financial documents that underlie your chart, um, which was exhibit 356. Yes. Right, for Israel, and shows the purchases of airfare, for instance, right? Yes. And then the repayment to the campaign. Hold yes. on, let's find it. Was this the repayment in February of 2018? Yes. And that is a repayment with personal funds? Yes. Did you, as Mr. Boring suggested in opening, pay the whole kit and caboodle for your Israel trip with campaign funds? No. Do you take responsibility for delaying repayment of the campaign for what it overpaid for this trip? Yes. Was that delay on purpose? No. Were you a judge or judicial, judicial candidate during the Israel trip and its financing? No. Did you work in good faith with the Campaign Finance Commission to correct any mistakes and account for them? Yes. All right, let's shift topics here um, and talk about the issues with SWBC, the mortgage application. Um, when you were repaying Mr. Philhart back in full with interest, did you apply for a mortgage secured by your residence to assist you in paying his loans off? Yes. From what bank did you apply for that mortgage? SWBC mortgage. Did you knowingly or willfully or willingly make materially false and fraudulent statements or misrepresentations to SWBC? No. Did you try to be honest with SWBC? Yes. Did you submit any false writings to SWBC? No. Did you make your lender SWBC aware of your liabilities and assets before borrowing money? Yes. Were you honest about your assets and liabilities? Yes. Did you make SWBC aware that Mr. Philhart had made a personal claim against you before borrowing money from them? Yes, I did. Did you make SWBC aware of the Philhart lawsuit? Yes, provided copy to them. Did you make SWBC aware that your campaign account was in fact a campaign account of which you were treasurer and not personal funds? Yes. How did you do that? By providing them a copy of the uh, account statement that showed that it was a campaign account and it was listed as treasurer. It was not a personal account. <clears throat> so there's an allegation by the commission by the director that you did not disclose the loans from Mr. Philhart as your individual liabilities. Why did you not do that? Well, because I had, number one, they weren't my individual liabilities legally, uh, but I also disclosed the claim that they were owed by me personally that Mr. Philhart had made. 
Did SWBC's application ask you to disclose debts in the names of companies you owned? No. Nonetheless, you disclosed the lawsuit where he made personal claims against you, right? Yes. I wanted to give them all the information they needed to make a, an informed decision. And was that disclosure before they loaned you money? Yes. How much did SWBC loan you? $105,000. What did you do with the money? I used seventy-five, about $75,000 to finish paying off the Phil Hart loans. And I used the balance, I think, for attorney's fees. Let's shift in terms of allegations on the mortgage application to the allegation by the director. Did you see where the director has charged you with listing a campaign account in your mortgage application as a personal asset? Ask me that again. Did you see where the director has alleged you listed a campaign account in your mortgage application as a personal asset? Yes, he did. Did you do that? No. Let's talk about how what he's talking about came about. And let's look at exhibit 88, which I believe is in. Yes, sir. Emails with Shane Senior. E emails with Shane Senior. Eight, eight, you said? Eight, eight. It's in. Okay. All right. Let me show you exhibit 88. Actually, this is 89. Let's show it 88. Is exhibit 88 a true and accurate copy of emails between you and Shane Sinyard, the loan originator at SWBC? Yes. All right, let's look at page six. All right, is this the first correspondence from Mr. Sinyard to you? I believe so. And it's dated what? March 20th. And Mr. Um, Sinyard asked you to do what? Did he ask you to fill out an online application? Right, he gave me some instruction how to fill out the online application. Did you do that? Did you fill out an application online? Yes. And when you pressed the button to submit it, did you think you'd submitted it? Yes. Let's look at page five. You see that there's an email from Mr. Sinyard on March 20th at 6.09 p.m. asking, telling you that the system would ask you if you wanted to quote, link up your accounts. It's not remembering your password or login ID because you're logging into the bank's website, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. So what was happening there? I, I would enter my uh, online login credentials for United Community Bank into the SWBC application on, uh, on their website. And that, my understanding was that the SWBC website would reach out to United Community Bank's website and then pull in data associated with that online, that series of online credentials and, and auto-populate the loan application document with that information. So were you going through this process that Mr. Senior described on March 20th? And we see at page five of exhibit 88, um, the beginning of that email is, ooh, sorry. The beginning of that email is page four. You see where your email is sent at 6.14 p.m. on March 20th. And you are asked, telling him about the linking up of accounts process that you're going through. Yes. All right. So at 6.14 p.m., you were entering a password for the bank, your bank to link up with the SWBC mortgage process. Is that right? Right. That's what I was asking him. Am I supposed to give the password that I, because I, I had to create some account on their website and create a password for that. And I wasn't sure if I was, if, if what the document was asking me, the form was asking me to give that information again or to give my other online banking credentials. Obviously, I didn't want to put those in if that's not what was being asked. Were you trying to link up the accounts? Yes. And did you think it worked? Did it seem like it worked? I, I thought it did. Yes. All right. March 20th at 6.39 p.m. Do you see where your Mr. Senior responds to you and says, quote, password to outside accounts like your checking or savings? It doesn't actually link them up or remember the password because you're at the their website, end quote. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And that's Mr. Sinyard responding to you while you're doing the application process? Yes. These emails you're sending are coming from 
your, I guess I'll call it personal address. It looks almost like a business address, um, kumarla.com, but that's your domain. That's not the right. Board of Appeals. That's correct. Is there a reason why when you're engaging in purely personal business, your signature line indicates that you're a judge at the Court of Appeals of Georgia? Well, I had one of those auto signature uh, things on my email. And, um, and so it had that on there on some of these emails. Of course, in this context, they knew where I worked. So I don't think I was getting any special treatment by having my title and employer on the email. All right, so then we see an email from Mr. Sinyard, March 23rd at 8.25 a.m. on page four of exhibit 88. Um, do you see where Mr. Sinyard is saying, quote, thanks for getting your application entered and docs uploaded so quickly, end quote. Did I read that correctly? So by that point, you'd submitted your application. Is that right? Yes. And then you were talking about whether to get a 15 year or 30 year, right? Correct. And then let's look at page uh, two, page two of exhibit 88, March 23rd at 6, 12 PM. This references a rate of 3.25% on March 23rd, 2020 at 6, 12 PM from Mr. Senior. Do you see that? Yes. And he references what? What's the rate? Three and a quarter percent. And what did he tell you about what was going on at that time, March 23rd? Um, well, the, the, the rates, the rate had gone down and um, I'm not sure what else Let, you're asking. Let, let's look at the application, Exhibit 87, which is the draft application on that same, that's dated that same date. I understood that he was telling me I was locked in at three and a quarter percent. Did he tell you orally that you were locked in at three and a quarter percent? I think so. I, I don't remember the details of our phone calls. I believe exhibit 87 is admitted. So let's look at exhibit 87. And do you recognize this as a draft application that the bank has produced? Yes. Um, and let's specifically look at what assets are listed on this document in terms of accounts? Are there any accounts listed? No, no accounts listed. And do you see where you have disclosed, you've entered some information, you've disclosed that you're a party to a lawsuit. You see that? Yes. And then there is a date on it. You see the date of March 23rd, 2020? Yes. And so this is the time that you're talking to Mr. Sinyard about locking in your rate. Is that right? Yes. Let's look at the last page of Exhibit 87. Do you see confirmation on March 23rd, 2020 that your rate had been locked in at 3.25%? Yes. And at this time, the application had zero account statements or account balances listed. Do you see that? Correct. When you tried to link up your accounts, did you get an error message saying it didn't work? I did. And what happened then? I tried again. And then it did it work? I, I, at some point, I, I thought it worked because I stopped trying, uh, at least for the United Community Bank accounts. It never worked for the UBS account. Did Mr. Senior tell you that your assets were not needed? Yes. And what did he tell you you qualified for your loan based on? Based on my income, my credit rating, and my property value. And did you submit your application before you signed it? Yes. And how did you submit it? I submitted it online through their web portal. And then did they send it to you later and say, we need you to sign your application? Yes. Now, there was mention that you had uploaded a campaign bank statement. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, and that is exhibit 368, which we tendered at the beginning of one day. Um, and we would retender it now because I don't think that was resolved. Was there an issue with 368? No, it was just out of context. Okay. Any objection to 368? Okay. Well, if it's not, it's now in. Thank you, Judge. 
let's look at exhibit 368. Is this the bank statement for your campaign account that you submitted to um, SWBC as part of your mortgage application process? Yes. So let's look at a couple of things here. First, how do you just how do you know that that's what this is? It's just this one page out of context. Mr. Sinyard produced it. I'm, I'm asking your witness, not you. Well, I, I, that's fine. I, Mr. Sinyard produced it. <laughs> do, do you recognize it? Okay, this is what we got. <laughs> now, my understanding from when he testified before, he had this document, and you know we didn't see it at that time it, because it was. Uh, new information, um, and then and then we were able to uh, get it later. In, okay. Just I for want to go back to Exhibit eighty seven. Yes, Your Honor. Um, or, yes, Mr. Winter. Do you have a copy of it here? Uh, we do. Yeah, matter. You may. <laughs> I know desk real estate is scarce, so I'm just going to hand you the document instead of this giant, fine. ridiculous binder. You say 87 or 88? No, I said 87. Okay. Let, let me let me just look at it. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, so we've got 368 on the screen. Okay. Did, besides the fact that Mr. Sinyard produced it to us and I copied Mr. Boring on Mr. Sinyard's correspondence where he produced it to us, do you recognize that as what you would have submitted to um, SWBC for your campaign account statement? Yes. So let's look at the name on the account statement that was disclosed to SWBC. Can you read that, please? Christian Coomer campaign, Christian Coomer treasurer, and my address. Right. Your address is in Cartersville, is that right? Yes. And then there's a bank address up there. Yes. Which lists a Daresville, Georgia. Do you see that? Yes. Is that where you bank? Yeah, that's the that's the branch that I do business with. If you were filling out something and saying, here's where I bank, is this what you would fill out for the address? Right, yes. And again, we've seen this, but the account number ends in 5012. That's the campaign account, right? Right, yes. Right. By uploading this statement to SWBC, did you intend to claim this as a personal asset? No, I intended to clarify that it was not a personal asset. Was SWBC informed by your uploading of this statement that the account was not yours personally? Yes, they knew it was not my personal account. They knew that because that's the communication you had with Mr. Sinyard or because they ought to have read it says Christian Coomer campaign. Well, I know that because I attended the deposition of the other SWBC witness who said that. She said that they knew it was okay. not. All right. All right. So, commenting on somebody who's not testifying. He was answering my question, but you're objecting to him getting into hearsay. So I understand where we're going. Um, I just was curious how it was United Community. Well, SWBC came to know that this was not being declared as a personal asset. Let's look at Exhibit 89, which was the application that Director Boring says was improperly listing a campaign asset as a personal asset. Is this a true and accurate copy of the application which you signed on, looks like a date of March 26, 2020? Yes. All right. So let's go back and look at the data that's in there. First off, the section says what? List checking and savings accounts below. <clears throat> Um, the fact that it that there were there are bank accounts in here, okay, and and I want to point out one bank account, which is the one that Mr. Boring has raised in the formal charges, the one ending in five hundred one hundred two. Um, do you see? There's United Community Bank is listed there. Yes. 
Do you see the address for United Community Bank that's listed there? Yes, Blairsville, Georgia. Would you ever list Blairsville, Georgia as your bank? No. Do you bank in Blairsville, Georgia? No. Was that data populated by your bank or by some other process or by you? It, it was my understanding it was automatically populated through the online process. Did you enter that information? No. Um, there's an account balance there. Do you recall entering that information? No, I did not. Do you think you did? No, I did not. All right. Let's also look at something else here. Um, Go back one page. Sure. Yeah. And there's another United yep. Community Bank. Um, the account ending in well, all the United Community Banks. There's a 6341, there's a 2219. Are those personal accounts of yours? So I. I don't know all of these account numbers for, uh, by memory. I know the 2219 was my law firm account. I think 6341 might have been one of my son, one of my children's accounts. Okay, I'm, I'm not entirely it's, sure. It's, it's a Coomer account. I, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure that's. But some of these were personal, and some of them were business accounts. Okay, and they all got that Blairsville <clears throat> address. Yes. All right now. Judge McBurney points out this one, which is a good thing to start with here. Do you see that there's a, an account number ending in 2219 that's listed on this application? Yes. And is that your law firm's account? Yes. And do you see that there's a balance of $101.74? Yes. Is there any way in the world that you would try to trump up your personal assets by listing an account with a balance of $101.74? No. No. Were you intending to mislead the bank into thinking that you had an extra $101.74 that wasn't yours? No, I, I thought everything on here was required to be on here because it was automatically included. By signing the application that had these accounts on them, were you intending to mislead the bank, SWBC, that you had assets that weren't yours personally? No, again, if it was on the form, I believed it was something they required to be disclosed, which is why I gave the extra information to show that it, you know, in case there was any confusion, this is not, this is not an account in my name. Did you think that you needed to correct the application or that you even could? I, I could not correct the application. In I, terms of the bank accounts? Right, I didn't have uh, the ability to adjust this information. Was it just sent to you and you, you were asked to sign it? Yes. An electronic copy and you did an electronic signature, is that right? Yes. And on page three of exhibit 89, do you see where you disclosed to SWBC that you were a party to a lawsuit? Yes. After that, did you provide the actual complaint for the lawsuit yes. to SWBC? Yes. And was that to the loan processor that the director listed as a will call witness, but didn't call here today? Yes. Or didn't call in this proceeding? Right. Judge, I'm going to object to the running commentary. He has the same ability to call these witnesses as well. So let's just let him believe that we're calling. Stay focused on the information you're trying to get from your witness. Yes, Your Honor. Did you report the data you thought the bank wanted you to report? Yes. Did anyone at SWBC? <laughs> ever tell you before Mr. Boren claimed it in this proceeding that you included too few assets or too many debts? No. Did you ever go into default of your SWBC loan? No. Now, there's another charge by Mr. Boren concerning this um, uh, UBS account listed on the application in Exhibit 89. Um, and I'm not sure if it's account or if it's just statements made in prefatory language in the amended formal charges. So there are three things you should stay focused on. One is that Judge Coomer allegedly did not list the outstanding loans from Mr. Philhart on the application. I think you've addressed that because those were not Mr. Coomer, Judge Coomer's personal liabilities. Your argument is they were CACs. Number two, um, the allegation is that Judge Coomer did not disclose that his liabilities to Mr. Philhart, these loans, were going to be satisfied upon the refinance of his property. I think you're making the same argument. They really weren't his liabilities. They were CAC's liabilities. And then finally, there's the inclusion of the campaign account as being um, improper mortgage 
application steps by your client. That's it. One, two, three. Um, I think that number two was withdrawn, was it not? And it may have been withdrawn, yeah. but my point is correct. that's yes. all we're working through. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's correct. Yes. So the second one was already withdrawn. So. Just, just so I don't have to put up evidence on that, it's still in the amended formal charges. The allegation of the director that Judge Coomer failed to disclose that the loans would be satisfied in part by the refinance funds, that is not an allegation currently pending. Is that right? We are not proceeding on count 14, subsection B. That is correct. So we're down to two things that, <laughs> that you need to work through with your client. Um, the alleged failure to list um, the loans from Mr. Philhart as liabilities and the inclusion of the campaign account as an asset. That's it. Okay. Um, and, and I guess the reason that I'm talking about this is paragraph 110 says some things about listing UBS. Is that not alleged as improper conduct or? It's not in a chart, but it's evidence we brought up, but yes. I think I would need to address that then. Okay. I mean, you use your time as you see fit. It's nothing that you, you don't have to disprove anything, but it, it is not an allegation uh, in the form of a formal charge, Mr. Klein. Yes, Your Honor. Um, thank you. Um, when, when you signed your application on March 26, 2020, where were the U, uh, UBS funds, that $214,000? They were either still in UBS or they were in my uh, account at United Community Bank under my control. Was it still an asset at the time you signed this application that you held personally? Yes. That at least that $214,000? Yes. Did you ever think that your assets would matter as far as getting a loan from SWBC? No. Why not? Uh, I, I knew from other discussions that, that I wouldn't need to have assets for this particular, what they call cash out refi. Um, were you trying to ever deceive SWBC into thinking that you had more than you actually had? No. So let's look at Exhibit 94, which I believe has been previously admitted, the final loan application. Can you guys confirm? Okay, good. All right. Exhibit 94. Do you recognize that as the final loan application you submitted to SWBC um, prior to getting a loan or around the time you got the loan? Yes. And we've heard some testimony that perhaps some accounts had been taken out of your application by the bank. You remember that? Yes. And at this time, when you signed your application, there were no bank accounts listed, right? Correct. Is that what you thought the bank wanted because they weren't using those assets or do you know why they did that? This is what they handed me to sign and I signed it. It looked accurate to me. I, obviously they didn't have the accounts listed. Were, were you intending in any way to mislead the bank or suggest you had no bank accounts? No. Did you also disclose that you were a party to a lawsuit? Yes. <coughs> okay, that's in part D, right? Yes. Are you a party to a lawsuit and you check yes, yes. right? On page three of exhibit 94, right? That's correct. All right, let's kind of try to tie this section up in a bow. Did you misrepresent anything to SWBC Mortgage? No. All right. Um, this panel that's sitting next to you is going to decide. Before we move off the loans, just yep. so I can better understand it. There were three different versions of the application. One unsigned, two signed, the intermediate one was signed. It included the campaign account as an alleged asset, but the final version included no assets other than salary, property, that kind of thing, but only the liabilities column seemed to have been filled out, but there were no bank accounts listed, either <clears throat> Judge Coomer or his spouse's personal account or their kids, anything. Um, in particular, in the final loan application signed by Judge Coomer, the campaign account was nowhere to be seen as an asset, a liability, a fun thing to have. That 
what you just shared with that's what those documents say that's your your i'm not disagreeing with you i want to make sure i understand it correctly because you flashed a lot of documents yep. in front of us um yeah and, and i would tie that up in closing but I, I think that is a fairly fair summary. Um, there was an initial application that was a draft. Judge Coomer felt like it was submitted at that time. That did not list the bank accounts. And then- nor was it signed. And nor was it signed. And then in the interim, the bank accounts populated because of the link became active, um, which obviously it was populated by somebody else because it wasn't, it wasn't even the address of his bank. Um, and then beyond that, he did the final application that had zero portions or zero bank accounts listed. Um, Your closing meaning, argument just yeah, got shorter. That's probably true, except the PowerPoint slides still exist. Um, fair. You yes, might sir. want to add, the first one, of course, was unsigned. Correct. The second one was an electronic signature that came back, but the Exhibit 94 was an honest original signature with an original date signed on the piece of paper. Yes, sir. Agree. Your closing just got better. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so let's talk about kind of what we're doing here. And, and I'm, I'm going to take this off the screen here. Um, you've admitted some mistakes here, right? Yes. And you've set a lot of the record straight. Um, are you wanting to go back to work as a judge? Yes. And we've talked about what you've admitted, but are there other things in this proceeding that Mr. Boring is alleging about fraud and deceit that are untrue? Of course. And what did you hear Mr. Philhart say in his deposition and in this court about whether those accusations of fraud are true or not? Did you actually ask him to comment on another witness's testimony? So either he's going to repeat what another witness said, which we've already heard, or he's going to opine on it. And you're free to do that in your closing. I had thought that, I mean, they did that about Phil Hart every time, but I will withdraw it, Judge. Um, did you see both where both the director through the allegations in this proceeding and the media repeated and published these untrue fraud accusations against you? Yes. I'm going to object at this time. It's, he said fraud about 35 times. There is no term fraud in the formal charges that specifically under rule 8.4, that is one of the elements is fraud. We intentionally did not put that in there. So I object to him misstating uh, what the charges are and what we have done with that, okay. that specific word. May I respond, Judge? You may, and, and really this is something you should cover in closing. It's a little inflammatory to say fraud when fraud isn't what's alleged, but you're free to ask the questions you want. And Mr. Boring can spend time with Judge Coomer asking him to find the word fraud in the many pages of the complaint, um, of the formal charges. And I don't know that that's time really well spent for your side, but um, I, I'm, I'm overruling the objection. I mean, you can ask it how you want. You're, you're characterizing it that way, which you're free to do. All right, I'll repeat the question. Thank you, Judge. Um, did you see where both the director, there were two mentions of the word fraud in the amended formal charges, and the media repeated and published untrue allegations of fraud against you. Yes. And how has that affected you and your family, sir? So, excuse me. So I have uh, spent a, a long time in my life trying to uh, live a good life, be honest, be uh, a trustworthy person, a good person, an honest person, uh, building that reputation, uh, building that um, history, uh, letting people understand that that's who I am. That's what I'm about. And uh, so that was um, significantly diminished uh, very quickly in this process. 
Uh, and there were some very dark days and some very difficult times for me and my family because we didn't have the ability at the moment that these allegations were made to uh, fully respond to them. And, and, and so I, I kind of, we just kind of struggled through, suffered through under these allegations, uh, dishonesty, deceit, and, and the word fraud was in there too. And those things were not true and I, and I struggled with them, but you know, my, my son, was a senior in high school. He has my name. He went to school every day with, with you know, the, the cloud of his dad being a crook over his head that was not true. Um, my wife, uh, you know, she, she didn't want to go to dinner in town. She didn't want to see anybody. Uh, I had, um, you know, some friends who stuck with me. Uh, who knew from the beginning it wasn't true. And uh, I never could have uh, um, expected to go through this the way I have gone through it, but I'm, I'm telling you that it was uh, uh, really tough for my family. And um, thankfully there were um, some bright spots along the way with people who helped and encouraged us. And uh, you know, one of the things I will tell you is it, it has made me much more sensitive to um, to others and their struggles and, and um, how you survive through uh, really tough times, uh, tougher times than I've experienced before, frankly. So, um, you know, my, my younger children, um, they've gone through the last few years with a mom and dad who are kind of emotionally trying to figure out what to do next and, and uh, socially. And so it's been hard on them as well. Um, and just three years, you don't get back. Uh, for, you know, the last two years, um, suffering under clouds that, that they just weren't warranted. It, it, was, it was untrue. So uh, that maybe is a little more than you wanted, but that's kind of a, a, a nutshell version of how this has affected my family. In, in March 2020 was the first time that this fraud allegation came out. Do you recall that? Yes. And then it got put in the newspaper, right? Yes. And we had to wait till 2021 to take Mr. Philhart's deposition, right? 2022. 2022. So March of this year. Why do you believe that despite the failures you've admitted, you're worthy of remaining a judge? Well, I I have admitted my mistakes in this case from the very first iteration of contact with the JQC. And I've never backed away from those things. I, I, I admitted that there were mistakes that I made with regard to Jim Philhart. I just didn't foresee, I couldn't um, anticipate, I guess, what's happened. I did not, in, in that role that I had with Jim, Jim and I were friends and we've been friends for some time and I thought we were gonna be friends forever. Um, I, I just didn't foresee that somebody else would come in and, and use those documents to make these allegations that have been made. I didn't see that there was a, um, you know, I, I'm viewing all of this through the friend's lens and I allowed that relationship to blur and I, I didn't see where we were headed. And um, I, I would, um, you know, I'd like to go back and change it and do it differently, but I don't have that ability. Um, but I think my heart was in the right place with Jim because I, I was never trying to take advantage of him or take anything from him. And so while there were mistakes with him, I don't think those kind of mistakes are the kind that disqualify me from serving as a judge. How are you gonna do better? Well, I mean, this, the, simple, the simple answers, the simple stuff is if I'm ever practicing law again and I have a friend who is interested in these kinds of things, we're gonna to talk to other lawyers. I'm not gonna do that ever again. I'm never gonna be in that position again. Uh, and it's never gonna happen like that again. Um, but um, we're just, you know, I have 
with regard to other issues, I've got compliance counsel, I've got other people to help me do things the right way and make sure I don't get tripped up in accounting errors and that kind of stuff. But to me, the part that was most, most significant was the allegation that I had done something wrong to my friend, which was not true. I, I, I mean, I did wrong with regard to the way I created these documents. I didn't, I never set out to do any harm to him, to do any wrong to him, to take anything from him. With regard to campaign finance, I never stole anything. I never, uh, I, those things just didn't happen. If I didn't lie to the mortgage company. If you were allowed to go back to work for the job you were elected to do, what do you hope to achieve? I think this experience puts me in a unique position. Um, unique in the sense that it gives me an opportunity to help some other folks, in particular judges who will go through very difficult, challenging, difficult, tough times, maybe sometimes because of their own mistakes. Um, and to be able to have empathy for them and to reach out to them individually and say, I understand how it is to be facing this. Let me help you. Uh, let me, let me, let me give you some, at least tell you somebody cares about you as a human being and you're not a throwaway. Um, I think that it helps me to demonstrate that a person can make mistakes and still be redeemable, uh, still um, learn from those and be better than you were before. And, um, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I alluded to the fact that I spent a long time, 48 years, trying to establish my good name and my reputation. Um, you know, those, those uh, OPR report, those uh, performance reports that have to do with character and integrity and letter, character, integrity and leadership were not uh, throwaway things. Those were important to me. It's all been important to me. And I see getting to go back to work in the same role as the beginning of how I can hope to restore the reputation and everything else that's been lost in this process. Thank you, Judge. No further questions. Ms. Johnson, are you good if we keep going right now? Okay. I'm just gonna grab a bottle of water. Here. Please, please. I should have asked if you need it with I'm good. Good, once yeah. you got that? Yep. Judge, uh, looking at a copy of the amended formal charges, uh, your attorney was talking about the two times the word fraud was used in the amended formal charges. Do you remember where those were? Uh, as I sit here right now, I don't, but I know he does. Okay. Showing you uh, on page four under facts, it says uh, paragraph seven, on and about March 20th, 2020, the IP became aware of a civil complaint which had been filed against Judge Coomer by Phil Hart in which it was alleged that Judge Coomer committed malpractice fraud and a breach of fiduciary duty related to uh, your representation of and relationship with uh, Mr. Pillar, correct? Yes. Okay, so that's basically stating that you had been sued and that's what the lawsuit alleged, correct? It says what's on the page. Okay. And then the other mention, looking at page 32 of the amended formal charges, Paragraph 104. Yes, paragraph 104, uh, the title litigation becomes necessary. And again, it states that on March 6, 2020, that you were sued and it included the word fraud because that's actually what was involved in the lawsuit, correct? Yes, and of course the, the complaint is, is chock full of allegations of lying, deceit, dishonesty, Mm -hmm. um, and fraud was just another one of those words, fraud, deceit. It's the same thing, in my opinion. And if you allege somebody is deceitful or fraudulent or dishonest, all of those things have the same stroke. And in Rule 8.4, um, they actually have different elements to that. It could be fraud or deceit or dishonesty, correct? Rule 8.4? Yeah, the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct. It's alleged in the amended formal charges. Right, I think that the general term is fraud and then it has within that sub-definitions of deceit, misrepresentation, dishonesty, so forth. 
And in this amended formal charge, it does not have a charge in the formal charges alleging the word fraud. Would you agree with that? I, I, again, you, you've got it there in front of you. Okay, I think it'll speak for itself. Um, just a, a, a few things to clear up, I think, from- You did allege that I committed fraud with the bar. I mean, you did. You made an allegation of fraud with the bar against me. Fraud. Yes, a rule 8.4 mm -hmm. uh, misconduct allegation you made with regard to the bar. Count 23, where it goes into rule 8.4A4. Is the word fraud anywhere on there other than when I wrote the word fraud to the side here as I was making a note to, to look at this? Does it say fraud in there? No, not in your pleading there. Okay, so there's nothing in here that says fraud regarding 8.4, correct? Right, I'm, I'm saying that you made that allegation with the bar. I, I don't really even understand what you're talking about, but um, a couple of things to clear up. Judge, uh, I think you referred to sitting down with Mr. with uh, Judge Bryson um, to talk about his future. That was not, that's when he was gonna run for judge, correct? Not when he was working to become a lawyer. Because I think he said he, went, he sat down with you when he was thinking about being a lawyer. I think you just misspoke. Um, he sat down with you when he was thinking about becoming a judge, correct? No, I've known Brandon Bryson for many years. I knew him before he was a lawyer and I okay. knew him when he ran for magistrate and he did talk to me about running for magistrate. I encouraged him to do that as well. But he, he certainly spoke to me a long time ago. Gotcha. And I think- And he wasn't the only one. There were other lo young lawyers in our, and, and young uh, men and women who wanted to be lawyers who would come and I would talk to them, encourage them, let them volunteer, let them work. I think uh, your attorney misspoke when he was asking you questions initially about the $50,000 as you're calling it line of credit, um, that this was when it was a, you were a legislator. When that happened, you were actually a sitting judge, correct? Yes, that was for the judicial campaign. And at that time, um, you had almost $300,000 in outstanding loans to Mr. Philhart, correct? I don't, rem uh, I had loans outstanding to Mr. Philhart, yes. Okay. And you knew he was asking for that money back at this point. And Wright Gammons had already written you a letter by the time you did this, as you call it, line of credit, correct? I had the November 7th letter in hand. I think Judge McBurney cleared up the issue of what you meant by self-report. Um, Israel, uh, while you did pay that back, uh, some of that money back, that was months later after you had actually spent campaign funds to pay for your kids to go, correct? That was after, yes, that was after I had already taken the trip. Okay. I'm going to go through, and I'm going to hand, I just have one copy, I'm going to hand them to you, and I'm just going to get you to tell the hearing panel uh, the closing balances on certain exhibits. I've numbered them. It's going to be 275 through I believe 292. Um, I'd ask to admit those. They're general, they're bank statements, which we have in some form, but I think it'll expedite the process here if we go into them individually uh, quickly, just looking at the closing balance on specific dates. But your representation to Mr. Lefko and to us is that these are excerpts from bank records already in evidence. Correct. And rather than having to plot through 300 pages, your team has already pulled them out. Correct. Has Mr. Lefko had a chance to see these 15, 20 exhibits? I went over them with him uh, initially. And once we started going through, he understood that these were from the records they already have and that I don't think he has an objection to them. When you say initially, today you went over? Today, okay. yes, yes. Let me today. just short circuit. Any objection to those exhibits? The only objection is one I've raised. Ooh, <laughs> sound like that. What? The only objection is the one that I've raised before, which is some of these documents contain personal information that has nothing to do with this proceeding or law firm information that has nothing to do with this proceeding. And Mr. Boring and I will work in good faith together to make sure that the set of exhibits that goes in the record record are redacted so that information is gone. We have a meeting set up after this hearing in January to do that. Great. And, and that remains our direction to you all is to make sure that um, extraneous, irrelevant, personal information um, is redacted. 
um, I think for purposes of today, especially if we're not going to publish certain things, then we're safe traveling in this manner. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Um, uh, just in terms of the process, though, um, what we, we had a little discussion about this before the hearing, that the exhibits we thought would go out with the panel, but we would have a set of exhibits which we redacted ourselves that we supplemented with. That works. Okay. Thank you, Judge. So the numbers were 275 through 292. All right. Those are admitted. Judge Coomer, I'm going to show you some of uh, your bank statements uh, from April of 2015, just going through specifically the uh, transfers from uh, campaign to law firm and law firm back to campaign. Um, showing you exhibit 275, and usually these closing balances are going to be on the last page or next to last page. Um, the balance transfer alleged uh, from the campaign to the law firm was on April the 15th uh, in the amount of $750. What was your balance uh, in the law firm campaign on the 14th of April? Uh, $283.63. Okay. Um, looking at the next closing balance statement, uh, I believe that's your personal checking account. On April the 14th, uh, 2015, what was your closing balance? I'm sorry, are you asking me the same document? No, the next one, 276. That is the law firm. I mean, excuse me, the personal checking uh, account. I only, I only have 275. Oh, sorry. I'm holding it right here. Okay, showing you that. Um, looking at the closing balance, uh, what was your closing balance in your personal checking account on April 14th, 2015? $228, $228.77. Okay, how about the next day on April the 15th? $52.38. So on the date of that transfer from law firm, from campaign to law firm, April 15, 2015, um, you obviously did not have enough money to, to cover a transfer of $750 from your personal checking account to your law firm. I didn't have it in this account. Um, look at the last one, which is, is it a 277? That is your CAC account. On April the 15, 2015, uh, your closing balance was $325.38, correct? $325.39, yes. Okay. And so uh, on this, you, had, you didn't have the money to make to cover that transfer except for in your campaign account on that day, correct? On the 15th of April. I had other money available. I had other money. It just was not in any of these accounts. I had cash and other assets. Okay. But you chose to move the campaign funds out. Yes. Okay. When you say other assets, I know at one point, Judge Coomer, you referred to the fact that you've got 70 or 80 grand in vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think we're focused here though on liquid assets. Um, I'm assuming there's not a bank account that you routinely use to cover shortfalls in either your law firm account or your personal account that hasn't come up here. It's, it's, it sounds like there's three accounts that were primarily money was moving around from there's personal there is law firm and there's campaign i, I just want to make sure we the panel have a as complete as possible picture of your routinely accessed financial accounts so i know there was the ubs that seemed to be touched infrequently um is there a piece we're missing just for for in, in what you're describing would just be cash um and to to this point if you look at exhibit 276 on the deposits section, this is my personal account, deposit mm -hmm. section. On April 16th, you see that I made a deposit of $1,300. That would have been cash. Uh, and a client had paid you. As in I pulled money out of a safe and I put it in my personal account. A safe? A safe at home? Yeah. How much do you keep in your safe at home? Right now, as we sit here? No, back then. Um, back then, it, it would range uh, from uh, a few thousand to 10 or 20 thousand. <clears throat> because clients paid you in cash, or it was just a, a personal approach to finance to keep $10,000 in cash in a safe in your house? Well, my wife had inherited some money, and we had cash, we had cash in the safe. Uh, and, and that was... Um, she inherited cash? 
she inherited some money, we converted it to cash and kept it in the safe. And, um, and I had other cash, you know, if I, if I um, sometimes I would take cash out when I got paid, uh, just to have cash in hand. And other times I would deposit cash, but I, but, you know, to tell you where uh, a piece of cash came from, from 2015 would be impossible for me to do exactly. Okay. And that wasn't my question so much as were there other channels where money was flowing into one of those three accounts. And you've helped me understand there was this free floating cash that would be in the safe, but it would be deposited in, but there's not another bank account that we haven't heard about that was a frequent source of infusions to your personal account, your law firm account, or your campaign account. No, but, but to the point I was trying to make, April 16, 2015, there was a $1,300 cash deposit into my, into my home account, my, my personal account, which then funded the transfers back to the law firm and the campaign account. Um, so my point in showing you that is so that you understand it wasn't a matter of not having any money. It was a matter of putting cash in to cover the shortfall. Any, I suspect that Mr. Boring is going to show similar such occurrences. Why not put the cash from the safe in the account so you don't have the shortfalls and have to, I'm assuming it, it tickled some wire in you that I'm taking campaign money and putting it in my personal account for a brief second. And yes, I'm sending it back, but that's campaign money. It's not personal money. And you have ten thousand dollars in cash in your safe, and I'm making the number up. But why wait a couple of days to drop the thirteen hundred in, as opposed to have it in there to begin with, and then you're not having to dip into the campaign account? Well, typically, I I I was not tracking it beforehand. I would say, oh, I'm going to have a shortfall. Uh, campaign owes me money in my law firm. I'll just put this money over here, and if I had just left it there and reported it, there wouldn't be anything illegal about it. It would be perfectly legitimate. But instead, I am also perfectly legally capable of reversing it and not doing it. And that's what I did in these cases. Um, yeah. Judge Gilbert, were you keeping track in, in any one place how much your law firm owed your campaign versus what your campaign may have owed your law firm? Was there a document you kept that says, you know, this month my law firm paid for five thousand dollars worth of campaign activities, and at some point I'm going to have to reconcile these amounts. Was there some document that you can show us where those things were kept track of? No. Okay. Thank you. Well, looking at those same documents, um, going to you had a transfer from your campaign account to your law firm account on April twenty first in the amount of five hundred dollars. Um, what was your closing balance on uh, 421 in your law firm account? Do you have that document for me to look at? You've got it right there. All right. I'm sorry. I thought, ask me again. Uh, it's 275. Uh, <clears throat> April 21st, campaign transferred, you transferred $500 in campaign funds to the law firm. Um, what was your ending balance on April the 21st of the law in the law firm account? That should be the first one. April 21st, $636.97. So without that transfer, you'd have had a, about $136 in there, correct? Yes. Uh, your personal checking account, uh, what was your balance on April 21st? Mm. <clears throat> $105.10. $105 How about the 22nd of April? $145.33. How about the 24th of April? Uh, negative $53.65. And finally, on CAC account, on the, uh, what was your uh, balance on April 21st uh, in your CAC account? $105.10. Okay. All right, I'm going to move now to exhibits 278, 279, and 280. It's going to be the same stream of questions. Same type of question. Um, on 
April, excuse me, May 22nd, 2015, uh, you made a transfer from your campaign account to your law firm account in the amount of $750. What was your balance uh, on the, I guess we start with the 21st of May. What was your balance? $1,048.03. <clears throat> when you get to um, May 26th, um, what, did, what did your account go down to on that day? $58.84. And that's the law firm? Yes. Um, your personal checking account, uh, on the day of the transfer of May 22nd, uh, 2015, what was the balance of your uh, personal checking account? $239.82. Okay, how about on May 26th, uh, uh, when your balance in the law firm was down to 58.84? Um, what was your balance in the personal check? On May 26th? Yes. $169.82. Okay, and finally, going to the uh, CAC account, what was the balance on uh, the 22nd of May <clears throat> in there? Uh, $55.39, okay. I think. All right. Moving on to exhibits 281, 282, 283. This involves the allegation of the November 8th, 2016 transfer of funds. Um, on that day, you transferred $1,000 to the law firm. <clears throat> um, what day? On uh, November 8th, 2016. On uh, the 7th of November, 2016, what was the balance of your law firm before that transfer? $568.21. And on that day, you actually had a transfer from your um, IELTA to your law firm and then back to the IELTA later that day. Did you see that? No. Okay. <clears throat> on what date? Um, on the 8th of November. Oh, maybe I'm, uh, you know, hold on, I'm looking at the wrong. You know, I'll, I'll move on. Okay, let's look at your personal checking account. So you've got a uh, thousand dollars campaign to law firm. The balance before it was five hundred some odd dollars in your law firm account. Personal checking um, on <clears throat> November eighth. That day, that balance transfer of a thousand campaign to law firm. Twenty seven dollars and eighty four cents. I'm sorry. What, what was your November question? November eighth. What was the balance in your personal checking account on the day you made the transfer from your campaign? To $457.64. You see on the next day, you have a, um, a large depositor check. Do you remember that being tax returns? I don't remember okay. what it was for. Fair enough. Um, what was your uh, CAC balance on November 8th? <clears throat> um, I guess it was $60.38. That's November the 3rd. Right. And that it doesn't go up again until November 9th, correct? Right. So on November 8th, it still would have remained $60.38. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So again, um, <clears throat> you didn't have $1,000 in your personal checking or CAC account to transfer to your law firm. The only banking account you had with the amount of money to do that would be your campaign account. Yes. All right. Exhibits 284, 285, 286. <clears throat> this is in reference to two transfers uh, on February 14th, 2017 and February 15th, 2017. Um, on each of those days, you transferred $1,000 from your campaign account to your law firm account. Um, <clears throat> what was the balance in your law firm account on the 13th of February, the day before that transfer? The first one. On the law firm account? Yes. $145.51. 
Um, personal checking, what was the balance on the 13th, the day before that? $735.58. Okay. <clears throat> and then on the 14th? $925.46. And there wasn't an increase in the personal checking until the 16th of February, correct? On that day, the balance goes up to 1371. Yes. Okay. So you've got that. On the, so you've got transfers of 1,000 on the 14th and 15th from campaign to law firm uh, in your CAC accounts. On the 4th, uh, what was your balance? The 4th of February. February. Mm -hmm. um, or the 14th, I'm sorry. Was it your balance on the 14th? Of my in your CAC account? $643.56. Okay. And then you actually made a transfer back on the 17th of February, 2017, in this case, to the campaign from your law firm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and looking at that, did your personal checking account go up some on the 16th and 17th, the balances? So 137, 1371 and $3,089. Yes, that's the close of, again, this is the close of balance, uh, close of, of the account day balance. Right. All right. <clears throat> I think we got two more here. Transfer. Um, okay, 287 through 289. <clears throat> This is a particular um, two transfers on March 7, 2017, uh, back to back from your campaign to your law firm again. Um, there was one transfer of $1,000 and another transfer of $1,200. Um, what was your starting balance before March 7, 2017? Look at either the day before that. The, in which account? In the uh, law firm account. Oh. Before those transfers. On March 7th? Yes. $842.84. <clears throat> now, the next day, you transferred 1000 back uh, to the campaign account. Um, and with your personal checking account, um, <clears throat> what did you, on, on March the 6th, the day before the transfers, what was your balance? On my personal checking account? Yes. I don't know, because it's not listed. It says March 7th. That's the first daily balance on this account, on okay. this statement. March 7th was $1,837.51. Okay. And then March 8th, what was your balance on personal checking? $801.52. Uh, again, CAC, what was the balance on March 7th? <clears throat> um, 7th? The earliest balance I have is March 14th, which was $820. <clears throat> Last three. Um, <clears throat> 290, 291, 292. There was transfer from campaign to law firm accounts <clears throat> on May the 9th, 2017, uh, $1,000. Uh, personal checking on May 9th, what was your, uh, the, the total in F your personal checking? $55.19. Okay, and on May 10th? $262.31. And CAC, again, what was the balance on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, May 9th, 2007? So. $110.64. Okay. And on just one more question on this, going back to the law firm account, on the day before the transfer from the campaign, <clears throat> May 8th, 2017, what was the balance in your uh, law firm account? May 8th, law firm, $162.80. Okay. 
and none of these transfers back and forth were ever disclosed on a CCDR, correct? Right. <clears throat> okay, um, I know Mr. Um, Mr. Lefko said that in questioning you, you paid off the March 2018 load of Mr. Phil Hart in full and you paid it off early before it had come due, correct? Yes. But that was not until after the lawsuit, correct? Correct. Okay, talking about the records uh, being provided or not being provided, um, <clears throat> you didn't pro provide any billing uh, records or anything like that to Mr. Um, Phil Hart or his file from the guardianship until after the lawsuit had been <laughs> filed, correct? I don't think that's correct. Okay. When did you provide your records and invoices? Aside from the first one you gave him, the only invoice you gave him in 2015, um, did you provide those other records to him after he requested them? I, I'm not sure if I only gave him one. I thought I gave him two invoices in 2015. And of course, I provided all of his uh, records in the litigation um, as we went along, as they were created or as I obtained them from other other parties. So I had given him all of the contents of the file while I represented him, but I did not provide him a complete copy of the file until after the litigation had started. And billing records, uh, all that type of, all those things were not provided until after the lawsuit to Mr. Phil Hart. I had, well, I'm not sure about that because I had provided copies of some of those things to Adult Protective Services. And, I, well, and you, I, you heard Jennifer Riddell say that she didn't get those or provide them to Mr. Phil Hart, correct? I object to the same objection that he raised in mine. He's just trying to ask him about things other people say. He's asking about the exact same thing he objected to. He's asking about somebody who's not testifying. Who's not testifying at trial. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, um, he's asking about somebody's testimony who's not testifying at trial. He didn't bring to trial. It was on his will call list. And then he's trying to use yeah, an out-of-court yeah, statement. This sounds a lot like your objection to the loan officer. It does. Wasn't here. I'll so, withdraw it. All right. Sustained. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. All right. So you did get a letter from uh, Dr. Moon about Mr. Phil Hart, correct? Yes. You'd ask, and Mr. Phil Hart then even after that asked you for his records, files, and invoices um, after that, and you still did not give them to him until after the, the litigation ensued, correct? Right, I, I should have given them to him sooner. <clears throat> um, your attorney asked you a lot of questions about the guardianship and how you had informed Mr. Uh, Phil Hart of how difficult it was in the attorney contract um, and that it was gonna be a difficult case to handle. You could have refused to take the case, correct? Sure. You didn't tell them no, and I'm not taking your twenty thousand dollars, correct? Right. And as a result of you representing him through this, you, in the end, received fifty thousand, or excuse me, a total of eighty thousand dollars, correct? Yes. And that fifty thousand dollars, I think I, I may have asked you this before, but it didn't go into any of your accounts. Do you know what you did with that fifty thousand dollars? No, I don't. Was it cash? I don't remember. I, after our last time in court, I've tried to figure that out. Uh, I don't have a memory of it, uh, how it came. I don't know if it was a check. I don't know if it was cash. And all I can tell you is about, it was about a, a few days before my daughter was born. And in the, in the hierarchy of memories I've kept, that one was higher. And I, you know, I mean, 50,000 is a lot of money, but I just don't remember. I don't remember where it went. Um, your attorney asked you about the- Let me rephrase. I don't remember what form it came in or, or, or what happened with it. Um, your uh, attorney asked you about the pay on death uh, forms where Mr. Philhart was making you the beneficiary. 
Um, on those, you actually knew he was doing it because you had to give him your social security number and things of that nature, correct? Yes. And I know a lot of those that uh, the transactions with the ethics commission that were listed in the consent agreement, um, those those aren't even included in the formal charges, correct? There are a number of those which are not included in our formal charges. Would you agree with that? I, I don't want to get in an argument about what is or isn't. I understood you were charging all of that stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Did have a second judge. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Mr. Lefko, any redirect? <clears throat> yes, and I would um, like to mark as exhibit 378, and all I have is an electronic copy, but I will bring a hard copy. The director's expert witness summaries from February, 2022. Okay. You I, know what those are? I know because it was filed. Um, I don't, meaning the summary that Mr. Boring and his colleagues prepared for disclosure, this is what our experts will say. Correct. And um, how many, some two summaries, one for the ethics expert and one, I for, there may have been a third expert. I don't remember if, um, yeah, Pat the Salem, CFC guy was. Yeah, he's a, he's listed as an expert, as is Samuel Donaldson. <laughs> there was one extra one that they didn't call. Okay, and what was his area of expertise? He is a professor at Georgia State University College of Law. He was a lot, He would have been somewhat. <laughs> Okay. Got I'm it. not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. I'm offering it for the fact that the words in this disclosure were uttered. Let me guess. Does it have the word fraud in it? You got we're it. really going around in circles on that? I mean, the I charges would, are the charges. I, I tender that exhibit at this time, and I have no questions in redirect. Okay. Any objection to those summaries being made part of the record? No, 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 All right. Um, what was the number? 378. Admitted. Thank you, Judge. All right. Judge Coomer, thank you very much for your time on the stand. You were up there for a long time. Um, you may step down and don't worry about the exam. Someone else will manage that. Get your water and you can return. Mr. Lefko, any other witnesses? Please. The Judge Coomer's team rests. Thank you. Mr. Boring, any rebuttal? No, you're not. You want to huddle with Ms. Cross? <laughs> I know her. <laughs> okay. All I'm right. I thought I hesitated too long. <laughs> so the evidence is closed. Um, I think we're going to break for a couple minutes. We want to talk about process as to what will come next, given that it's 445 and the evidence is closed. I want to give you all a chance to confer as well. I'll tell you, we will be talking about, um, do we need oral argument? Do we want written submissions or what? So talk amongst yourselves. And if there's a consensus on that side, great. If there's not, also okay. But that's what we'll want to engage in is uh, what's next and when is next. I mean, it's either now or it's tomorrow. It's not, hey, how about January? 
So um, <clears throat> that's just what we'll want to understand. And if um, your consensus is you want to present to us closing arguments, not written but oral, um, then we'll also need a time estimate because it may be that we say, great, let's be here from 10 to noon tomorrow rather than starting right at nine. I'm gonna talk with my colleagues about their schedules um, and we'll develop a perspective and then we'd like to get yours. So we'll be back in five-ish minutes to sort that out. All right, thank you. Thank you.